Let's just say in the same scenario, the flip was going to be $50,000 and the wholesale fee is 20,000. For us, that means the flip is now two and a half times the wholesale fee. In that scenario, we are going to buy it and we are going to flip it. It's worth it for us. It was difficult, especially um, just being married, you know, in a relationship. And my husband knew going through that project, like, okay, this is gonna be our first one, a tester. But moving forward, it's not always gonna be like that. Like you have to get your systems and processes together because we can't be this stressed out yeah. all the time. Um, if you could tell, we never changed, we never got rid of the popcorn ceiling. You know, you see a lot of people who are like, oh, you gotta get rid of popcorn ceiling, and it's just not true. Like, if the comps don't say you need to, you don't need to. Just really wasn't happy, wasn't uh, my thing. I was in an office, and though it could have been a very rewarding career, and uh, it would have been awesome to, you know, get to that uh, point in the corporate ladder where I could have had good wealth. Um, I w wanted to be more creative, have more time, you know, with my family and not get, not be stuck in traffic and telling, you know, people telling me what to do. Yeah. Uh, and so that kind of led me into the real estate journey. When it comes to flipping houses is you need to choose your market. So it seems pretty obvious, but there are a bunch of things you need to look for when choosing your market. Do you want to go local or virtual? There are pros and cons to both, but I would always recommend somebody who's just starting out to focus on their local market. Now, there are a lot of people who live in more expensive places like California, and they'll say, well, Ryan, how am I supposed to flip over here? The prices are too expensive. And I'm gonna cover that objection later on in this video, but here's the truth. Getting the money to flip a house is actually the easiest step of the process. It took me years before I finally started flipping houses in 2015 because I thought I needed to save up all this money or I needed some kind of rich uncle who had the money to fund it. But if I knew then what I know now, I would have gotten started years sooner because it's very easy to get the money to flip a house. But nonetheless, when it comes to the market, figure out whether you're gonna go local or virtual. Now, once you decide that, another factor to think about when choosing a market is the supply. The way that you measure supply is by taking the number of active homes and dividing it by the amount of homes sold in the last 30 days. So for instance, let's say that there are 3,000 active homes on the market. These are ones that are available to purchase. And let's just say in the last 30 days, there have been over 1,000 houses that have sold. If you take 3,000 and divide it by 1,000, that means you have three months of supply. In simpler terms, if no new houses were to hit the market, the entire supply would go away in three months. Now, ideally, you wanna be in a market that is under three months of supply because that means when you go to flip the house, there's gonna be a ton of demand for your property. If you're in a market where there's over six months of supply, it's probably not a place you wanna be because things sit on the market and it's gonna take you a long time to flip it. And in the flipping game, you wanna turn your money as fast as possible. When that thing is put on the market, you want it to sell quick so you can get your money and your profit back and go throw it into the next deal. So being sure that your market has low supply is very crucial. Now today, supplies are at an all-time low. In many places, they're just one month, which is absolutely crazy. And almost everywhere across the country is under three months. So supply is not really an issue today. You can pretty much pick any market in the country and it's gonna be good for flipping houses in terms of getting rid of them quick. Now, once you pick your market, you've gotta go on to step two, which is to build your team. Now, your team is gonna consist of four core members, a contractor, a realtor, a title officer, and a lender. Eventually, you'll have multiple people who can fill this role, but for now, as a beginner, make sure you're focusing on finding one person in each of these categories. Obviously, your contractor is gonna be the one who helps you fix up the house. Your realtor is gonna be the person that helps you sell the house. The title officer, officer, or sometimes called the escrow officer, is going to be the one that handles the transaction of the sale. And your lender is going to be the person who funds the deal. Now, if you're looking for any of these people, I always recommend putting it out there on social media and asking people in the business for referrals. To me, referrals are always going to be your best bet with finding good people, because if somebody is willing to refer somebody else, that means they vouch for them. And nobody wants to vouch for somebody that's gonna do bad. I'm certainly not gonna refer people that I don't think can do a good job. So shoot for referrals if you can for all of these positions. But to give you some other ideas, if you're looking for a contractor, one thing I would suggest doing is going to Home Depot very early in the morning. Go stand by the pro desk and see all of these people who are buying materials. Most of these guys are contractors and you can go introduce yourself and get their contact information. Let them know that you flip houses and you're looking for contractors to help you with your flip. When looking for a real 
realtor, I would focus on going after somebody who's doing business, but not too much business. You see, when flipping houses, if you're making offers on the MLS, you're gonna be making a lot of lowball offers that big experienced realtors don't really have time for. But by getting somebody who's got some experience and maybe who's not as busy, they have the time for it and they might be willing to do it for you. So you could simply go on Zillow and figure out who are the local agents over there who are maybe doing a few deals a year or maybe one a month. But I wouldn't be going after an agent who's doing over 50 a year because they don't have time to do it for you. Now, once you find that realtor, you'd wanna just ask them for their escrow officer. The biggest key with an escrow officer is that you want somebody who understands flipping houses and wholesaling. Now we haven't touched on wholesaling very much, but essentially it's very similar to flipping houses, but instead of having to buy the house yourself and fix it up, you just sell the house to a flipper before ever buying it. And you get to make a profit without ever having to do a lot of the dirty work. So when talking to an escrow officer, just ask them if they're okay with you assigning contracts and wholesaling. If they have no idea what it is, then it's probably not the title company that you want. When it comes to a lender, there are a whole bunch of different types, but the most likely people you're gonna use are either a hard money lender or a private lender. A hard money lender is a professional lender who charges high interest rates and has short-term loans, but the benefit is they're willing to fund you regardless of your credit or your income. All they really care about is whether or not you're getting a good deal. And so for most people who are starting out, they don't have a lot of money. Maybe they don't have a good job history. That's why they want to flip houses. And so a hard money lender is going to be a great resource for you. Now, a private lender is somebody who's typically a friend or a family member, and they're going to be someone who can either fund your entire deal or help you fund a portion of the deal. For instance, let's just say you get a hard money lender who wants to approve your deal. They really like it. And they say, we're going to fund 80% of it. And then maybe you've got a friend or a family member who's able to fund the other 20%. Well, now you've gotten into a deal with no money out of your pocket. You've got the hard money lender funding the majority, and then you've got your private lender funding what I call the gap. So this is a great way to get into a deal with no money out of pocket, and in fact, I still do deals this way. In almost all of my flips, I don't use any money of my own. We've got over 50 active flips in Las Vegas right now at the time of this filming, and we're all into those for over $20 million. Now, I've made a lot of money in my flipping career, but I don't have $20 million cash just sitting around. And so, for me to fund all of these flips, I still do a mix of getting hard money, getting private money, all of the same things that I did when I was doing my very first flip. So my point is, no matter how big you end up growing, you're never gonna have enough of your own money. You're always gonna have to rely on other people as you grow. Now, once you've built your team, that leads you to step three, which is to learn how to evaluate deals. Knowing your numbers is the biggest key of the flipping game. A lot of people think it's all about the design and it's all about the area and the curb appeal, and those things have some value, but at the end of the day, it's just the numbers that matter. You could be in the best area ever, but if you got your numbers wrong, you're gonna lose money on the flip, and vice versa. You could be in a terrible neighborhood, but if you got a great deal, you're gonna make a lot of money. And so the key is understanding when you're flipping houses, it's not really about the house or whether or not you wanna live there. It's about whether or not you're gonna make money on the deal. So there are some important numbers to know, one of which is called ARV. It stands for after repair value. This is what you think the home is going to sell for once it's fixed up. Another important one would be your repair cost. How much are you going to spend on this house renovating it? Every market's completely different for what's the standard, but what I teach my students at Future Flipper is to use the price per square foot method. Essentially, we know what the price per square foot is depending on how big of a renovation we have to do. For example, here in Las Vegas, for a full renovation, we know we're gonna spend around $30 a square foot on a normal house. Now, this is not a luxury home. This is not a home that's down to the bones. This is like a full cosmetic renovation where we're just taking out old kitchens and old bathrooms and replacing them. And so if the house is 2,000 square feet at $30 a foot, we know that we're gonna spend probably $60,000 on the renovation. But understanding what those costs are in your market and what kind of renovation you're doing on that specific property is gonna determine whether or not your repair costs are accurate. Another big one would be your money cost. Your money cost will vary depending on what kind of deal you work out with your hard money lender and your private lender. For instance, let's just say you borrowed $300,000 to purchase this home. And at that $300,000, they said you have a 12% interest rate. 
Now you might be saying, that's a really high interest rate, Ryan. Well, that's really common with hard money loans. There's a cost to doing business quickly and flipping houses. And it's okay as long as you factor it in appropriately. So at a 12% interest rate on $300,000, I know that I'm gonna be paying $3,000 a month in money costs. And from there, we just have to estimate what our hold time would be. So if I know my hold time is gonna be six months from the day I buy it to the day it finally sells, then I know I'm gonna spend about $18,000 in money costs. So the key is just getting familiar with those numbers and making sure you have a big enough buffer to protect yourself in the event that you're wrong. Now, once you learn how to evaluate deals, the fourth thing you need to do is go out and find a deal. There are really three main ways to find deals. The first is on the MLS, the second is through wholesalers, and the third is direct to seller marketing. So the MLS is pretty simple. These are all the properties that are currently on the market. Just go out there, get your realtor, and start making offers on them. The second is wholesalers. We talked about this a little bit earlier with wholesaling real estate and how you don't need money. Well, you can also buy deals from these people. Basically, these wholesalers are doing their own marketing, they're finding their own deals, and they're going to try and sell them to a flipper like yourself. A typical scenario would be a wholesaler has a property under contract for $300,000. They know that a flipper is willing to pay $320,000. And so they will assign the contract to the flipper. And the cost of that assignment is called the assignment fee. And it's just the difference between what the flipper pays and what the wholesaler has it under contract for. So in this case, it'd be $20,000. Now to make that $20,000, the wholesaler doesn't have to buy the property. They don't have to fix it up. They don't have to do anything. The flipper is gonna buy the property for them essentially. The flipper will pay $320,000 to the escrow company. The escrow company will then give the $300,000 to the seller, the $20,000 to the wholesaler, and the house to the flipper. So everyone wins in this scenario. I personally have paid millions of dollars in wholesale fees to get deals. And I'm perfectly happy doing it because I've made money from those deals. So don't ever worry about what a wholesaler is making. They had to work really hard to get that deal. And for you, you get the opportunity to buy a flip without having to go source the deal yourself. The wholesalers are a great way to find deals, but the third way is through direct to seller marketing. Now my company, Home Run Offer, this is what we specialize in. We go directly to sellers through different marketing tactics like TV commercials, direct mail, cold calling, text message, just to name a few. We spend a lot of money every single month doing this, but we know that we're gonna get a good return on that money spent because it's gonna get us a lot of deals. Now, if you're just starting out, I'd recommend just picking one or two of these ways. I don't think you should pursue all three because you're probably not gonna be good at any of them. If you wanna go MLS and wholesalers, then start making a ton of offers on the MLS and start networking like crazy to find multiple wholesalers. If you wanna go direct to seller marketing, make sure you figure out which marketing strategy you wanna use and how you are gonna get in touch with sellers. The benefit of going MLS and wholesalers is that it doesn't cost you any money. This is exactly how I got started flipping houses because I didn't have the budget to do direct marketing. Now, once you do one of these strategies, inevitably, if you stay with it and you do what you're supposed to do, you're gonna end up finding a deal. And from there, that leads you to step five, which is to buy the home. This is where your lender and your escrow officer will come into play. You've already figured out who your hard money lender is or who your private money lender is. You already have your escrow officer who's gonna handle the transaction and make sure that everything is square. And you're gonna go out there and buy the home. After that, you're going to step six, which is to renovate the property. Now your contractor is finally coming into play. And I should also add, before you ever got to this step, when you were in escrow to go purchase this home, your contractor should have already walked it and told you what it is gonna cost to renovate this home. Like we talked about with understanding your numbers, you need to know what it costs for construction. The best way to do that is to get your contractor in the house and walk it and take you through step by step how much it's going to cost, what this piece will cost, how much this kitchen will cost. That way you can start getting an idea of each individual section. Now, assuming everything goes good, you're gonna manage that project, your contractor is gonna get it fixed up, and that leads you to step seven, which is to list the home. This is where your realtor finally jumps in and they're gonna give you some guidance on how much to list the property for. I should also add that when you were purchasing the property, the realtor should have already been talking to you about what they think it can potentially sell for once it's fixed up. 
This would be your after repair value. None of these numbers should be things that you didn't know or anticipate going into the deal. You have this whole team built out so that they can help you evaluate the deal better and ensure that you're profitable. Now, once your realtor lists it, you should get an offer pretty quickly in today's market, as long as you're priced right. And then eventually that leads to step eight, which is to sell the home. Once you sell the home, it's official, you are finally paid and your first flip is complete. That is the step-by-step -step process of how a house flip works. We've done it hundreds of times here at my company, and we've taught thousands of students at Future Flipper how to do the same. Now, I will add one thing if you've made it this far in the video and you've never done a deal. The biggest thing I would have did differently when I started flipping houses was get a coach. You can watch the rest of my YouTube videos and they're gonna help you out, but there is nothing better than getting a coach and somebody who's gonna keep you accountable on a daily and a weekly basis. There's a lot more that goes into each step than I mentioned. Obviously, this is a YouTube video. I can't talk about every problem you'll encounter, but when you have coaching, you have somebody that's already been through those problems and they can help you get through them as well. And on top of that, a good coaching program will keep you up to date with what's going on in the market, new trends that you should be taking advantage of, and just overall feedback to your business. So we're here in Lawrenceville, Georgia now. Gonna go check out my student Hector's new flip. It's just a few minutes outside of the Atlanta area, and uh, it looks the exact same as Clint's. So let's go see it. Yeah, I swear every market has the same kind of houses. In Vegas, we got all stucco. When we were visiting my student Sergio in Dallas, they had all bricks. And now, here in Georgia, we got a bunch of farmhouses. What's up, dude? What's up? Good to see you, brother. You too. Man, thanks Excited for showing us here. this flip, man. Absolutely. I just got done with Clint the Closer. Yes. Good buddies. Yep. Um, you guys have done some deals together, right? We have, yeah. Got a deal in Kennesaw. Uh, super great deal. He actually wholesale, uh, he wholesaled that deal to us, and we'll make a little under uh, 90K. <laughs> I like seeing you guys make money together. Yeah. That's dope. So speaking of making money, yeah. this is your second full year flipping. Yep. Tell me about what's going on this year. Yeah, so the first year it was just really getting the operations uh, together and just really doing it uh, by myself without any coaching or nothing. And uh, really this year, uh, took on your coaching and just things exploded, honestly. Yeah. So we're doing, uh, we have 12 uh, in progress like flips, things that we have that we've bought and that we're working on uh, under construction or whatever the case may be, working out the tenant issues. Um, and then uh, we've done already 24. So we're on pace for probably over 50 this year. So I'm excited about that. Over 50 flips his second year. Let me tell you, my second year, I did 20 and I thought I was a beast. <laughs> and then I see like guys like you and Clint the Closer and I'm like, these guys are savages. Yeah. Well, it's thanks to your coaching, man. It's, it's really, honestly, you know, I don't say that for the video or anything. Like it <laughs> honestly helped. Yeah, man, so I appreciate awesome. that. So uh, let's check out the flip and, yeah. and see what's going on with it. Let's take a look. Did you restain this? So these are actually uh, new beans that yeah. we, we, we did stain. And here in Georgia, it's very you know popular right now, this style, and we custom made the, uh, the shutters. Yeah. Uh, and as you said, you know, it's like a farmhouse style, yeah. farm style uh, feel. Yeah, so no, I love this color. I could tell, I mean, yeah. this curb appeal is really nice. You got this little bench too. Yep. It's those little things. I, I guess we don't have that in, in Vegas, but in the South, Correct. you know, you get that charm. Exactly. This is it. Yeah, no, nice and open. I see this beam right here. That's right. So I assume there was probably a wall. There was a big wall right here, and actually the, the kitchen was kind of like backed into it. So we took that wall down, added this beam for support, yeah. and made it an open concept, which people love right now. Yeah, I mean, this is beautiful. Right when you walk in, you've got these huge windows everywhere. You've got this nice bay window right here. I mean, it looks fantastic, man. Yeah. So the kitchen will be over there with the sink overlooking, you know, your greenery, which uh, obviously you have a lot of trees here in Georgia yeah. and you have your nice deck. You can do grill or whatever, but yeah, nice open concept. It will be really nice when it's done. Yeah. So how big is this home? So this is 2,200 square feet. Okay. And what is your projected budget? So uh, we will probably end up at about 45,000. 45,000. Yeah. Okay. So a little smaller than the one I was just at with Clint. Yeah. He was going to spend about 70,000. Yep. Um, but I could tell his was in a lot rougher shape than what this was. Yeah. 
Yeah. So what helped us with the budget is just having uh, a good solid team that's done it over and over again and actually just having the same basic package, uh, kind of like what you speak about, just having uh, the same paint colors, the same, you know, granite style, uh, you know, having that contractor guide and, and it's helped a lot to reduce our cost. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. One thing, guys, I have what's called my contractor's guide that I created a couple of years ago because I started getting so many contractors doing different flooring and different cabinets. And I'm like, it's not that hard. Why can you guys not do the same thing every time? And they're like, every excuse in the book. Mm -hmm. So I created this guide and I said, here it is. Here's what we use. Here's the paint. Here's the floor. Here's where to buy it. Here's what it costs. If you deviate from this guide, I ain't paying you. <laughs> sure. So I'm yeah. glad to see you're implementing yeah. it here. Yeah, sure. Are. All right, so you got the floors done upstairs. Looks yep. really good. I like the color. Thank you. So tell me about the deal. How'd you find it? What'd you buy it for? Yeah, so this was actually a realtor lead uh, right. from one of our realtors that we communicate with often. And she submitted the, uh, the deal to us, looked at it. It was actually listed on the market for 300000 Okay. Um, and so we just did really hard negotiations with the seller and explained that she was, uh, you know, wanting a lot, and we got it for 190. 190. 190. So you guys hear that? This was listed at 300,000 in a hot market. Yeah. It's really hot in Atlanta, yeah. right? So they got 110,000 dollars off list price. So don't ever let anyone tell you that you can't make an offer and you know get it for the price that you need it. Just shoot your shot. Yeah. Yeah. One thing that we really took advantage of, we actually started like at 210. Uh, but we, we, we did the inspection and we you know, pointed things out and said we need a reduction for these items. So that's uh, worked to our advantage. So, yeah. yeah. All right. So you got it for 190. You're going to put about 45 into it. So, you know, 235 and everything. What are you going to sell it for? So we'll probably sell it for 330, 335. And our profit will be close to uh, 70000 on it. Right. Yeah. Net after paying everybody. After closing costs, yep. holding fees, everything. Yep. Well, dude, yeah. $70,000 on an MLS deal. Yeah. You got uh, 90000 from your boy Clint you yeah. can follow yeah. from. Pretty cool. Yeah. You guys are crushing it. <laughs> yeah, the only you. thing that uh, is not crushing are these ceilings. What is yeah. up with this texture? Yeah. So that's actually really popular in Georgia for whatever reason. <laughs> but we didn't want to mess with it. It was going to be too much to, you know, yeah. get rid of it. So whatever. What, what do they call this? It's like, it's not popcorn, but it's like a flower yeah. print. Yeah. That's what it reminded me of, yeah. is a flower. Yeah. Um, it's very, yeah, popular back in the day. Uh, just, once again, guys, if people are buying houses with whatever finishes are going for in that area, just do it. Keep yeah. it. Like, yeah. I personally wouldn't want it, but I'm not the buyer. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, this thing will sell no matter what kind of ceilings it has. So. Yeah, it's cool. Yeah. yeah. So you mentioned to me that this is actually your first time seeing the house. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah, it's my first time here actually with Ryan. And uh, the reason for that is just because of, I have an amazing team. So one of the things you preach about all the time is like make sure that you're building a business, not just to hustle. And I really took that to heart. And so I hired guys that know what they're doing, uh, pay them a little bit more than maybe other people, but it gives me the freedom to do what I want to do. Yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, my project manager, Max, is uh, handling the project. and. This is the first time I'm seeing it, and obviously he's done a great job. And yeah. So I pay him, uh, you know, a salary, and then he makes commission. Basically, um, if the project is finished on time and um, on budget, on budget, right? That's one thing that I do with my project manager, and that we teach everyone is always have some type of bonus or incentive structure into people's pays, whether it be on a per project basis, whether it be on a quarterly basis. If they do a good job they should be rewarded. Yeah. And if they don't do a good job, they should be fined or whatever the case is. And that way it pushes them to have better performance because if they're performing better, they win, you win, Correct. it's great. And if they're not, we both lose. Yeah. And so we should lose together if that's the case. Looks like you guys made a new deck. Yeah, brand new deck. Yeah, it looks really good. You got this nice backdrop. All right, so Hector, it's your second full year flipping. What were you doing before this? So before this, I was actually working for a construction company. Okay. Uh, I was overseeing their finance department uh, and uh, really just understanding, you know, uh, how a construction company works as far as 
how they do their rehabs and multifamily deals. Before that, I was working for a bank for six years. So really, uh, my background is in banking. Yeah, because you weren't even doing construction. You no. were doing the finance side. The finance, side. yeah. <laughs> okay. Correct. You've been consistently flipping over 100 homes a year for the last three years now. And during that time, we've developed systems that have allowed us to do that. And one of those systems involved me creating what I call my contractor's guide. Basically, we give this guide to every single contractor before they ever do a job. It details what colors we use, what finishes we use, what flooring, what counters, what everything. It also details where to go get them so there's no discrepancy on how much they should cost. By giving a contractor this guide, it causes much less confusion and it allows us to have to make less decisions. We're not constantly telling people what we want, it's right there in the guide. Before we made that guide, we were always talking to contractors and having to tell them exactly what we wanted. And then all of a sudden, the showers would be different from one house to another. The flooring would be different, the paint would be different. And that's not what I was looking for. I was looking to create a streamlined product of every single house looking the exact same. Now, some of you might be saying, well, that's not good. You don't want all your houses to look like one another. People won't like it. When you're flipping in the entry level price point, you want to create this streamlined process so you're not having to make a decision on each and every house. I know that HGTV makes it seem like every single house is different and you got to create something for that specific house, but it's not true when you're doing volume. I'm not gonna go create 100 different schemes on the same exact house that I'm always getting. That makes no sense. And especially when you already have a proven scheme that sells for top dollar, why would you ever switch it up? So through trial and error, we created this guide and it has made our lives so much easier for flipping. Now let me add two things to that. The first is, this does not work for luxury. If we were flipping luxury, which we do occasionally, yes, that has to go custom. This guide will not work for that because they're gonna be totally different finishes than our entry level homes. The second thing you're probably wondering is, can I have that guide? And the answer is yes and no. The guide is proprietary, but we do give it to our students in my coaching program. And if you're interested in learning more about the coaching program, you can find it in the link below or go to futureflipper.com. Included in the coaching program is way more than that guide. I'm not gonna talk about it right now, but if you stay with me till the end, we'll talk about that a little more. But regardless of if you have the guide or not, I still wanna tell you about some of the things we're doing in every single flip that's helping us get maximum value. And I think this is gonna to apply to many markets, so make sure you're paying attention. Specifically, I'm gonna go over the main finishes in a home. Now look, a home has a lot of different finishes and you could break it down into each and everything like I do in my guide. But in this video, I wanna go over the main ones that are gonna make the difference. So first off, let's talk about flooring. Right now, we are using what's called LVT in all of our flips. And LVT stands for Luxury Vinyl Tile. And I'll tell you, when I first heard about LVT, I was like, oh, vinyl? We don't wanna put vinyl in our homes, that's kinda cheap. When I actually understood what it was, I realized, man, this stuff is really cool. In fact, it's so cool that I have it in my own personal house right now. The LVT we use looks like laminate or wood, but it's actually better because it's much more durable. LVT is much stronger, it's more resistant to scratches, it does not warp because it's waterproof, there's a lot of pluses to it. And just like any flooring, you can get cheap ones or you can get expensive ones. You can say I want tile flooring, but there's tile you can get for 60 cents and there's tile you can get for $20. So for flips, we're not using super expensive LVT. The LVT we use, we can typically get anywhere from $1.60 to $2 a square foot. The other cool thing with LVT is a pad is already attached to them. When you get laminate flooring or wood flooring, you gotta also buy a cushion with the flooring. So for the most part, we're using LVT in all of the main areas, and then we'll use carpet in all the bedrooms. Carpet's gonna be cheaper than LVT, and most people expect carpets in bedrooms anyway. So there's no reason to spend the extra money putting LVT in bedrooms when you don't have to. It's not gonna really add too much value to the home, and the people may not even want it. As far as color goes, we're typically using a light brown LVT. It looks really good whether you have a brown wall or a gray wall. It's kind of that look that's in style right now. Occasionally, if they're out of stock on the LVT we like, we'll end up going with a gray LVT. All right, next thing, let's talk about the kitchen. As far as cabinets go, we are always using shaker cabinets. Shaker cabinets have been in style for a while and didn't mean to rhyme there, but I did. And until people stop buying them, we're just gonna keep putting them in homes. In your city, I'm sure there are wholesale cabinet companies and they can sell them at really cheap rates. You should never really buy cabinets from Home Depot or these places because number one, they're worse quality, but number two, they're more expensive. Go to cabinet only stores, specifically wholesale cabinets. As far as colors go, we typically are going with white shakers. 
they're what's in style, they're the cheapest, but sometimes we'll go that dark espresso. It really just depends on the neighborhood. See, with us, we have two different schemes. We've got what we call our brown scheme and then our white and gray scheme. The white and gray is what it sounds like. It's white and gray pretty much. You guys can picture what that scheme looks like. Our brown scheme is really similar, except we're using espresso cabinets and the exterior is gonna be brown. And we just decide based on the neighborhood for which scheme we're gonna use. For countertops, we used granite for a really long time and then granite started to go out of style. So we've changed from granite to quartz. And the thing with quartz is, in some cases, it's actually cheaper than granite. And quartz is very similar to LVT in that it's synthetic. Because it's man-made, it's actually stronger than granite. And typically, we'll get a white quartz or a gray quartz. Sometimes they got little sparkles in them, sometimes they got veining in them, sometimes they're just flat white. In the end, if you get a white shaker cabinet and you get a white quartz, no matter if it has veins or sparkles or it's flat, it's gonna look good. So we will put the quartz in the kitchens. We'll also put them in the bathrooms. It makes it look really nice. Another big thing to keep in mind is we always go undermount sinks. If you don't know, there's called undermount and overmount. Overmount is when you can see the sink above the counter. The metal is showing. Undermount is when it's under and then it has the edges of the counter right there. So undermount costs a little bit more, but not much. And I can tell you it makes the difference to the buyer. Now we've talked about cabinets, we've talked about sinks, we've talked about counters. Let's talk about the bathroom now. The bathroom has all of those things in the vanity. So we keep that the same as what's in the kitchen. We want everything to be uniform throughout the house. As far as the flooring and the showers go, we are always going tile. So we'll get a nice tile flooring in the bathroom and we'll typically use that same tile as a surround for the shower. On top of that, we'll add a little mosaic strip along the shower and a soap box with the mosaic. I think it just gives the shower a nice custom feel. I know flippers who like to just put the nice plastic showers in, nothing wrong with that, but if you spend an extra thousand or 1500 bucks to make a nice tile shower, I think it adds the value that really makes it that wow factor. Now that being said, if a shower already has the plastic tub and it's in great shape, a lot of times we'll just leave it. There's no point to tear all that out, then retile it. But we'll never put a new plastic one in. We're always gonna tile it. And we're not using crazy expensive tiles. It's gonna be no more than $2 a foot. The beauty is there's so many great materials out there now that look amazing for cheap. You don't need to spend $10 a foot on a tile. You can get something that looks just as good, the buyer would have no idea, and it's only two bucks a foot, especially when we're talking the entry level price point. Now, as I said, when you're talking luxury, the game changes, but even at the luxury level, you can still get some nice discount tiles. I kind of touched on paint a little bit, but typically we're doing all gray walls for most of our houses. We used to do a lot of brown walls, but that went out of style. And what's interesting is white walls are coming back into style. You're starting to see the white baseboards, the white walls, and people are really liking it again. I remember before you'd walk into a white walled house and you'd be like, this sucks. Like, what are you gonna paint it? Is this the primer or what? So it's interesting to see that that's changing. And by the way, guys, if you're getting good value out of this, do me a big favor and go hit that like button. It helps more people find this channel. As far as appliances go, we are always using stainless steel. I don't think we've ever once put white or black appliances in a house. And for us, the package is always a stove, microwave, and dishwasher. We'll never put washer and dryer. We'll never put a fridge. They just don't add value to the home. You could put that stuff, but a buyer's not gonna pay you more for it. When you look at new builds, typically that's all they give as well. So even though we'd love to give the perfect house to the buyer, this is also a business. There's no reason to spend $2,000 on a fridge if you don't need to. And on top of that, the buyer may already have a fridge that they want. They may not like your side-by-side -side fridge that you put in. They may want a French door fridge. So don't put things that you don't need to. FHA loans do not require you to have a fridge. So that's why we only put the dishwasher, stove, and microwave because FHA requires those things. Lastly, as far as landscaping goes, this is gonna vary market to market. Here in Las Vegas, we live in a desert, if you did not know. So rock and dirt is very common out here. I see in HGTV, a lot of these flips in California, they're putting nice sod in the front yard and in the backyard. We've never done that. Buyers don't expect it here in Vegas, especially at the entry level point. We're doing very minimal landscaping. The only time I'd consider doing heavy landscaping is on a luxury home or if the home was on over a half an acre. But even then, if it's over half an acre, it's probably gonna be on the luxury side. So it kind of falls in the same category. But yes, we do not spend very much money on landscaping. If anything, we'll clean up the front yard, try and give us some curb appeal and leave the backyard bare. And when you think about it, that's what the new builders do as well. They'll give you a front yard, backyard's just all dirt. You do what you want with it. That's kind of the same approach we take as well. And those 
those pretty much cover all the main materials in a house flip. Obviously, baseboards and hinges and doorknobs and all these other things can be added, but those things don't really add too much value. What adds value is what we just went over today. Business. Almost all the real estate millionaires that I know started with zero or very little money. They didn't have great jobs, great careers, or any crazy skills, but they all did have one trait that allowed them to persevere through all of that and become millionaires really fast. And in this video, I'm gonna give you the process of how I did it, how they did it, and how you can do it next. First off, let's debunk the negative connotation of getting rich quick. You used to be fed all these commercials talking about getting rich quick, and many people fell for schemes that did not work. And then eventually people accepted that in order to become wealthy, it takes time. And so books like The Millionaire Next Door preach the concept that if you just work a normal job, save your money, be frugal, in time, you will become a millionaire. And this advice can work if you wanna be rich in a really long time when a million dollars means nothing because of inflation and you're too old to even enjoy your wealth and you've spent your entire life being cheap. The reality is you can get rich quick if you take the right actions. I see people starting businesses every year and becoming a millionaire in year one. I see people getting famous on YouTube and TikTok and becoming millionaires overnight. And I see people jumping in the real estate game, making a lot of money really fast because they're doing the right things. So if you're like me and you want to actually enjoy Starbucks and you don't want to have to live on top ramen and you want to live a fulfilling life and go on vacation with your wife or your family, then throw away that book and stop following the people that tell you you have to wait. In fact, my wife and I just celebrated our nine year anniversary where we were in Cabo, Mexico and we stayed at the best hotel. We took a private plane home. We spent a lot of money. We really enjoyed ourselves and we didn't feel bad about it. And this is a very big difference from where I was nine years ago when we first got married. Back at that time, I was a minor league baseball player making $1,200 a month. And it's not like my wife was doing any better. She was still a student at UNLV where she was getting her degree to become a teacher. So at this time, we were literally broker than people who were in poverty. We weren't getting any kind of welfare, or government aid or anything like that. She had just turned 21, I was 24. I didn't have any kind of skills that could make me money, but we were in love and we decided we would figure it out eventually. And it's funny how faith works because soon enough after getting married, I furnished our entire apartment from used furniture on Craigslist. It ended up costing me about a thousand bucks. And I remember sitting in the apartment thinking, man, I got such a good deal on all this furniture. I bet you if I were to sell all this right now, I could probably get $3,000 for it. And that was when the light bulb clicked for me. If I were to just go find used furniture on Craigslist for a good deal, like I did for my own apartment, what if I were to do that every single day and sell that furniture to other people? Well, I ended up testing this theory and bought a couch on Craigslist and brought it home. My wife, Mindy, was a little bit confused because we already had a couch and I told her I was gonna flip it and make some money. Lucky for me, I ended up being right and I sold that couch and made a $200 profit and the rest was history. I ended up buying a used truck, renting out some storage space, and sure enough, I was making $1,000 a month flipping couches, then I was making 2,000, then 4,000, all the way up to $8,000 a month. And that was my first successful endeavor at making money as an entrepreneur. And little did I know at the time, it was also gonna be my first viral video when I got serious about making content. But nonetheless, after a year of flipping couches, I kinda was starting to get burnt out because I realized it's not really that glamorous of a career. When my friends and family would ask me what I was doing for a living, I was more proud to say I was a baseball player making $1,200 than I was a couch flipper making $8,000 a month. At the time, side hustles and couch flipping weren't cool like they are today on the internet. But eventually, all of this led down to my house flipping journey. On our one year anniversary, my wife and I went to New Orleans to go celebrate. And it was during this time I started reflecting on our first year of marriage, and I just started praying for where I should go. Because truthfully, I was pretty lost in what I wanted to do. Baseball wasn't really working out the way I had hoped. Couch flipping was making money, but I didn't necessarily enjoy it. And I wasn't sure what else I was skilled at. But during that prayer, I heard God calling me to go into real estate. Now to back up a little bit, I had already gotten my real estate license five years prior in 2010. Without getting too deep in the details, I was a terrible agent, I didn't make much money, and I eventually just quit. I kept my license active, but as I said before, I ended up pursuing couch flipping and just hustling that way because that was making me the real money. But despite that failure, I felt the calling so strong to go back into real estate 
this time just on the investing side. And through a series of pretty miraculous events, I ended up finding this website called Bigger Pockets. And it was here that I started reading about things like wholesaling and hard money loans and private lenders, things that I had never heard before, things they don't teach you in real estate school. And it just opened up my mind to all the possibilities of real estate. At the time, I was just living in this box of that you had to be an agent, that was the only way to make money, and if you wanted to flip a house, you gotta have all this cash on your own and buy it yourself. Well, Bigger Pockets helped me see that that was not the only way to get into the game. There were a whole bunch of other ways that you can go make a lot of money without having any of your own. And so on our one year anniversary, I started listening to every podcast that they had. I bought a couple of their books, and by the time the trip was over, I was fully committed to becoming a house flipper. So I got back home and I started looking on the market trying to find my very first deal. Well, after a couple of months, I ended up finding my first deal and I got a hard money loan to fund the majority of it. The only problem was I still didn't have enough money for the down payment. And so my wife and I ended up applying for a bunch of credit cards. And when I say my wife and I, I really mean that I applied for credit cards and I applied for credit cards under her name, but she was cool with it, but don't worry about that. And we ended up getting about $50,000 that we could access of credit. Well, I didn't waste any time going into it. Most of those cards had a 0% interest rate for 12 to 18 months. And so I knew I was gonna be playing with free money for this time of investing. And so I did a balance transfer to get all of that credit in the form of cash, and that's what I used for the down payment on my very first house flip. Thankfully for me, that first flip worked as well as you could have ever imagined. As you can see from the picture here, I bought this house for $99,000 in March. Because I was a realtor, I was able to get a 3% commission on top of that, so really, I was getting it for about $96,000. Now, if you look at the picture next to this, it shows I relisted the house just a couple of days later. The reality was the house was in great shape. It just needed to be cleaned up a little bit. I probably put $1,000 into renovating it and getting it clean, and I relisted it for $135,000. If you just look at the pics, they look the exact same. I just took better pictures and cleaned it up. And within a couple of days of listing it, I got a full price offer that I was really excited about. At this point, I just couldn't believe this was all happening so perfectly. I thought for sure maybe the buyer would back out or something like that. It all seemed really too good to be true. But sure enough, they kept progressing with their loan, they got approved, and then within less than two months, I had completed my very first house flip, sold it, made $25,000 in net profit, and my life was changed forever. That $25,000 represented the proof that I needed, and it was kind of like my faith being rewarded. From there, I just kept redeploying all of the profits I had into the next deal. I still kept my credit cards maxed out so I could buy more and more houses. And in that first year, in 2015, I bought five flips. After that, going into the next year, I ended up buying 20 flips. And the year after that, I bought 50 houses. And within those first three years of getting into the game of real estate investing, I had become a millionaire. And since then, I flipped hundreds of homes, I bought hundreds of rentals, I started a bunch of other businesses outside of real estate that have made millions of dollars. It's just been a wild ride. But the crazy thing is, I am not the only one who's done this. I've got many friends who have done it quicker than me. We've had students in my coaching program that have done it way faster. And truthfully, it's so much easier today to get started because of the wealth of information and how connected we are as a society. If you wanna go find other real estate investors in your market, it's pretty easy with social media. If you wanna go figure out what kind of mentorship or coach you want, you can find them with social media. If you wanna learn how to flip houses, you can look on YouTube and learn for free. All of these things didn't exist 10 years ago in the way they do today. So if you're just getting started with zero dollars or even a little bit of money, in my opinion, there's never been a better time to start in real estate. But here's the thing I've seen from most people and why they don't start. They all have some kind of fear that's holding them back. Maybe it's the fear of not having enough knowledge. They're scared that they're gonna make a mistake or buy a bad deal. Truthfully, that is gonna happen. I still make mistakes today. I still buy bad deals today. In fact, with the market being much slower, we're gonna lose money on some of the flips we bought, and that's part of the game. But it's through the mistakes and failures that you learn the most lessons, and they make you that much stronger going forward. And speaking of the market, a big thing I hear from people now is they say, well, the market's gonna crash, I can't get into it right now, I need to wait. To which I would say that is completely false. Since I got into real estate in 2010 as a realtor, I've been hearing every single year 
that the market was gonna crash and it wasn't the right time to buy. And if you look back into 2010, that was the best time to buy with houses at all time lows. People still somehow thought it would go lower even though they were as low as it could possibly be. But even if you think that's an extreme example, look back at 2020 during COVID. Everybody thought that the market was gonna tank with COVID and sure enough, we went on the strongest run we've ever seen in two years. And now you see much of the same thing. People are really scared and it's like you can't win one way or the other. For the last few years, people are saying the market's too hot. I don't wanna get in it. I don't wanna bid against all these people. It's too competitive. Now it's slowed down significantly and people say the market's too slow. It's gonna keep going down. I don't trust it. I can't get in it. You cannot be a fair weather investor or entrepreneur. There's no scenario where it's just the perfect setting. It's neutral, it's not too hot, it's not too cold. If that's the only time you can invest, then you're just a crappy investor and a crappy entrepreneur. Good business people find out how to make money in all different scenarios of the market, of innovation, whatever is going on, they find a way to win during that time. They don't just sit on the sidelines and do nothing. And even the people that you see potentially sitting on the sidelines are working on something, preparing for something big. They're not just waiting for somebody else to tell them it's good to go in. So if you're just trying to get started in real estate today during this time, here's what I can tell you is the difference between people who succeed versus those who fail. The ones who have success take hyper-focused action. They all committed to dominating just one part of the real estate game. I've seen people who committed to just wholesaling real estate and they crushed it. I've seen people who've just committed to Airbnb and did really well. Others chose multifamily or commercial real estate. For me, it was house flipping. I dedicated the first five years of my real estate investing career to figuring out how to find more deals, raise more money, and manage construction on all of these renovations. The way that I found deals initially was through the MLS and buying directly from wholesalers. I wasn't spending any money on marketing. I was strictly just trying to hustle. I was trying to build relationships and get as many free deals as I could. As things started to scale my business and I wanted to start doing over 100 deals a year, I knew I was gonna have to start spending money on marketing and going direct to sellers. And so we opened up that department. I hired a marketing manager. We started cold calling. I hired sales reps who could close deals so I wasn't the only one having to close all of them. And sure enough, by opening that department, we ended up scaling. And now that's been our main source of deals for the past few years. It's funny because every year I've been in business, it's been a very different way that we've always adjusted and flowed. But like I just said, the market is gonna present you different opportunities and good investors and good entrepreneurs figure out the best way to capitalize on it. The same thing is true for high raised money on how to buy all these house flips. Initially, I was maxing out my credit cards and getting hard money loans. After building my reputation and getting some deals under my belt, eventually I was able to raise private money and start having other people fund all my deals and I didn't have to put any of my own money into any of them. And it was from there that I was able to start buying more houses and making more money. And those same investors have been with me investing for years and they've made millions of dollars in interest, we've done profit splits, and now they're starting to invest with me on my big apartment deals with my fund. But along the way, I also ended up figuring out how to manage construction despite not having any experience swinging a hammer or actually fixing up a house myself. I've never remodeled a bathroom, I've never fixed the toilet, I've never put down any flooring. I literally don't know how to do it to this day. And I definitely made a ton of mistakes in hiring contractors. I made a ton of errors in picking finishes. I made errors in paying contractors and having them run off with money. But eventually I figured out how to do things the right way, how to get scopes of work, get releases, pay people in the proper way. And I figured out how to find reliable contractors, some of which who have been with me for many years now. But I was only able to do that because I was hyper-focused on building my house flipping business. You see, I talked about how I love social media and how it brings people together and connects them and it gives them so much knowledge. The only problem with that is it makes people chase too many different things. So many people come to me and they say, Ryan, I wanna have a Turo business, I wanna get an Airbnb, I also might wanna start wholesaling. And I always say, no, if you have not made a million dollars doing one thing yet, you're chasing too many things. Figure out how to master that one thing. If you can just do that and dominate it, you will become a millionaire extremely fast. And for me and many others, we dominated in real estate investing. Today, I've got one of our students, probably one of our most successful over at Future Flipper, a guy that I actually met when he snuck into the bar at one of my very first meetups a couple of years ago because he wasn't old enough. But uh, 
He is now doing over half a million dollars this year as a 22-year-old. The guy can barely drink. And uh, <laughs> he's, he's running a business and killing it. I got my guy Vlad with me. What's up, man? What's up? What's up? How's it going? It's good, man. Dude, I'm happy to have you on. For those of you uh, who don't know, I actually did a YouTube video with Vlad. And we talked about, you know, his journey to that point. But um, I want to go more in depth on this podcast of kind of how you got to where you're at today, man. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Let's do it. So, yeah, man, tell us a little bit about your story. Yeah, for sure. So, um, you know, I started off uh, listening to you actually on a podcast. So this is pretty dope. Um, you know, to get on, uh, I think you were on Disruptors uh, with Steve Trang. Yep. And uh, you got on, and you know, you were like, "Hey, I'm flipping a hundred houses a year in Vegas." And uh, for me, I had just stopped playing football over at UNLV, so I was just kind of at a crossroads. Didn't really know what I wanted to do. Jumping around different things. So I was like, "Hey, that's you know, that's super super cool." Um, you know, I want to meet this guy. So found you on Instagram. Um, ended up reaching out to you, and I was like, "I'll work for you for free." Do whatever it takes and you're just kind of like hey you know i'm not really looking for anybody right <laughs> now but hey you know come to uh one of my meetups and uh you know you never know we'll we'll make it work so um that's what i did i was like when's the next meetup you know yeah. let me let me know i'll uh, i'll be there yeah for sure and you know what's funny about that is i i get people now especially who are like dude i'll work for free i'll do whatever and for the most part i'm like guys i just i don't have anything you know we we've done internships i think twice now and the amount of apps we get is like insane. We got people like from, I remember we had a guy from Egypt who was like, I will move to Las Vegas <laughs> to do the internship. We're like, dude, please don't. And, uh, <laughs> but we had other people who moved from Cali for one of the internships. And, you know, and our first one was very successful. We ended up hiring a couple of the people from it mm -hmm. full time and they've been fantastic. But, uh, you know, the whole work for free thing is, it's great. I tell people that all the time. Like, hey, if you want to go really work for somebody, offer them value. Whether it's working for free, whether it's getting their coffee, like whatever you can do to get your foot in the door, go do it. And unfortunately, I didn't have anything for you at the time, but you ended up getting your foot in the door, which, you know, we'll talk about here later on in your story. But uh, yeah, I remember meeting you at the bar because our, our meetups used to be, you know, at like Sierra Gold and these other places. And you were, you introduced yourself and you were like, yeah, you know, I had to sneak in because I'm not 21. I was like, how old are you? And you're like, yeah, I was 18 uh, or 19, 19 at the time. Yeah. I was 19 at the time. Yeah. But you were networking, getting after it. And I remember you still like, even though you had the bug, you hadn't like fully committed yet. Yeah. Tell me about that. Well, I didn't know what to commit to. I didn't really know at the time. Um, I had just kind of learned about real estate and I was like, wait, this is possible. I'm like, I'm 19. Like, how do, how do I make this work? But then, you know, I went to that meetup just talking to a bunch of different people. They're like, yeah, no, it's definitely, definitely possible. Um, you know, talk to this guy, talk to this guy, talk to Ryan, you know, he's hosting it. So I was like, you know, for sure, you know, I need to go, need to go all in, just need to find out kind of what to do. Um, what are my next steps? Yeah. But I'll do it. I mean, you saw me on Disrupt. How did you even find out about disruptors and real estate as a whole? Um, I think I was listening to like everything at the time. Like you're like, I'm open to whatever. I'm open to whatever. So yeah, so I quit football. Um, so before that, I was just you know football, football, football. Good at school, but you know whatever. And then after you know football ended, and it's like I'm like, well, that's done. You know, and I didn't really think of what's next. Um, do I just go to college? I've never really just wanted to just go to college. So I was like, hey, you know, definitely need to find something. So it was like insurance, like selling insurance, um, like day trading. Like, is that, you know, an avenue I want to go down? Do I want to go to, you know, down to Wall Street and be like an investment banker? Mm. Um, that's what I was going to you know, school for, get my finance degree, doing some pre-internship stuff. And then um, just real estate, you know, oh, maybe I want to be like a real estate investor. And then Real Estate Disruptor was the first podcast I listened uh, to. Yeah, it's funny now because when I was your age, all these industries were not like public, right? Yeah. Wholesaling and house flipping were like behind the scenes. There, there was no gateway to getting into them. It was always the free seminar that, you know, charged you whatever. Yeah. And you didn't even know if it worked or not. Yeah. Now with social media, everything is so out there and, you know, you can see kind of like what's going down and, and get enough information to at least start taking action. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but yeah, as a 19 year old, <laughs> how was it like being 
I guess, confused and not confused, but like open to all, you're like, well, I could day trade. I could, uh, do wholesaling. I could, I'm sure you looked into drop shipping and e-com. Yep. Like there's, there, <laughs> I'm sure you looked into Forex. Like there's, I call yeah. them like the big four of like, yeah. just the young, get rich quick entrepreneur like yep. thing they could do. Well, I was just like, you know, I want to make, I want to make good money, you know? So what, what am I going to do? I actually joined like MLM by accident <laughs> and they're like, I didn't know what it was. And then they're like, oh, you're going to have to, you know, recruit people. And I was like, wait, is this what it is? I, was like, I don't want to do this. Never mind. I'm, I'm Wh- out of which here. Which MLM so. was this? Uh, it was Primerica. So it was like yeah, the yeah. financial services, yeah, like, yeah. but you don't get paid unless you bring somebody in. So I was like, oh, that's not the financial services. I thought it was. I was like, I'm, a- I'm out. Right. So just. For me, I was uh, I was just looking for something else. I guess I had the competitive itch from like from football. I didn't want to just sit around and be just a regular student. I guess so. I think that kind of translated also where it's like, you know, I'll be competitive somewhere else. I need to like make a lot of money and and do that. You know, right. that's what I want to do. Right. Well, I think the first time I met you was at that first meetup. I don't know how many you were like nineteen, so three years ago. And I remember I was like, okay, this kid, he's hungry. You know, he speaks well. I think he's got what it takes. And then I, I may have saw you six months later, a year later or something, but you still hadn't like taken action. You were kind of still asking the same questions. You're like, well, do you think I should get licensed? Do you think I should do this? And I'm like, dude, you just need to go after it. Yeah. Like what what was going on? Yeah, I think between the time that, so when I, f- I heard, first heard about real estate was that first podcast and then your meetup was like a week later. So I went to that one and then, you know, I was figuring stuff out. And then I think the next time was like three months later. Yeah. And I was like trying, you know, trying to do deals and stuff like that, but, um, taking action, but not fully taking action. I was still working. I had like a part-time job. You're going to college. I was going to college too. So I was, I was taking action. I kind of knew about it already, but I wasn't seeing the the success right away. So that's kind of what what kept me back. I was like, should I get my real estate license too to supplement? And you're like, dude, go all in. Yeah. I'm like, you're, you're thinking about the wrong things. Yeah. So there are five main pieces that you're going to need in order to flip a house. Number one is the deal. Number two is the money. Number three is the contractor. Number four is a realtor. And number five is the title company. That's it. Those are the only pieces you need. Now, some of those pieces are easier to find than others. My guess is some of those pieces you already have. So what I want you to do is as we go through this video, Mark what you already have. Who do you know that can fit in that role? Then you can figure out who you need. So let me jump into the easy ones first. The realtor and the title company go hand in hand. Realtors already have title companies that they work with. I think almost everyone watching this video probably knows a realtor. In fact, you might be a realtor. So if you already know a realtor, that's great. But here's the deal. Just because you may know them doesn't mean they're the right one for you. You want a realtor who's got experience with investors. And so maybe the person you know does, maybe they don't. You also want a title company that's got experience with investors. The types of deals we do as investors sometimes can be more complex, and there are a lot of title companies who don't quite understand it. So instead of just going with the first person you know, you can actually go on Facebook groups and meetup groups to find these people who I'm talking about. If you search for house flipping or real estate investing or wholesaling real estate on Facebook, on meetup.com, you will find a bunch of groups that are dedicated to this. Now on Facebook, a bunch of them might just be giant groups that are nationwide. That's okay. You can simply join the group, make a post and say, hey, my name's Ryan. I'm a brand new flipper here in Las Vegas. Does anyone have any realtor referrals for investors? Does anyone have any title company referrals for investors? You're gonna get a ton of people who are gonna respond with realtors, with title companies. They themselves may even be a realtor and you can connect directly with them. Same thing on meetup.com. Now granted, right now during the pandemic, there's not a lot of meetups, but if you do attend these meetups, you're gonna meet a lot of people who are like-minded in the investing industry. So just by joining the Facebook groups, both the national ones and the local ones, you can search Las Vegas house flipping, Las Vegas wholesaling real estate. You're gonna meet the right people. Same thing on meetup.com, except you're gonna probably meet them in person. So literally right now after this video, you could already have your realtor and your title company like that. So that's simple. The next easiest one would be your contractor. And everything I just said about the realtor and the title company, on how to find them with the Facebook groups and the meetups applies to the contractor. You can go in those same groups and say, who's got contractor recommendations? You can go to the realtors that you talk to and say, hey, 
Do you know any contractors? Honestly, the easiest way to find a contractor is through referrals. I've done other videos on how to find contractors. I'll link them to the description below if you wanna get in depth on that. But this is the most simple way to find a contractor for your flip. So like that, in the span of a couple of minutes, you already eliminated three of the five things you need. The next easiest one to find is money. Now I know a bunch of you are thinking, really, money's the easiest to find? No way, like that's the hardest to find. I don't have any money, how am I gonna flip a house? And I can promise you, there is more money in the world than there are deals right now. I don't know if you saw it, but the US just printed trillions of dollars. Interest rates are at all time lows. Investors are looking for places to put their money. And you as a flipper have an opportunity to give them a great return that other places don't. So the easiest way you're gonna find money on your first deal is through what I call hybrid lending. And it's when you mix hard money with private money. So let's first talk about hard money lenders. They are professional lenders who lend on fix and flips for a living. They charge high interest rates, they have high fees, but they'll lend to you really fast. They don't really care about debt to income ratio. They don't really care about W-2 jobs. They don't care about all the things that you would think they'd care about with a 30 year loan. All they really care about is the deal. And to find these people is very easy. You can do the same thing with the Facebook groups and the meetup groups, ask who they use for hard money lending. You can also do a Google search and just say, Las Vegas hard money lender. And you're gonna get a ton of searches for hard money lenders. There is no shortage of them. In fact, I will give you three big nationwide lenders right here. I use Lending Home a lot. Lima One Capital is a big lender. Lending One is a big lender. That's three right there that are nationwide. Now, assuming that you're a first time flipper, you're not gonna get as good a terms as someone like me who's experienced. But typically, as long as it's a good deal, they'll lend you up to 80% of whatever you need. And that includes both purchase and rehab. So to take a theoretical deal, let's just say that you're gonna buy a house for $80,000 and the renovation is 20,000. So you're all in for 100. And you think you're gonna sell the home for $170,000. Well, they'll give you 80% of that 100,000 that you need. So they're gonna give you 80% of the $80,000 purchase price. And then they'll give you 80% of the $20,000 rehab. So that covers most of it, which is great. But you still need to figure out where that other 20% is gonna come from. Do you have it personally? Are you willing to max out your credit cards like I did? Or you just do it the safer way, which is what I teach my students now, and that is to combine it with private money. Go find somebody else who has the 20% and bring them on as a partner. Either guarantee them a flat interest rate on their money or partner up with them for an equity split. So the way it would work is you'd get your hard money loan for 80% of it, then you'd go find this 20 grand from somebody else, and then you would just say, for your 20 grand, I will pay you 10% interest, 12% interest, or we'll split the profit 50-50, or I'll pay you back $5,000 on your 20 grand, whatever it is. When you're trying to do your first deal, you can't be worrying about getting the very best terms ever. You just want to do the deal. And with how I'm telling you to do it, you're going to get into the deal for no money. And that's why I say you don't need a lot of money to start. It's very easy to find a hard money lender who will give you 80%. And it's not that hard to find somebody with $20,000, $30,000. There's a lot of people who got that kind of money. Think about this, even in this theoretical scenario where we're talking about borrowing 20,000 from this person, if you told them that, hey, we'll split the profit 50-50, remember, that house we're talking about selling for 170 will probably profit $50,000. So they could make $25,000 profit on their $20,000 investment. Where else could they get that kind of return on $20,000? Doesn't exist. They are very likely to invest with you when you really break down the numbers and you incentivize it the right way. The one thing I'll add to just that whole scenario that I didn't mention is that you should get more than $20,000. Even though 20,000 is what you need for the down payment, you're still gonna need to make interest payments every month. You're still gonna have some holding costs. You're still gonna have other things you gotta pay for. So in that scenario, I would ask this person for $30,000. Give me an extra $10,000 to cover some interest payments, closing cost, etc. All right, so that's how you're gonna cover the money portion, and that covers four of the five that we've been talking about. Now, if you have a pen and paper and you've been writing this stuff down, hopefully you already know how many of these things you can accomplish really quickly right after this video. The reason I keep stressing that is I want you guys to take action. Don't think about it, just take action. Now, the last piece that I've been waiting to talk about is the hardest to do, and that is deals. Finding a good deal is the hardest portion of this. Many people think finding the money is the hardest part of this, but it's not actually really easy. We just discussed the contractor, we can find them through referrals, realtors are easy to find, title companies are easy to find, 
but the deals are where the money is made. If you can't find deals, none of that stuff matters. Now really there are three ways to find deals and I'm not going in depth on them, but just so you're aware, the three major ways to find deals are on the MLS, through wholesalers, and through direct marketing. Those are the three ways that we find deals. If you're just starting out and you wanna flip a house, I would not do direct marketing. Direct marketing is a whole different business in itself. And look, I don't wanna say you shouldn't do it or not, but it is not the easiest way. Remember, this video is about the easiest way to get your first deal. Direct marketing, I love, it's very lucrative. If you do it right, we get the majority of our deals from direct marketing at this point, but it is tough to get it set up and going. But if you are interested in direct marketing, one of the biggest things that we use is batch leads. I've done a video on it, I have an affiliate for it, you can find both of those in the description below. It's a great tool that can help you get really good deals, doesn't cost you a lot of money, that's why I recommend it. But let's talk about the other two, wholesalers and MLS. Those are much easier. Now obviously with the MLS, we know that those are properties that are on the market. And look, there are a lot of ways to get deals on the MLS. One of my favorite ways is through auto searches. In my book, and my online course, we go over exactly how to do that. All you gotta do is go to futureflipper.com or click the link below. We go over that in depth. Don't really have time to do it on this video, but just know that that is the best way to get deals on the MLS, through auto searches. But most likely, the easiest way for you to get your very first deal flipping is through a wholesaler. So a wholesaler is somebody who finds deals for a living. So at my company, not only do we flip, but we also wholesale. Instead of us buying the deals, we will take a quick profit and sell it to another flipper. And you might be saying, well, Ryan, why would you do that? Because there are deals where it just makes more sense for us to wholesale them. But then there are a lot of wholesalers who strictly only wholesale. They don't want to buy properties. They don't want to fix them up. They don't want to deal with any of that. And so they will happily sell you the deal and make a quick profit. And so really, to get your very first deal, you just need to network with as many wholesalers as possible. And if you can remember, and you've been taking good notes, then you know that you should be networking in these Facebook groups and in these meetups already. These are groups made for wholesalers to be in. And so if you're going into a Facebook group, Make a post and say, hey, I'm a new flipper wholesaler, submit your info. I wanna be on your buyers list. Other thing you can do is go in the Facebook search bar for that group and search your city name. So you'll search your city name and then just take a look at all the posts regarding your city. You're gonna see wholesalers who are putting their deals on there. Now, the deals are probably gone by this point, right? They might be even years old, but you can still go DM those wholesalers and build a relationship. And so the key would be to get on as many wholesaler lists as possible. Once you start getting these deals sent to you, you're now gonna have opportunities to buy that first deal. And the beauty with this is you don't have to go and search the MLS every day. You don't have to market directly to sellers and spend a lot of money. It is completely free to network with wholesalers and have them send you deals. And that's why I believe for a new person starting out, it is the best way. It doesn't cost you money. You don't have to spend as much time working on it. Just meet as many people as you possibly can. But on top of that, I like to use the MLS as well. That's how I started. I strictly was MLS and wholesale for years before I ever started doing direct marketing. And we made a lot of money just doing that. So that's how you're gonna figure out the deal side of it. As I said, deals are the hardest part of this business. That's where the gold is. But obviously they're out there. There are people like me who are doing over 100 a year. There are people who work full-time jobs doing multiple deals every year. It doesn't matter what boat you're in, you can find a deal. You just gotta put the work in. Now, as I said in the beginning, the point of this video is to really simplify everything for you, help you understand who you need to know, how to find them, all that stuff. Learning to evaluate deals and figure out what they're worth, learning to calculate rehab costs, learning the whole step-by-step -step process of how a deal works is a whole nother video. I've talked about them in different videos. Videos. Just go to the real estate playlist on my channel. And I hate to sound like this is a sales pitch for my book and my course, but as I've mentioned them before, you learn everything in those as well. Unfortunately, house flipping is not something that can be taught in just one YouTube video. There's a lot of pieces to it, but my hope is that this video showed you that, hey, you know what? I'm not that far away from flipping my first deal. It's really not as hard as I thought. I can tell you the steps themselves are very simple. Executing them is what makes the difference. There are plenty of people who know how to flip a house yet never do it. So the question you get asked ask yourself is can I take this information and actually implement it. And I think you can. I see people do it every single day from no experience at all. It's just a matter of whether you're willing to put in the work or not. I actually see this question a lot in my comments on my TikToks. They say, how do you choose whether to flip or to rent? That's a great question because most people don't even consider it. Most real estate investors you talk to have one exit strategy. 
They're either buy and hold and they keep everything as a rental, or either they're flippers and they only flip everything, or they're a wholesaler and they only wholesale everything. But to me, that is the wrong way to run your business. In my business, we do over 100 plus deals a year, and it combines all three of those. We keep rentals, we flip, we wholesale, we do it all. And if you wanna throw listings into that, that is the fourth category we use as well for all the deals where the sellers don't wanna take a discount and they want market value, so we just go send them off to the listing team. But with the hybrid model that we run, it allows us to maximize every single deal for whatever is best for the deal. For us as real estate investors, we're not really looking to list homes. We wanna buy homes at a discount. But if a seller does not wanna give a discount, we might as well at least make something on it, so we refer out those listings. For this video, I'm not gonna talk about listings. I'm gonna keep it to the investing side, which is rentals, flips, and wholesales. So anytime my team walks up a deal, I get an email that says street address and new deal. In that email, it will tell me the purchase price, it'll tell me the estimated rehab cost, it'll tell me my ARV. For those of you who don't know, is the after repair value, what we think we're gonna sell it for once we fix it up. And with that information, I can determine what the exit strategy is going to be. We can run it through our deal calculator which you can get at my online course. You can get that at the link below. And that'll tell me exactly what I think my flip profit is gonna be. Let's just say in this example, we run it through and it says that the flip profit is $30,000. The next thing we're gonna do is see how much we can wholesale it for. So anytime we get a deal in-house, meaning from our own marketing channels or even the MLS, we will then blast it out to our buyer's list. Now this doesn't mean that we have to wholesale it since we blasted it out. It just gives us an idea of what people are willing to pay for it and what a potential wholesale fee could be. Now let's just say we blast it out and all of a sudden someone is willing to pay us $20,000 as an assignment fee. Now when I look at that, I say, well, I can make 20,000 right now with no risk, cash in my pocket, or I can go through the headache of flipping it and in four to five months, I'll make $30,000. Maybe, because we all know flips don't always go as planned. In that scenario, I would much rather take the wholesale fee then go ahead and flip it. And I actually developed a rule for this and I just call it the two to one rule. If the flip does not make at least two times the wholesale fee, then we are going to wholesale it. So in the scenario I just gave you, the wholesale fee would have been 20 grand, the flip would have been 30 grand. The flip is therefore 1.5 times the wholesale fee. So it makes more sense to wholesale it. Now, let's just say in the same scenario, the flip was going to be $50,000 and the wholesale fee is 20,000. For us, that means the flip is now two and a half times the wholesale fee. In that scenario, we are going to buy it, we are going to flip it, it's worth it for us. And that's just something we use internally with where our business currently is at. You don't have to do that because you might need that 20,000 right now to keep your business going. For us, we don't, we can wait and go make the extra 30 grand. But when the wholesale fee is so close to the flip profit, it just doesn't make sense to take the risk to flip it and to wait to get paid. We would much rather just take the certain money. And you might be asking yourself, why would the wholesale fee be so close to the flip amount? That doesn't make any sense. But once again, you don't know the other person's exit strategy. They may not be trying to flip it. They may wanna live in it. They may wanna rent it out. You just don't know what somebody's exit strategy could be. So don't think that they're just buying a bad deal with no meat on the bone. They just might see the deal differently than you. They could have different costs than you. Maybe they're buying it all cash, whereas you were using financing that you had to pay for. Maybe they're fixing the home themselves and so their labor is way less than your labor. Or lastly, maybe they just see the deal completely different from you. Maybe you think you're gonna sell it for 300,000 and they think they're gonna sell it for 350. Everyone has a different opinion on every single deal. I learned to stop criticizing how people analyze deals a long time ago. I remember I'd be bidding against other people for the same property and they would pay way more than me and I'd be like, that person is so stupid, what are they thinking? And over time I realized they're not stupid. Well, I take that back. Some of them are pretty stupid and some of them probably lost a lot of money overpaying. But some of them were right they saw the ARV differently and made money. Or they kept it as a rental and it didn't matter. Or like I said, they bought it cash or did their own construction and it still made sense for them. So never judge what somebody is willing to pay for a property because you don't know how they see it. Now, back to the basics. As I said, as long as the flip makes at least two to one from the wholesale fee, we'll flip it. If it's less than two to one, we will wholesale it. That's pretty much how we determine whether to flip or wholesale. But we still have this third strategy, which is the rental strategy. Now with rentals, 
it is going to be very market dependent on whether this is even a strategy or not. I will tell you in Vegas where I'm at, rental is not even ever on my mind. And the reason for that is we just don't have good cap rates. We have very bad cash flow. The decision that I usually face is, do I wanna make 25 grand on a flip or do I wanna make negative 200 bucks a month if I keep it as a rental? Well, obviously I'm not gonna keep it as a rental. That makes absolutely no sense, right? And so almost always we don't even need to run it through the rental filter in Las Vegas. And it's that same way in many other major metros. I know in California, the properties are so expensive, it's almost impossible to get cash flow, right? So usually you're only deciding between flipping it and wholesaling it. But when you are in the Midwest, things are a lot different. When you can go buy a property for $50,000 that rents for a thousand bucks a month, it's tough to decide not to rent that out because the cash flow is so good. When you're faced with saying, hey, I can make 15,000 on a flip or I can make $400 a month pure cash flow after everything, and assuming that you're able to get the rental financing and possibly burr out of it, which if you don't know what Burr is, I'll have to do another video on that. If you want me to do a video on that, make sure you comment below. But assuming that you can get financing on the rental, in that case, it's like, you might as well keep it as a rental. Making 15 grand a month isn't gonna be as good as making four to $500 a month cash flow. So people in the Midwest have that choice. I'll give you another example. My property's in Big Bear. I've done videos on Airbnb and my property's in Big Bear and they crush it with cash flow. And I have to ask myself every time I acquire a Big Bear property, whether I wanna flip it, wholesale it, or keep it as a rental. And almost always we keep it as a rental because we make so much on Airbnb. We're talking about properties that we're all in for say $250,000 and they can gross four to $5,000 a month on average on Airbnb. That's almost impossible to beat as far as a flip goes. I would much rather make that four to $5,000 gross, which can net me anywhere from 500 to 1,000 a month over making 20K on a flip. I'll take that all day, right? And the other thing to consider too is in places like California, you have the state income tax when you flip a property. So I have to pay around a 10% tax on top of my profit. So it almost always makes sense for me to keep my Airbnbs in Big Bear. In the other market we're in, Tucson, it kind of becomes a coin flip. There are properties that we can be all in for at around $120,000 and they might rent for 1200 bucks. We would call that the 1% rule. Basically, the monthly rent is 1% of the all-in amount. Now, the cash flow on something like that isn't gonna be crazy. It might only be two to 300 bucks a month, but for a property in the West Coast, in a good city, in something that might appreciate, it's not a bad play to keep it. If it was between that and making, say, 15 grand on a flip, I would much rather keep it as a rental. But if I was gonna make, say, $50,000 on the flip, well, obviously, I'm gonna go flip it. So in the end, it always comes down to all three options and what they're gonna make. And all three options are gonna vary on where your market's at and how good the deal is. It's that simple. In many markets today, rentals are not even an option. They just don't make sense, just like Vegas. Here's the funny thing, in Vegas, if I did get a deal that got good cash flow, I probably got it extremely undervalued, maybe 60% of market value. That's the only way it really is. But then if you got a property discounted, you're talking about 50 to $100,000 profit on a flip. So even in that scenario, it still doesn't really make sense to keep it as a rental, even though it cash flows because you're comparing it against flipping it and making 50 to 100 grand. And I would be hard pressed to ever keep something that I know I could just go flip right now and make $100,000. That's just me personally. So market's obviously gonna play a role. How good the deal is is gonna play a role. But the last thing that plays a role is your money situation. If you cannot afford to flip it, and you have to wholesale it, then you really only have one option. Maybe you can't get long rental financing, so you can't even rent it if you want it. All you can do is flip or wholesale. Or maybe your business needs the capital this month, so all you can do is wholesale. Look, I get it, that's part of growing. A lot of people don't have all the options like we do. We're very blessed that we can do that. So you need to definitely look at your business and your situation. You can't just only think about how can I maximize this deal right now because it may put you in a bad position for your business. You may need that money right now so you have to wholesale it. You might be looking at making $10,000 on a wholesale and if you flipped it, you might make 50, but if you don't wholesale it, you're not in business next month. 
So obviously you need to wholesale it. And then you need to aspire to get to the point where yes, I have multiple options. I'm not forced into this one situation. And that's the big thing I teach in my coaching program that is very different than almost every other program I know is that we teach all three exit strategies. Most coaches only teach one thing. They teach you how to either flip or how to own an all around great investor and you need to maximize every deal that comes through in order for you to be the most profitable short term and in the long term. If you have a steady mix of flipping houses, wholesaling houses, and buying rentals, you're gonna go far, I can promise you. So for those of you who are wondering whether you should rent or flip a property, I hope this video answered that question. What's going on guys? So today we are in Boulder City checking out a mobile home that we just bought, and it's not your average mobile home. The reason I wanted to show this one off was because there's a lot of cool features about it and just talk about the process of flipping a mobile home and the things you need to look for. So in this video, we're gonna show you the full before and after, so make sure you watch all the way till the end. Now, right now, this is the very first time I've ever seen this property. We bought it from a wholesaler. We don't really like to buy in Boulder City, but the numbers were so good that I couldn't turn it down. As far as the home itself goes, it's actually in pretty good shape. Now, these are old cabinets, but you gotta remember, for original cabinets, he's in really good shape. And this mobile home's actually in a 55 and over community. Obviously, I'm not 55. The rule is you just can't live there. But yeah, if you check out this flooring, it's in really good shape. We're probably not gonna keep it because it won't go with our scheme, but if somebody wanted to live here right now, they could live here. I've even considered just selling it as is. But in here, you've got this nice dining area, you've got your living room, this is kind of like a sitting area room. They got their own little bar over here. And then you've got the two bedrooms and the two bathrooms. So bathroom number one, once again, it's in really good shape. It's just old. We may just even keep this tub because it's in such good shape. You've got the guest bedroom right here. You know, we're gonna get rid of all this paneling. This is not good. People don't like it. We'll drywall all of this. And then you have the master right here big master and you've got this bathroom with this bathroom we're definitely going to change this out this looks like wallpaper but it's actually plastic it's all the same inside it's a plastic that looks like wallpaper but this is beautiful wallpaper right actually this ain't even wallpaper either this is plastic again this whole room is plastic so the inside is pretty standard but the outside is what makes it special check this out this is your backyard how many of you guys can say you have a mountain in your backyard that you could just go do whatever you want with. I think that's amazing. And I, I should say, technically, I guess this is your backyard, but this is your backyard. And so I don't see any other mobile homes that get this whole thing as their backyard. And granted, they could all walk back here if they wanted to, but to have it right here adds value. But here's the other big value add. Check that out over there. You get a view of Lake Mead right here from your porch. I'm not even 55, but I would love to sit out here drink my morning coffee, look at the lake, look at the mountains, super quiet out here. It's amazing. Like, this is the best mobile home I've ever seen. <laughs> and I've bought a lot of mobile homes. I've made money, I've lost a lot of money on them. But this one, if this one loses money, I don't know what's gonna happen. So obviously the backyard is amazing. It's gonna be a great selling point, but the front yard's pretty good too. You've got this huge driveway over here and you get this extra parking, which up for anyone in the community, but it's right next to you. So this parking is nice. You even get your own driveway right here as well. I mean, if you're gonna have people over, you could fit eight cars between your two car driveway right here, that driveway here, these spaces. You don't ever have to worry about that. And then just this view from the street, you could see Lake Mead right there. And it is beautiful in this view. I mean, this is just a beautiful community. I mean, if I was older and wanted to retire, but not be in Vegas, be out here, this is it, this is where it's at. So let's go back inside. Let me show you what I plan on doing with the renovation. So when you're going to flip a house, there are really three things you can do. You could sell it as is, which this house could very well be sold as is. It's in great shape. You could do a light rehab on it. You could if you kept the flooring, but then you're gonna run into issues. If you wanted to put new cabinets, you're gonna get rid of these walls and stuff, but then this flooring is not gonna match because you're gonna lift up too many things. And there's so many other parts of the house where the flooring will probably get messed up. So doing a light renovation is gonna be hard. And that leads us with the third option, which is the full renovation. So if we do the full renovation, obviously we're gonna get rid of this flooring so we can move walls around how we want and really get the look we want. 
And that's the route that we're gonna go. I don't think the middle route makes sense. I think there definitely could be a route for just selling it as is, but we're gonna go with the full reno. Now, with the full reno, there is one thing I wanna do. I wanna add a third bedroom. A third bedroom isn't like a huge deal with 55 and over, but it definitely adds value. And I think right here where we're standing is the perfect spot to add the third bedroom. It's currently the dining room, but we just close the wall off right here. We extend the wall to this window right here. It will go just like this, right? So now we've got a third bedroom. This area back here, this is now the closet. Third bedroom, you put the door right here. It'll open into this wall. You got a third bedroom here, it'll look cool. Now think about the rest of the house. From here, you're gonna get rid of this wall. And remember, you're gonna have a wall right here. And what we'll do is put basically an island slash peninsula all the way across like this. So it'll line up with here. You have this huge bar top island. It's flush with the wall. It looks really good. People can sit right there. Now, you as the kitchen, you've got all this space to work with with your new island. This is shut off. You still have your fridge. You still have everything where it's at over here. Nothing changes. And then you go out right here. And if you think about that and visualize it, that's gonna be amazing because your front door is right here. So you're gonna walk in the front door and you just see this perfect, beautiful kitchen. And then your living room is right here, which you know has this wall now. And you have everything looking this way and you have that view of the lake looking this way. It's amazing. And then you still maintain this area over here for your dining. This will now be where you put your dining table. Super nice. So the good thing about this house is it's already converted to real property. So that means that it can get a loan. If a mobile home is not converted to real property, someone has to buy it cash. And really all they do to convert it is strap it into the ground and make it secure. That process typically costs us five, $6,000. So the fact that it's already done saves us money on the renovation. Now, as far as the rest of the numbers go, we bought this mobile for $160,000 from a wholesaler. The wholesaler made $20,000 on it themselves. So they actually had it under contract for 140,000. We anticipate putting about 30,000 into this. I think it could go a little bigger if we do some certain things. So we'll see kind of what we end up doing to stay on that $30,000 budget. As of now, comps are around 260,000, but none of the comps are gonna be as renovated as ours, have as nice of a kitchen, be a three bedroom, two bath like ours, have this kind of view in this mountain. I could very easily see this mobile selling for 280, 290, or even approaching 300 just because of all these intangibles that it has that none of these other ones have. But even at the 260 at which comps are currently going for, we're still gonna make probably 40 to $50,000. So even though I don't like to flip in Boulder City, that's why we bought it. And we're back. So this is the first time that I have seen the house. It took a couple of months to get it renovated, a little longer than we would have liked, but there's a silver lining. It actually is gonna benefit us because the market has gotten even hotter since we first filmed a couple of months back. Now, I had anticipated that we might get more than we thought originally because the market was starting to heat up then, but since it's just gone completely bonkers and now I think we might crush our estimates. All right, so if you have ever seen any of my other house flips, then you know that this is our traditional color scheme. We've been doing it probably for like the last one or two years, and there's really no reason for us to change it because it still sells really well. We always get these black accents, these white shaker cabinets, same stainless steel appliance package. I actually just noticed they put the microwave right here where the fridge is gonna be. So if you're sitting here thinking that, why would they put the microwave right there? Like, were they confused? Were they lazy? Did they think that, you know, I was gonna get this giant microwave or something? The answer is no. Here's why they did it. This company will not install the microwave over backsplash like this. See, typically our backsplash would end right here. You could put the microwave in, they drill it, everything's easy but they don't want the liability of installing this microwave and then screwing up all of the backsplash and having to pay for it. So now we're gonna have to send somebody to come out, install the microwave where it's supposed to be so it doesn't look stupid. But despite the microwave, the kitchen looks fantastic. I love that we ended up closing this off like we talked about, and now we have a much bigger island. People can prepare food, people can sit on the bar stools right here. It looks really good, and it's really big now. It's super spacious. You get a lot of room to walk around and do stuff, so I love how it turned out. 
The big thing that we changed was closing this dining area off and making a third bedroom. So if we look into here, the third bedroom, like I said before, it wasn't gonna be huge, but you can definitely fit probably like a full size bed, has a closet, counts as that third bedroom. That's all we're really worried about. And then functionally, everything makes sense now. You can have your dining table right here, and then your living room is over here right when you enter. You'd put your nice couch right here. Maybe you could do it like this, diagonally. There's a bunch of different configurations, but it all makes perfect sense. So let's go check out how the bedrooms and bathrooms turned out. All right, so for the first bathroom, we did our same trim over here. We got the white quartz, we got the white shakers, same accents. We kept this tub because it was in really good shape. We kind of refinished it and then we matched it with the black accents. Looks really good. So keeping that bathroom tub saved us a couple thousand dollars and it doesn't really affect the resale value one way or the other, so that was good. But this tub was the problem before. It had the huge wallpaper, everything like that. And man, I'm looking at it now for the first time, like it's much better. As you can see, we drywalled this, got rid of all that flower wallpaper. This one had like the weird tub with like the wallpaper connected to it. And so we had to tile this one and it looks a million times better. So you would have had no idea that this bathroom was just so weird before this. But yeah, overall the bedrooms, they look really good. Looking at this guest bedroom over here, it looks really good. I'm really happy with how this house turned out. All right, so let's talk about the numbers. When we first bought this property, one of the biggest things that attracted me was this lake right behind me. I'm not sure if you can pick it up in camera real well, but in person, it is amazing. And I know that there is no inventory in this community at all because the people who buy here do not sell. I've been talking to the neighbors while I've been filming this video and they're just wanting to know what it's gonna sell for and all that stuff because stuff just never comes up. But overall, this deal is gonna end up being really good for us. We bought it for $160,000. You know, as I said before, we got it from a wholesaler. That wholesaler made 20 grand off the deal, win for them. We ended up putting about 35,000 into this. So between purchase and rehab, we're in it for 195. Now, originally we estimated we would sell it for 260,000 and we would make great money doing that. But with the market so hot, we're gonna list it at 300,000 and I'm pretty certain we're gonna get something close to that. So it's gonna be a huge win. Now I know a lot of you guys wanna know all of the cost and what the profit will be, so we'll break it down real quick. We're gonna spend about $11,000 in realtor fees. That includes the buyer's agent, that includes the listing agent, everything. We're gonna spend about another $8,000 in money cost. That's the loan we took out to buy the home. We're gonna spend another $6,000 in closing costs. That is between buying the house and selling the house. And then we'll probably have another $3,000 in holding costs. This would be utilities, HOAs, all of that stuff. If you sum it all together, there's about $28,000 in cost. And if you remember, our original all-in was 160 for the purchase, 35 for the rehab. So it puts us at 223 all-in. And so if we sell this for $300,000, we'll make 77,000 on a mobile home. So let that be a lesson to you that there are so many different ways to make money in real estate investing. You could buy mobile homes, you could buy condos, you could buy townhouses, single family, land, you name it, you can make money on it if you just understand how it works. A lot of people did not want to buy this because it was in a city outside of Vegas, it's a mobile home, and they just missed out on you know $77,000 profit. So don't ever dismiss different opportunities. Just try and figure out how to understand them. I've got one of my very first students here on the podcast, and uh, it's been really cool watching her grow these last two years um, from somebody who was full-time at a job in Hawaii to now um, done with that job, doing real estate full time, using the Burr strategy in, you know, a very expensive market where people think you can't get deals or do rentals or those types of things, but also somebody who's become a millionaire and uh, is inspiring a ton of people on social media, especially women. I've got none other than the one and only Zasha, or as you're known online, invest with Zasha. Aloha everybody. Yeah. How's it going? <laughs> good, good. Just, uh, flew in. So kind of recovering from that, from Hawaiian time to Vegas time. You took the, the red eye here. Yes, I did. Well, 
you look good and uh, everything's going good. Um, we're here right now at my mastermind. Uh, we, man, there's a lot of people out there as we film I right know. now. Um, we're doing the VIP day and it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, but yeah, I want to, I want to talk about your story because you've got so many things going on and I've been able to see it firsthand, you know, these last couple of years grow and develop. So, um, why don't you tell everybody about kind of where you came from? Well, I was raised in Maui and Hawaii. Um, I went into civil engineering. I got my bachelor's degree and moved home because I wanted to go into a field that would make money in an expensive market. And once I started, I worked for 10 years and found out that it really wasn't my passion. So I started getting into real estate on the side, on weekends and you know after work just going on bigger pockets finding out different strategies and we bought a fixer-upper from there bought a rental and then just continued to scale yeah so I remember you so just some brief background for everyone listening um I started my coaching program at the end of 2019, you know, so January 2020 was really like kind of the first month. And um, it's definitely not what it is today. Like uh, looking at today, we were just talking about that before the podcast, uh, just how crazy it is, like how fast it's grown. And you were one of the first um, initial members. We should, we need to come up with like a, a name for you guys. The like, originals, the, the OGs. Origi the OGs. And I remember with the OGs, um, you were one of them and we held our very first mastermind, which by the way, like wasn't even a plan with the program. I, I, there was like eight or 10 people and I was like, Hey guys, wouldn't it be cool? Just like all meet together. Cause like we've been doing this training and stuff and everyone was like, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> and so I was like, all right, let's just do it at my house. And so I remember we all came, you guys all came down to Vegas. You came from, um, Hawaii. Uh, Jeremy came from Alaska. Mm -hmm. Brian came from Cali. Uh, there wasn't really that many Vegas people and we just had a good time hanging out at the house and, uh, you know, just talking and going through each person and kind of what they had going on. And, uh, it's crazy to think about now. Yeah. It was a really intimate experience and I felt that everybody kind of was on the same level as far as support and just being in your home, you know, having lunch on your kitchen Island, it was really, um, small. And I felt comfortable for this being my first coaching program. It was exactly what I needed. Yeah. And at that time you were, you had just flipped a house. I remember, right? Mm -hmm. You made a lot of money. Yeah. So we had flipped. We, I started with my first flip was a condo because I didn't know how it was going to go. Um, I have, you know, two kids married. So we wanted to not take too much risk. Bought the condo, um, flipped it, made a hundred thousand. At that time, I was only making seventy thousand a year at my job, and so my husband was like, "Dude, you should quit." <laughs> <laughs> Can you just do this a right? lot? <laughs> it took so it took us thirty days to renovate. We sold to a cash buyer um, fifteen days later. So in forty five days, I made more than I made working a year as a civil engineer. So that kind of blew my mind, and just made it all happen. Well, the thing is like a civil engineer, like that's a super skilled job. You know? And it's very stressful. I was working <laughs> 60, 70 hour weeks, um, or, and handling huge projects. So it was definitely, you know, time consuming and it took a lot of energy out of me every week and yeah. away from my family. Yeah. So how was it like doing that first flip while being a mom? being a wife, you know, having this 60, 70 hour a week job and just kind of like, you, you know, like you said, you didn't have any coaching or anything. Like you're just kind of winging it. <laughs> like, right. how was that? It was difficult, especially, um, just being married, you know, in a relationship. And my husband knew going through that project, like, okay, this is going to be our first one, a tester, but moving forward, it's not always going to be like that. Like you have to get your systems and processes together because we can't be this stressed out yeah. all the time just to make, you know, make, we made a good amount of money. However, if it's affecting the family life or your happiness, that kind of isn't important. Yeah. So you flipped that house. Um, 
and then you joined the program. And I remember in our initial conversation, you were kind of like, yeah, I mean, the flip, I made a lot of money. I'm like, how much you make? And you're like, you know, I made like a hundred some thousand dollars. I'm like, you made a hundred some thousand dollars your first flip. Like, are you the best flipper ever? Like, what's, <laughs> you know, that's crazy. And even then though, you were still like, I just want to get rentals. You, you never really wanted to be a flipper per se. So how has things evolved like since, you know, that initial conversation? Right now, I am focused on mainly flipping, using creative strategies, partnering with other people um, to take over some of the other roles and also build up my renter portfolio. So I bought a few rentals at the beginning of this year. I have six uh, projects going on, renovations, um, listings and things like that. And I mostly use the birth strategy. So I am in it with no money or I get infinite return. That's always the goal. And also for my flips, I try to be in it, no money using hard money and then also other people's money to fund it and private money as well. Yeah. I love that. You know, same here. You know, I don't really like to use any of my own money in any deals. Um, and I'm hoping that any deal I get, if I do want to keep it, it's a good enough deal where I can get all my money back out of it. Um, and that's kind of how I've built my wealth, just doing that strategy <laughs> a lot. Right. There's not like a, a secret sauce to it. It's just get good deals and however you choose to exit, whether it's flipping them or, you know, refinancing and keeping them as rentals, you're going to just become wealthy just over time. So, I mean, at this point, um, you've got six rehabs going on, which in, in Hawaii is very different than most places. Like I've been there and I've looked at potentially buying a second home there and just talking to people who are local. Cause we have a lot of Hawaiians in our programs. They're like, yeah, the permit process and just construction in Hawaii is a nightmare. How is it? It, as far as doing new builds, it's easier than trying to get a renovation permit or try to build, um, you know, an ohana, which is a detached dwelling, I guess a second unit on the property. It takes probably about six to eight months for the permitting process and the plans to get submitted. And then after that, six to eight months to actually build it. So it is more so of a long, longer term play than it would be in other areas. Yeah. Yeah. I've just heard too, it's like everything in Hawaii. Well, I know this for a fact. Everything is more expensive. Like we were there in, I think, June. Yeah. We took a family vacation in June. And I'm like, man, this food's expensive. The right. gas is expensive. The hotel's expensive. Beautiful place. And I started thinking, I'm like, I can't imagine how much the contractors are and the supplies and all these things compared to what I'm accustomed to here in Vegas. Yeah, it's definitely a lot higher and people don't realize that going in. They take like mainland prices or prices from what they know. They come to Maui and think, oh, yeah, I can apply the same thing. But it's almost like twice as much, if yeah. not three times as much expensive. Yeah. And it'll take three times as long as it should. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just like, man, you know, Hawaii's a cool market. But I don't know that I personally would want to flip there. Like if I was just like picking a remote market, like if you live there, great. You know, right. we have a lot of students successful out there locally. Um, but you're just, you know, you're playing a different ball game where it's like, we don't need to do big high volume. Like, let's just go make a hundred thousand on a few deals and we're good. Right. And that's the strategy yeah. that I have been using. And I know a lot of people, you know, definitely go for volume, but because there is a bigger spread where I live we only have to do so many to reach the same numbers. Yeah. How would you say competition wise it is out there? Cause like in Vegas, man, the competition is fierce. You know, there's a lot of I buyers, hedge funds, me, you know, other flippers and stuff. So it's like, it seems in Hawaii, there's probably not as many. So there are a few flippers uh, out there and people who come in and, and, want to get into the business but because it's such a small island it's definitely relationship based and people will come to you with deals or want to partner or even sellers will come to you because say they know your cousin or one of your friends referred you so i've been really focusing on that just the networking aspect and even a lot of agents have been bringing pocket listings so i've been nurturing um, those type of 
relationships. Yeah. And let's talk about relationships because it's one of the biggest things that I preach to, to everybody is like, yo, get active on social media so that way you can network, build relationships, and you're going to do deals with people. They, they just have to know who you are. And watching you um, these last couple of years, you've definitely taken it seriously, um, more so than most, and really built up a good following. Um, it may not be just like this huge, enormous following, but you know, your following for what you're trying to accomplish is perfect. It's like, really, it's just like, Hey, I need everyone in Maui to know who I am. Right. You know? And if that's, if that happens, I'm going to get deals. Yeah. And I found that a lot of people relate to me being a mom, you know, having kids, the balancing of investing and building wealth and they reach out to me. So I answer like most of my DMs and I'm always there to help people get to that next level because I know what it's like and I'm yeah. not this huge, you know, too big to where I can't help smaller people as well. Yeah. So would you say that pretty much all your deals have been just relationships? Like you're not doing any marketing. No. Yeah. It's this year has been all relationship based. Yeah. And my guess is they just found you from social media from being active. Yeah. And, or a part of the community. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. So out of those, however many deals you're doing, like, what do you think all of those will make when they're all flipped and done? Probably all to combine, probably about 500,000. Yeah. See, so that's like, man, I remember when I first got started, you know, I didn't do any marketing. I just was all relationships. Like, Hey, let me go network with as many people as humanly possible. I want to go to coffee. I want to go to lunch. I was hitting people up on Facebook doing like outbound marketing where I was just reaching out to big players. Cause I was a nobody. Right. <laughs> and then you do the reverse where, you know, you put out the content. So people reach out to you. And like, if you do both of those things, um, I was just telling the people in the VIP day today, like you can go dominate your local market very easily. Like it's not, people just don't take social media seriously enough that there's like much competition. Right. And people want to do business, um, with people they like is what I've found, or they can relate to, or have some sort of similarity. So the more that you show that, especially through social media, I mean, that's the quickest way for people to get a glimpse of who you are. Um, yeah. What would you say, what would you say to the people who are like, oh, well, I don't have time for it. You know, you know, you, you were somebody who is a mom working these jobs or working this job and, uh, you know, now flipping, having six projects. Like, what'd you say? I say you make time, um, especially right now, because I have so much going on at nighttime. I take breaks whenever I'm in between, you know, phone calls or I'm supposed to be eating lunch. I jump on. I wake up at 4.30 in the morning. Whoa. So <laughs> <laughs> I don't even do that. that. Like they always, you know, there's a saying, right, is if you don't have time, make time. So that's what I've learned to do is make a morning routine, get up before the kids, get up before anything starts. That's when I do my exercise, my me time, thinking, journaling, and then also getting on social media, starting my day. So when you get on social media, though, you're not like getting on to just go browse. You're, you're talking about making content and stuff. Yes, definitely. So I've I've learned to just focus. I mean, it, you need to engage with other people as well, but it has to be very intentional, especially if you're limited on time. So I make sure that I, you know, get back to people on the DMs, comment on um, some bigger investor pages so that other people know who I am. And then also post educational content or contact. Sometimes that's funny and uh, entertaining, but also teaches them something. Yeah, for sure. I think you just said a couple of great strategies that people might miss. Um, when I think about social media and trying to draw traffic, I just personally create content. I'm like, hey, <laughs> let's just make videos. And uh, if they're good, and hopefully the algorithms push them out. Right. And hopefully people share them. And that's all I focus on, right? But you mentioned that there's other ways to actively grow um, that take more effort, but they're worth it. You know, you said you go to big pages and comment, you yeah. know, um, you will also, like I said, when I was starting out, I'll, I'll DM other big people like, yo, you know, let's do a deal or let's do a collab. Like, let's, let's do something together. Yeah. 
there's a lot of ways to get seen. Mm -hmm. And I found too, there's all these different features like Reels, IG Live, um, that you can now bring on another person. So I've been kind of using that strategy. And once, you know, some bigger investors see me doing that, they're like, hey, do you want to be on mine? And yeah. then it just kind of snowballs from there because now they know this person is open to doing it. I want to try it. She knows what she's doing. And yeah, we go from there. I know you, you and Brian Davila were on together the other day. I'm like, I guess I have to do it now. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think it's super cool. I just, you know, the point I want to point out to anyone listening is you actually took action um, during this time. Like, and I've had a chance to watch it happen and grow. Um, you know, another guy who's been on the podcast, Alex Camacho, you know, he's been the same way. He joined the program early. Um, he's developed a really good sized following for himself. He moved to Hawaii too. And just to see kind of like, you guys take hold of it and take it seriously and reap the rewards is like, it makes me feel good. Cause it makes me think, you know, like it's not just me. That's like seeing the results of this. Yeah. And I think a lot of people get, get uh, like confused on, Oh, I got to be on it and do all these things. It's like, no, you, you do what you can and then, you know, focus on your business as well. It doesn't have to consume your life, but be like I mentioned before, be intentional with, the reason why you're on there, create these relationships that may lead to deals or bigger things that, you know, who knows? Yeah. You never know what it's going to lead to. That's mm -hmm. the, that's the beauty of it. It's just like all the opportunities and, you know, just even at this event right now, <laughs> I just talked to a bunch of people and they're like, Hey, will you do X, Y, Z with me? What's your experience been like in the program? Um, I like asking people who, you know, are a guest, uh, we've had a few that are in the program, but like, what's the biggest thing you think you've learned? I think not to be afraid to put yourself out there and try new things. Before I joined the program, I was just doing one deal at a time because I felt safe and felt comfortable. And then after, you know, watching you and other people in the program, it gave me the confidence to be open to doing more projects at a time. And now, you know, I'm handling a few at a time. And also to take that balance, right, because you have also put on emphasis on your family you put emphasis on health um to, sh to try to balance all those things as well as your business yeah that's the one thing i started to notice from all of our students right like we started out like we we're talking about eight people in my living room two years ago so now i think in all-star we have over 100 and rookie we have over like 400 and then i see all of these cool people across the country kind of emulating the things that I've talked about for a while now of like, Hey, you know, spend time with your family. It ain't about how much money you make. Like it's really about freedom and like lifestyle. And then I see people taking their health seriously, like calling me out to bench press challenges and stuff. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> then I see, um, people posting on social media, trying to grow a brand and a following. And I think that is the coolest thing is to see so many like-minded people all together because it seems like there's like everyone is like trying to do the same type of things right and i like that in this program too you can cater it to how you want it to be so you don't have to be a ryan pineda and have this big flipping company and have ceos and mm -hmm. all that you can still be kind of a one-man show but have a few helpers have vas partner you know yeah. you can take that route and just take on however many deals that you feel comfortable with yeah that's one of the things people always ask too, they're like, how much is enough? I'm like, dude, I mean, for everyone, it's different. Right. Like there are people who are just like, oh, if I can make a hundred thousand a year flipping houses, just flip in your case, one house <laughs> or, but you know, in most people's cases, right. yeah, flip five houses a year, whatever. Um, I'm good. Like I'm happy. And I'm like, that's great. Like I support you. You do not need to scale. You don't need to hire. You don't need to do all these things. Like you could do a one man show and chill. Um, and then there are people who want millions. I'm like, okay, you want millions. Here's the cost, baby. Right. Like you, <laughs> there's, here's the people you got to hire. Here's the processes. Here's how you do it. Um, it's hard work, but it's possible. And here's how. Yeah. I like that <laughs> option and that you give <laughs> different avenues and people can just go with it. Yeah. I, what I like is what uh, you've started to do as well as 
other students is taking initiative. Um, like, so you started out as a student and then after a year you became, um, an accountability coach. Right. And so like what we do in the program is we basically make students who have spent over a year who we really like, who we think would become great coaches. Um, we make them accountability coaches. And so they lead, you know, small groups, like groups of two, three people. And, um, like that was great. Like, I think the accountability portion is so huge for success in anything in life. But then all of the students were like, well, we want to start like these mini masterminds too. And I'm like, dude, if you guys want to do it, I ain't stopping you. Like I'm with it. Okay. If you guys want to run it like cool. And so we have like a multifamily mastermind. Uh, Christian's out here. He's on the podcast too. Mm -hmm. um, and then you started a women's one and uh, other people have started other ones. Like how's the women's one going? It's going good. And I feel like, you know, because it is kind of like a male dominated business, it's nice to have that extra support for women or if they're going through something, say their contractor, they feel like they're taking advantage of them or something's happening because they're women, they can openly speak about it. Right. Mm -hmm. What are some issues that you see that women have in this business compared to maybe men don't have to go through? I think that's the biggest one, probably construction. The, yeah, construction. I've, I've like seen this that girl don't know what she's doing. You're <laughs> right. like, I'm a civil engineer, fool. <laughs> like, <laughs> I know exactly what I'm talking. About. No, it's <laughs> it's crazy because even as an engineer, when I would go to the job sites, you know, we'd be doing huge hotel projects or grading massive shopping centers, and they're they're like, oh, where's your boss? And like, I am the boss. <laughs> yeah, I'm the like. What are you talking about? Right? You report to me. <laughs> yeah, I've heard that with uh, women a lot that construction's a hard part. Um, it's funny though, cause I think there are, are things that women have the advantage of. Uh, I say this all the time, like my VAs, I like to hire only women and I don't think it's sexist, but I don't know. Um, <laughs> all I know is it gets better results right? because it's like people are less likely to hang up on women than they are to men. Yeah. And that's the same <laughs> with me for like when I go door knocking, right? Like a lot of people are afraid that they're going to get the door slammed. And maybe that's the case. But I feel like if you're a woman and approaching a home, it's less threatening than a man, like a strange man approaching yeah. you. Yeah. Do you feel like, though, that you might uh, have a threat by door knocking? I just try to stay. So a couple pointers that I give women is like, OK, try to stay within, you know, a visible area, um, knock on the door and maybe step back. Um, so yeah. obviously go in sunlight, you know, be aware of your surroundings and then take somebody if you can. Yeah. Like, have you like walked into a strange dude's house? He's like, yeah, I'll sell you my house. I've, I've never walked into the house. So I've always like been at the door and then especially since COVID started, I mean, yeah. people are already distant. Yeah. Yeah. Door knocking's interesting. Um, I've door knocked strategically of like, I know I want to reach this person. Maybe it's that house or some house. So I'll go door knock and I'm like, I don't care. Freaking whatever happens, happens guys. Um, but yeah, it's a little different when you're a woman and um, there's a lot of weird people in the world. I know. But I think for me, I, I kind of got over my fear of strangers when I was couch living. Cause like literally on Craigslist, you know, I go and hit them up. They're like, yeah, go pick it up. I just, I'm literally walking into strangers' houses like every day, multiple times, just picking up these couches. <laughs> and I saw some weird stuff, man. And then, you know, I go to sell it. People are like, yeah, deliver it. Going and delivering this couch to, you know, some weird person I never know. And, uh, yeah, you definitely meet some characters, that's for sure. But I, I never felt like once that, you know, my life was in danger or like there was a threat. You know, I think the amount of weird people is very low. Like most people are pretty harmless. Yeah. Well, and I feel like with women too, m most women are good listeners and people like that. Sometimes they just want to be heard. Yeah. Whereas some men are like just straight to the point, like, okay, are you going to sell this house or not? Versus, you know, for mine, I'm like, they call me like the soft closer because <laughs> I'll just like listen until they're done and then, you know, continue with whatever I have to say or talking about their home or their situation. So they've, they feel more so heard yeah. than most other people. That's funny. Yeah. I've, it's funny cause I'm a, I guess a soft listener too. I, 
maybe I'm like a silent assassin because I'll like, <laughs> I'll go into an appointment. If you ever go on an appointment with me, you'll know what I'm talking about because I just like listen the whole time. I, I literally say nothing. I'm just like, yes, yeah, so tell me about the house. Let them talk. I ask another question, talk, ask another question. They talk. And uh, maybe that's why I'm a host of a podcast too. I'm just a good question asker. And then I'll find, I'll ask leading questions that I know are going to get them closer to the result I'm looking for. And then finally, I'll just be like, all right, now here's the final like question. Even, even the offer is a question. It's never like, Hey, I'll give you a million bucks for your home. You know, it's always like, you know, sounds like there's a lot going on. You know, is there price you're looking for? Maybe they tell me the price. Maybe they don't. It's like, you know, I don't know, but like, is something like a million bucks, would you even cons- I don't even know if I could pay that, but would you consider that? Mm-hmm. And then everything's a question that that's my number one sales tip for you guys. Never commit to anything. The only thing I'm committed to is, uh, my wife and my <laughs> kids. Other than that, everything's a question. Right. So I think that's super cool. Uh, what you're doing. I think, uh, you know, the social media is great. I think, um, there's some great lessons for everyone to learn as far as, uh, you know, getting started, um, you know, expensive markets. Is there anything, uh, that you think is important for anyone listening to know? I think the biggest thing that changed for me that gave me the ability to scale and take on more is really my mindset. So changing the way I think instead of, oh, I can't do it because it's an expensive market thinking, okay, how am I going to do it? Because it's an expensive market. How am I going to close this deal? How am I going to get deals? What am I going to do differently? Um, So basically having the solution seeking mindset and thinking positive. And every day I try to, you know, tell myself positive affirmations and just really ingrain that into my mind. Yeah. I love that. Mm Mm-hmm. I think uh, confidence, which is what positive affirmations are really doing. Confidence is the biggest thing. Like if you believe you can close a deal, you'll find a way to close a deal. You believe that you can make content and, you know, uh, put out social media stuff, you'll do it. Right. (laughs) And uh, you may not even be good at it, but (laughs) over time you'll figure it out because you you have belief. So I think that's super awesome. Um, Tell me like what would you do content wise? Like if you were recommending, you know, somebody to start because you're somebody who's, you know, like I give my advice for content based on like what worked for me and my resources, but you're perfect example of like somebody who could start today. Like, what do you do? What's your routine? Mainly I start. So before the week gets too crazy, I usually on Sundays, I think of ideas, what I want to put out there, And then, um, you know, try to film as much as I can or make the posts, pre-make them in my drafts, save them. And then from there, it gets easier to post throughout the week without taking so much of your time. And definitely posts that add value. Think of things that your audience will like. For me, I target, you know, either newer investors or investors that um, are experienced, but say they don't want to be in the active realm they want to be passive so they want to lend so i i focus my content more towards that yeah what have you seen as like uh, i mean you're talking about lenders now Mm -hmm. you've seen a lot of lenders come through from all your posts definitely so one of my lenders seen me hustling on instagram (laughs) and (laughs) instantly uh knew that i already had the drive the determination i was active and uh that's how i kind of gain their trust is that they know okay she's not just you know sitting around doing nothing and she also has experience she's been successful you know in all these flips and she has all these rentals so from there getting that backing but also them just physically seeing it with their own eyes through social media has built that trust. Yeah. I say this all the time. Like if you're in the real estate business and you are not actively showcasing what you're doing, um, and for whatever reason, maybe it's you want to be humble or maybe you just don't like people in your business or maybe, you know, just they're, they're, there's a million reasons. And I was, I was the same way. I just didn't want people in my business. I was kind of private. So I didn't show up for a long time. Um, 
But if you're one of those people, I would say you're foolish Um, because it's just you are missing out on so many opportunities by not showcasing what you're doing. And you don't have to, like, make these crazy videos. You could literally just walk around a house with iPhone, just raw, unedited, live stream, walk through it. And that does the job of showing like, yo, Sasha's a hustler. You know, she's doing it. Mm -hmm. And me as a lender, I might be like, oh man, like I, I've thought about investing in real estate, but I just don't have time. I don't know what to do, but this girl's doing it. And then guess what? You still have to like tell people like what they can do with you because that lender may watch it and he may think, oh man, like that's cool. Like I wish I had somebody that would do that for me. But guess what Zasha's like? And by the way, if you want to get in on this deal, <laughs> I need some lenders or you want to get in on the next one like this, send me a DM. And then boom, that dude's like, perfect, let's go. And that was something I had to learn through my content as well was um, once I started showcasing what I was doing, I did get people who were like, yo, I see what you're doing. Like, how do I get in? And that was cool. But it wasn't until I told them exactly what to do and exactly how I could help them then the results started to change dramatically. Right. They call that, they say it's a call to action because you can, like how you said, put everything out there, what you're doing. But if you don't directly give them something to do or let them know what, how they could benefit, yep. then they probably won't contact you. Yeah. Cause there's like the content I see sometimes where people are like, look at my watch. And you know, I'm like, you got the watch <laughs> right now. And it's like, that's cool, dude, but <laughs> this doesn't help me. Right. You get a cool watch, man. Uh, but if I'm like, yo, you know, I just flipped this house and we're looking for lenders on the next one, DM me the word lender if you want to lend, right? That way I know what you want. And then, you know, or hey, you want to flip houses like me? You guys probably see me do it on Instagram and stuff a lot. DM me the word flip. You know, you can join Future Flipper. We'll show you how to start flipping houses. And the point is like, if somebody watches you and they follow you, they have a vast, they have a vested interest in whatever it is you put out, right? So, more than likely, um, they're gonna want to do business with you in some way, right? And I try not to think about it too much before I post because then I might not post. You can't really overthink it. Um, and then even in your stories, you know, you know they're gonna disappear in twenty four hours. So even if you post something that you didn't really like, you know, it's gonna go away. So yeah, not there forever. Yeah, I used to think about that too when I was posting stories because, <laughs> uh, yeah, they're more raw. But like, I remember I'd be like, oh, do I want to post like these call to actions all the time? Like, are people going to just get annoyed of me? Mm -hmm. And then I'm like, well, there's probably a lot of people who've never even seen my story before. This could be the first time they ever see it. And it might be the only chance that I ever get to show them like, yo, you could do something with me. So I think... I guess us as creators, we think people are watching us all the time and like we're annoying them. But you got to remember that most likely most people have not seen, you know, you do what you're doing. You got a few loyal ones who like watch everything, but the majority are not seeing everything you do. Right. I think a lot of people too, uh, who are beginners, they need to see things repeatedly before they actually take that next step. So today we are going to my very first flip ever. I wanna show you guys kinda of how my first deal went because I know so many of you are struggling to get that first one and you know the first one is always, always the toughest. So we're gonna go drive by it, see what it looks like now, see if uh, you know what's going down with it and um, you know, we'll talk a little bit about how I found the deal, kinda of the, the headaches and the struggles that I went through to you know, get it fixed up and sell it. And you know, the lessons I learned and, you know, I, I'll tell you what, that very first deal, man, there ain't nothing like it. So, um, yeah, I'm excited to go see it again. My very first deal, the one that we're going to go see, I bought it and I ended up buying a second deal right after it. And then, um, that second deal ended up selling before the first deal. So I kind of like, you know, my first payday was really my second deal and my second deal ended up making about $25,000 and that was such an easy flip. Like I literally put like two grand into it, threw it back on the, I bought it off the MLS, put two grand into it, literally like three days later, put it back on the MLS. First day got an offer, full price, and it sold like, you know, 
30 something days later. It was wild, man. And we made like 25 grand. And that was when I was like, holy crap. You addicted after that, huh? I was like, dude, this is the real deal. And then I still had the first one I bought, which was a lot, <laughs> a lot more headache than that one. So, uh, yeah, we're going to go over the first one. And, you know, but that second one, though, there ain't much to learn about it. I got lucky. So it, it's interesting, like this area, I grew up over in this area. And, um, you know, it's a little bit older now. You know, it was, it was really nice when I was young. And so when I got older and I was able to buy my first home, I was like, dude, I ain't living in this area now. It's old, blah, blah, blah. And I realized later on, as I started flipping, I'm like, dude, the old areas are where it's at. Those are the houses that you gotta fix up. You know, all these new houses that I'm looking at and that like I'm thinking I wanna live in and that other people wanna live in, they're great and they're nice, but there's no value. You can't really add value to them because what am I gonna fix up? You know, people aren't selling them, they're not distressed. So I learned to re-love these old areas that I grew up in, you know? Same thing, like we got a mobile home park over here. I, I was like, dude, mobile homes, who's buying that crap? And then all of a sudden I learned there's a lot of money to be made in them. So it was kind of changing my mindset of, hey, this old stuff that I see that I think is a piece of crap, like that's the that's where the gold is the gold isn't in these nice areas the gold ain't in the country clubs it's over here you know and so totally changed my mindset and ironically you know the first couple houses that i bought and lived in you know they were built 2000 and newer and you know really nice but as i started flipping and stuff i realized like dude i can make any old house really nice and new and so um the last house my wife and i lived in you know it was a 30 year old plus home and we totally redid it. We moved the stairs. We like did crazy stuff to make it modern and how we wanted it because I just had learned to love these areas again because, you know, they uh, they really did bring me the wealth that I have today because without, you know, me buying in these places and fixing them up, you know, we're not making any money. So, I definitely have learned to enjoy it. We are pulling up to my very first flip ever. And I'm a little hesitant doing videos while I drive because my wife tells me I'm like the worst driver ever. So me talking and driving, you might see a crash during this video, but uh, I'm gonna do my best to be safe. So we're right here, like I said, pretty close to where I grew up. So it was a good first flip for me because I was very familiar with the area. Um, and I know even though it's old and you know, whatever it's still a good area people want to live here um, this is an interesting twist to the deal we have an elementary school right across the street from it and we are pulling up to it not this one for sale but this one and it actually has a lockbox on it dude oh man we might be able to go in it all right Let's look it up. The, the exterior paint is the exact same as when I flipped it. Um, I bought this house basically like almost, let's see, 15, 2015, 16, 17, 18, 19, four years ago. Well, about four and a half years ago. Because we're pretty late in the year. So four and a half years later, outside looks the exact same. I really hope that it's vacant so we could go in it. That'd be super cool. All right, let's see what's going on with it. Okay, I don't see it for sale. It's for rent. We can go see it. Let's check it out. Okay, it's vacant, cool. Let me um, sign into my thing. I don't ever go to property, so I'm never signed in. All right, so we got really lucky. The house is actually first day on the market for rent. I looked up the history. You know, back when I bought it, I paid a hundred and, what did I pay? I don't want to misquote, but it was like $135,000. I can't even remember now. And I bought it thinking, okay, I'm gonna sell this thing for about 200,000. It doesn't need like any work, you know, yada, yada, yada. It had a tenant in it and, you know, 
I didn't really know how to get a tenant out of there. I had no idea what I was doing, so I actually paid the tenant a thousand bucks. I said, hey, if you're out of, if you if you're out in 30 days, I'll give you a thousand bucks, and they were. But what I didn't know was they were on a month-to-month -month lease, so legally, I could have served them a 30-day notice anyway, and they had to get out. So I wasted a thousand bucks there. Mistake number one by me, but whatever. So, you know, I get in the house, they're moved out, whatever, and I'm gonna show you the inside of the house um, here in a second when we get in it. But funny thing is, you know, you've got this elementary school over here, and every single day these stupid kids would be coming here, hanging out in this little courtyard that we're standing in now, because it's like just a perfect place to chill. You know, I, I don't blame them, they're kids, but the dumbest kid would climb up this wall and be on the roof. I remember checking on this property every day after school because I kept hearing from my guys like, dude, you got these kids who are on the roof. I'm like, dude, this is a freaking eight-year-old kid climbing on the roof. He's about to fall and get me sued on my very first flip. I'm gonna like, you know, whatever. And so I remember I, I went over here, I yelled at the kids, and then I immediately like took the kid to the principal's office and I'm like, yo, this kid, is on my roof across the street. And she's like, okay, sorry, sorry. You know, we'll, uh, we'll watch them and this and that. And so from that point on, you know, I had a, you know, monitor or uh, whatever, a monitor watching this, this house for us. And so that was a blessing. And, and that's one thing I can tell you guys is a big tip is when you get a problem house, Typically, it ain't gonna be, you know, elementary school kids. Typically, it's gonna be squatters, you know, gang bangers, whatever the case may be in these areas. Um, make sure you just talk to the neighbors. You know, the neighbors don't wanna see a house getting, you know, messed up unless they're the ones doing it, which I've had happen too. But as long as you got a neighbor who you can trust, you're gonna go to them and say, hey, look, can you watch the house for me? Can you, you know, keep an eye on it? If anything happens, call me, call the cops if you see something. Um, and that way they're gonna be your best security system. Um, and I learned that through the, this very first deal, just talking to the school, they're my neighbor. And so, and I've done it many times on other properties where they kept getting broken into or issues and whatever. And so I tell the neighbor, hey, I'm gonna give you a hundred bucks, 200 bucks, you know, just watch it once it sells, I'll pay you, you know, and then you're gonna get a new neighbor, you're getting a remodeled home next to you, your house is gonna be worth more because I'm raising the value in the neighborhood. There's a lot of good things you could tell your neighbor for them to be on your side. So, you know, I learned a ton just from little kids, you know? So let's go in, let's check it out and see what's going down with it now. Enter. All right, I'm excited to see what they did. My guess, probably nothing, because we flipped it. What are they gonna do to it? All right. It's just as I left it. Um, first thing you guys are probably wondering is like, okay, this tile is hideous. And you're absolutely right. I had, this tile was here when I bought it. Now, when I bought it, my the guy who sold me it, um, had told me he was a flipper too, flipper and a wholesaler. And he says, hey, I would leave the tile. It's in good enough shape. People are gonna still buy it. And I said, okay, I'll trust you. In here, I ended up, at the time, I was still flipping used appliances and um, you know, used furniture and stuff. And so these are still the same appliances that I bought um, and put in here. I, I think I paid like 300 bucks for all these appliances back in the day because that was wheeling and dealing. This is new. I did not put this in here. I put a used fridge, so they probably, probably gave out, but whatever. Um, for this kitchen, we had these same cabinets. They were what were already here, so I never touched them. We uh, put this granite in it, so we did change that. You know, we did paint all of this. You know, another thing, these blinds, these were all things that we did. Um, my guess is they've repainted it since then because this is really um, like brand new but it was pretty similar color to what we did. Um, if you could tell, we never changed, we never got rid of the popcorn ceiling. You know, you see a lot of people who are like, oh, you gotta get rid of popcorn ceiling, and it's just not true. Like, if the comps don't say you need to, you don't need to. So, this was the weird part of the house that really caused us some drama. So originally, you know, the guy I bought it from, he was a, a flipper and a, a wholesaler, and you know, he's helped me out a lot in my career. And he had told me, hey, just leave the floor plan the way it is. And so we did. We, fixed, we just cleaned it up, fixed up the kitchen, didn't touch the floor plan. It turned out people didn't like the layout. 
because in here, there was an exterior window right here. Yeah, so there was an exterior window right here. This was all one bedroom. This whole thing was one bedroom. And it was super weird. Like this was an addition at some point. You can actually tell because you look at this beam and everything, like this was the end of the house. And so they built this extension at some point. And so the house ended here. You got an exterior window into another bedroom. So two bedrooms can like open a window and look at each other. And I thought it was weird, but it was my first flip. So I'm like, whatever, like if you think it'll sell, I believe you. And so it didn't. And so we ended up, we had it on the market for a really long time. And I'm like, dude, it's not selling because this is so weird. And so we took it off the market and we had to end up redoing it. So I ended up building this little hallway that you see. We closed it off, made a bedroom here, you know, really just put a giant closet back here. Um, and that was kind of how we, we took away the funkiness. Like, as you can see, this ceiling is so low, you know, that's how you know it was an addition. This was most likely a covered patio that they enclosed. Um, so huge learning lesson there. Another big learning lesson from all of this was the stupid garage. So when I bought the house, originally they told me, hey, this house is like 2,000 square feet. And I said, great, you know, um, 2,000 square feet, cool. Well, I didn't look at the floor plan on the assessor's website. I didn't see like what it really looked like. And for the 2,000 square feet, they were counting this garage as being converted. And so this garage obviously isn't converted. And so we lost, you know, like 200 square feet. So. The only reason I know that is because the appraiser went to appraise it and he goes, dude, your house is only like 1,700 something square feet. And I said, what are you talking about? And he's like, that garage isn't converted. That, that garage, they're saying it's converted, but it's not. So I can't give you value on that. And so even though we were in contract for like 200,000, he goes, I can only appraise it at like 189. I don't have all the exact numbers on me, but we lost like 10 grand in value because I didn't realize that wasn't square footage. So once again, I'm a rookie. I don't realize that a stupid window going into another bedroom is probably not a good idea. I didn't realize the house is not as big as I thought it was. You know, obviously the flooring, um, I think it's ugly. In today, today's flips, I would definitely have replaced it. But you know, <laughs> you learn. Same type of deal. They didn't touch this. We kept this the way it is. You can see um, they've painted it. We probably painted it too, I don't even remember. Um, we kept the vanity the way it was, as um, we just painted, we painted it so it's a nice stain and we put a top on it and now that I look at it, you know, I'm like, dude, I don't know what I was thinking, that's a terrible design, but whatever. So, you've got these bedrooms. This was the bedroom I was telling you about that had the big window into the other bedroom. So imagine you're sleeping here and you've got a, a freaking window with a blind on it, but you open the blind and it leads to your, your brother's bedroom or whatever. Like it was the stupidest thing I ever seen, but hey, when you're brand new, you don't know what you don't know. So, oh yeah, I, now that I'm here, I remember this other funky part. This is the funkiest house ever. So originally this hallway right here that you see, this did not exist, okay? What, ha what it was was, what the heck was it? I wanna say that this door was always here, but it stopped right here, okay? And what it was, this room pretty much went the whole way, okay? So it went the whole way into that hallway. So in order to get to this back area that you see here, there was only one way. It was through a bedroom. So this house was all sorts of jacked up, okay? And so once again, this was another thing that they, you know, probably enclosed a covered patio and added all this extra square footage. My guess, this house was probably like 1,200 square feet. And then they made it like 1,800 by enclosing everything. This is how it was when I bought it. And so this hallway, it was not here. This, this wall here wasn't here either. It was all flush and this was like a game room. 
And so you could only go through this bedroom to get in this room. It was jacked up. And so I tried to sell it like that and unsuccessfully. So after like two months on the market, I took it off and I said, we gotta fix this floor plan. I don't even know how we're gonna fix it because it's so messed up, it's so weird, but this was the best I came up with, you know? I said, you know what? Let's cut this room out so we have a hallway that can take us directly here. And so we did that and you know, that's smart. You can at least get back here now. Um, I extended, see you can tell this is an extension for what we did. I extended this part out because there was no master bed or like no master closet or anything. Like let's take a look, right? I just showed you pretty much two bedrooms and then a weird third one. So this was the master and it was super small. And so literally the closet was tiny, like it was right here. So this master was even smaller because the closet went out to like right here. And I said, dude, we got to make this master at least as big as possible. And so I took out the closet and you can kind of see it here from where the drywall, um, where the passion, you could see the closet used to be right here. So this was, if, if you think this is small now, imagine what it was before. So we took that square footage and then we built a little walk-in closet into that back area that you see now, you know? And I mean, look, would I live in this house? Absolutely not. But you gotta do what you gotta do to make it as functional as it can be, you know? Like, this is still a small master bathroom and, you know, we, we added this granite, we painted this, but, you know, it's the best we could do. Like, what are you gonna do about it? This house had a jacked up, or really jacked up uh, layout and, we pretty much made it the best it could be. And so I can tell you, you know, what you see now, it may not be all that impressive, but it is a thousand times better than what it used to be. You know, you can at least get to this game room. The master at least has a little bit of room and a walk-in closet. This bedroom isn't looking into his brother's bedroom. <laughs> um, you know, so it, it was a big learning experience. I'll tell you that much. And, you know, at the end of the day, what ended up happening was I bought the deal. I paid like 135,000. We ended up putting like, man, I want to say 15 grand in or so. Um, at first I just thought, Hey, I'm gonna put some granite. I'm gonna paint this place and be done. So I originally budgeted like five grand. Um, obviously that wasn't the case. We ended up having to redo the layout and do all this crap. And we ended up spending like 15 grand and, you know, we ended up selling it for 190,000. So, it still ended up working out at the end of the day, despite the many, many mistakes of paying the tenant when I didn't have to, kids jumping on the roof, um, misjudging how many square feet it was, misjudging that this layout sucks. You know, I could have even changed this flooring and probably got more, you know, but at the end of the day, we still probably made about $15,000 on it. And so what does that tell you guys? Like you don't have to be perfect. Okay, just because you don't know what you're doing yet. You know how much I learned on this flip compared to, you know, just reading in books? It's immeasurable. I got paid $15,000 and I made every mistake in the book. So I'm here to tell you like, don't think you need to know everything right out the get go. You're going to screw up and that's why you got to be ultra safe for first deal. Make sure you got a good spread so that if things don't work out the way you think, you're still going to be okay. Let's transition a little bit and talk about just these young, you know, call it 20 somethings or even teenagers. Uh, you're still a young guy. Uh, I just mentioned a bunch of other young guys that uh, are having success um, just like you in the program and stuff. But, uh, you know, it doesn't even have to be real estate related. What are some tips you have for young people who don't want to go to college, man? They want to be entrepreneurs. Like, what do you think? Um, I think it's all just a mindset, really. Um, if you, you know, if you think you're young, you're not, not experienced, um, you know, it's, it's going to show and you're just not going to have the confidence. So even when I didn't know what I was doing, I'd say I had pretty good self-confidence, um, in myself that, Hey, I'll figure it out. So I think confidence first, you know, first and foremost, kind of believing in, in yourself, um, whatever you want to do, you know, you, like I said, I, I was trying a bunch of different things and, I personally feel like I could have been successful in any one of them if I would have, you know, went down that path, but, um, I chose real estate. So, you know, having that confidence first and then having the action second, you know, being able to decide like, Hey, I'm going to go all in on this and, uh, I'm not going to stop till I succeed. Um, 
you know, so do, a do lot of these things. a lot of these people you know they they know they want to do real estate and uh their hard part is building the confidence to take action and so you see the analysis paralysis right or paralysis by analysis and they feel like i got to keep learning before i'm going to be confident enough how do you develop that confidence where you're like dude i understand <laughs> i'm never going to know it yeah. you know, at all like how do i when when do you know you're confident enough um you have to decide for yourself how bad do you want it you know if you if, i think it comes down to kind of like a fight or flight mentality too like if you put yourself you put your back to the wall like hey this is my plan a you know let's fail forward and make it happen um there is no plan b and you know you just you just gain confidence as you go um when i started off i like i said i had the confidence that i could figure it out but not the confidence in hey i know exactly what i'm doing i'll just i'm just like hey I'll figure it out as I go. I'm probably going to fail like a bunch. Uh, hopefully I don't get sued and uh, have to go to jail for it. I don't know <laughs> what I'm doing, but we'll figure it out, you know? So that, I think that's the biggest thing. Yeah. It's tough, man. Um, I think too, environment plays a very big role. Um, many of the people that I see get in this paralysis analysis, um, it's because they're just like at, at home by themselves all the time. They don't really have anyone supporting them. You know, they, one thing I've realized is that even with this podcast and YouTube and videos, it's like, it's a one way conversation. Like I'm telling you what to do, but there's no feedback back to me. So it's like, all right, I give you the tools. There's, there's, a, there's a bunch of other stuff I have not covered. You're going to encounter other problems that yeah. this video, this podcast does not answer. And then I think people get hung up on whatever that one problem is and it just kind of stops them because they don't have any feedback yeah for what they're doing no for sure 100 percent. and uh like i said that first ever like real estate deal once i took action i didn't know how to sign a contract yeah i didn't have a contract so whenever we went i brought it all you brought it all you brought it all but at the <laughs> same time I, I showed you i i remember at one point you know i was sitting there i was like okay this is how you negotiate like okay this is how you sign the contract i was like where do you put the initials <laughs> okay and then okay he doesn't want to sign never mind he you know he doesn't want to he didn't forward. want to do the deal you don't, yeah. don't want to he doesn't want to move forward today all right you know we'll try next time and you're like no 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 no. <laughs> we're, we're gonna do it today um because if not you know my offer is off the table and like for me that was like crazy i'm like oh dang like let's see how let's see how this works out <laughs> but the guy was like you know, he was bluffing that he had other investors coming and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, just learning that, you know, the reason I did it was because I took the action without knowing. And then I just figured it out as, you know, as I went because I was around the right people. Right. And I think uh, for one, right. Do you think that I learned that trick or that negotiation tactic my first time? Like, no, it's just from years of experience and so many negotiations where you realize you just get a feel. You're like, Bro, like we're going <laughs> to close this today or not? Like, what are we doing? Yeah. You know, so I use a lot of different sales strategies, but uh, to, to your point, you did take action in the fact that obviously you, you got the opportunity, right? You, yeah. you had the guy right in front of you. Um, but you also had the, I guess, the humbleness to say, hey, you know, I've never done this before. I need help. I'm not going to just try and close this on my own and probably not get it done. Like I'd yeah. rather just go get somebody else to do it and let them take the majority of the profit. That way I can learn. Yeah. Well, you, whenever we, I brought you the deal, you were like, how much money do you want to make on this? I was like, I don't care if I make money. Can you, can you show me how to do it? Cause yeah. I'll go do it again by myself. Yep. Um, I just don't know how. And you were like, all right, let's see the deal. You're like, and then at that point, you're like, Oh, you can make a lot of money on this one. I could probably cut you like a eight, eight, ten thousand dollars check. And I was like, <laughs> wow, you know, that's crazy to me, but yeah. that's just the cherry on top. Show me how to do it. Yeah. And then you know, you could, you can make all the money. I don't really care. Yeah. Well, and you know, and that's why I said it, to have that kind of humble attitude says a lot versus other people are like, oh, well you should uh, mentor me for free or you should, uh, you know, we should split it 50, 50. It's like, bro, yeah, you don't know anything. Yeah, no, <laughs> I think go I th cut your teeth, <laughs> go see if you can close it by yourself. If, if that's how you feel. Yeah, no, hundred <laughs> percent. And I, the thing is I knew I couldn't, I didn't know even where to start. So I was like, I can provide all, you know, because for me, originally, I was like, what kind of value can I provide for you? Can I work for you for free? You, know, right, you right. want me to clean, you know, clean your office for you? What, what, <laughs> what's it going to take? You're like, I don't really need any of that. But I was like, but he needs deals. Yep. So this is my value proposition. Like, hey, 
I have this deal. You can make money on it. But in return, can you just please show me how to yep. do it? Please help me. So I think that is what you need to be doing. And it doesn't have to be real estate, just any industry. If you're a young person, um, it's not really, you know, find where you could add the value and, uh, you know, you'll just get so much more value in return. Right. It's crazy. Yeah. And I think it just goes back to seeking out the right people. Right. So it's like if, if you can't pay for a coaching program or you can't pay for a course, whatever, you better go find somebody in your area who you can go find a deal for. Yes. Yeah. Like, you know, you may not know how to find a deal, but if you're resourceful, you can still find the person and say, hey, teach me how to find a deal. It, just show me how to do it. It's your deal. Like, yeah. I don't even want anything. Like, just show me how to find the deal. I will find it and give it to you. And, you know, I just want to learn. Yeah. Just, I think that's the word, just resourceful. Um, a lot of people just aren't resourceful. So if you, if you can't be resourceful enough to, you know, do the, do the little things to set yourself up to potentially, you know, start, um, it's just not going to yeah, you know, yeah, You're not going to make it. <laughs> you know, I don't. That's just the truth of it. I mean, yeah, at the end of the day, the not everybody, not everybody can do it. Um, everybody can do it, but not everybody will do it just because they don't have the grit. The resourcefulness to do it. and yep. the grit. That's for the, sure. That's the word for sure. It was funny. I, uh, <laughs> back when I didn't have as many followers, people would ask me, they'd be like, Hey, uh, I post about my book and they're like, where can I find the book? I'm like, are you freaking serious? <laughs> like, <laughs> dude, if you can't, if you have to ask me where to find my book, yeah. you ain't making it. Yeah, no, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. A lot of people just want, like there's literally Google and, and it will tell you right there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, a hundred percent. Um, it's just, that's, that's what it comes down to. Just being resourceful and be get, getting it done. You'll find a way to get it done if you want to get it done. I've seen so many different people start in real estate, you know, moms and uh, older people and really young people. But one thing for all of them in common, they were resourceful enough to find what they didn't know and just start. Yeah. And then other people, you know, you could be, does, doesn't really matter. And they just, they just never do it. Right. Well, and I think of myself as a resourceful person today because I'm always trying to do new things I've never done. So you have to, by definition, be resourceful if you're always venturing into these new territories and ideas. But when I look back at my real estate career when I was young, I'm like, man, was I like not resourceful or was I lazy? Because I got licensed when I was 21. I didn't flip my first house until I was, you know, 25. So there was this, you know, four and a, four to five year period where I just wasn't doing anything, even though like I had the idea of like, I want to flip a house. But in my mind, I was like, oh, well, I need a lot of money and I don't have that. So I guess I'll never flip. And that was it. Yeah. The door was shut. And then it just wasn't until years later when I realized by pure luck and just the grace of God that, hey, here's the answer to the money issue. There's, mm -hmm. there's a, something called hard money loans. And it's so dumb thinking about it today because, yeah. you know, anyone listening to this probably already knows what a hard money loan is, but I just wasn't resourceful and like looking for like, how do I flip a house? Yeah. Like, I think I could actually do this. How do I do X, Y, Z? Yeah. So, so I think, I th yeah, I think that's the word of the day for us being, just being resourceful and uh, find the things, you know, if it's important to you, you'll find a way. That's what yeah. it is. So at that time, you were like playing baseball and stuff. So yeah. I mean, it, it wasn't that it, important. It wasn't that important to you. That's it. But when you, when it, you know, when you had that fire under you where it's like, this is important to me, I need to find something to do, you know, besides you were catch flipping, right? Yeah. Yeah. Like now you, you found it, you know, because you were looking for it. You, I, I think also I, I got married. And so yeah. I was like, Hey, you know what? I probably <laughs> should like, make some money. <laughs> yeah. I need a career. My wife's in school and uh, she's not working. So this ain't going to work out too well if I don't, uh, Start making some money. <laughs> yeah, no. So it, it all worked out. It all works out when you're, you kind of seek out what, what you want. Yeah, dude. So how's it today? I, I'm always curious about this. Like, how's it today as a young dude making a lot of money? You know, like, not with, I guess you can in, talk about with girls, but with social media and, like, it being so out there. Some people are going to watch this now. How do you deal with, like, success at a young age? Uh, I don't even, like, I don't, I'm not, like, like a big splurger. I'm just... You know, just same, same me, I guess. Um, I don't really just focus on growing the business and uh, growing the business. I, I enjoy my free time. Um, it, it's nice now because for me, I used to, you know, not know how to like take a vacation or something like that. But now if I want to you know, go visit somebody across the country, um, you know, I can just buy a plane ticket and just go. So I, I guess that the freedom of that a little bit is nice, but not, not much has changed really for the most part. Do you ever battle with like ego? 
Um, ego. In what way? What way you say that? I, uh, just like man, like I guess uh, for me, anyways. When I was a baseball player, I battled with ego a lot. Like, man, like I'm the man. Blah blah blah. Like you come from an athletic background, like yeah. being the the jock and the big man on campus. You, know, you were the quarterback of your high school, weren't you? Like I was. Yeah. You never, you never had to deal with that. Um, I think, I think definitely, you, you know, you have to deal with that. Um, I think it comes, it's a balance between like, you know, I'm the man, I'm better than other people, and then I'm the man, I can do whatever you know I set my mind to. I think that's, that's the the ego like balance. I think you have to have a little bit of e- like not ego confidence. but confidence, you know, in order to to do whatever you want to do, especially being like a young man. Um, so for me. You know, I guess you could say at, at times maybe I wasn't the most humble, like high school and stuff like that. But you grow. I don't think you know. I don't think I'm better than anybody at all. I think I still think I'm the man. But you know, yeah, that, that's the thing. Yeah, for sure. No, it's it's good. And the reason I ask that is because from watching you all these years, never have I once like thought like, oh man, this guy, he is just all about himself. Like, cause there's a lot of guys, you know, that are like that. You're like, Oh my gosh, dude, get this guy away from me. Yeah. Um, but I've, I've never seen that with you. Despite any success you've had, you've remained the same and steady and, uh, always striving to learn more, to, you know, grow to, you know, like you don't know enough, you know, you're constantly putting yourself into new positions and situations where you can continue to grow. Uh, no, no, there's no, there's no reason to be, you know, have an ego or anything like that. It's just, you, you haven't even scratched the surface of what like I want to do in my life. So they're just improving constantly. And, you know, if the money has to come, you know, with it as well. You know, some, somebody's got to fund, <laughs> fund the business operations. Somebody's got to fund the lifestyle. So, um, you know, just, just comes with it. Yeah, no, for sure, dude. I, uh, I'm proud of you, man. Just everything that I've seen you do just the last three years from seeing you sneak in the bar to, you know, you know, thinking about it and wondering if real estate's for you to doing your first deal to, you know, it's been, it's been two years since we met. Actually, I was 19, right. Turning 20 and I just turned 22. So it's been two years and a month essentially since I learned what real estate was. So it's been, it's been great. Appreciate you, man. Don't you, <laughs> isn't it scary to think about like what it could be in five to 10 years? Uh, exciting. Yeah. I think more than anything. Cause for me, I kind of, um, just look at you, like yeah. the exponential curve is, is insane. So I'm just like, I feel like they're, I'm taking baby steps, baby steps, but I'm like, when I catch stride, I think, I think I could do something big for sure. Just we'll, well see, we'll see how big. Yeah. T- to put your five years in perspective, um, so I would have been 27 five years ago. And 27 was the first time I made over 100000 in a year. So to think about that, like, <laughs> you know, like I was just celebrating five years ago. Like, dude, I made over $100,000. This is yeah. crazy. And then to see it. There's no way five years ago I would have predicted I'm doing what I'm doing today. Yeah. It, it'd just be like, how? Like, yeah. what? You know, but... I think it's a, a testament to if you just keep doing the same things over and over again and you stay consistent, you keep your eyes open to opportunity. You don't become closed minded because you have success. You'll always be improving and, and just you, you can't even fathom what you can accomplish if you just keep the consistency and the openness to new opportunities and learning. Like, yeah, that's my biggest advice. No, hundred percent, hundred percent agree. Just that, like we were talking to her, when the pandemic started, you were like, you know, "I'm going to try this YouTube thing," and then that catapulted you into new opportunities. You know, so that's just, you know, I'm always op- looking for new, new stuff. You know, new opportunities. Like, what am I, what am I missing? You know, do I want to, you know, I was talking to Landon and Jesse, um, the luxury, you know, the luxury stuff. You know, you never know. You do one, and then that catapults you into a whole different kind of sphere of real estate. So just always looking for, for different stuff. I think that's, that's important for me moving forward too. Yeah, man, for sure. You know, we did those two deals together I was like, dude, I, I see a lot of potential in this guy. Um, I wanted to put you in my program. So, you know, pretty much as part of that deal, I put you in, in our all-star program. And, um, for those of you listening that that's a way to just get in it, get in the door. Like, you know, we charge a lot of money to be in our programs, but the fact that this guy had already brought me two deals 
And I felt like we were going to do some other deals together. If I could just, you know, teach them some different things, it's, it's a win-win. And so, you know, you go in the program and you're like one of the youngest guys there. And you know, what happens after that? Yeah, it was just, it was just, uh, you were just starting it up. I think, I think you started it, what, like November, December of, of that previous year. And then I started in December of 2019. Yeah. Yep. So, and then I joined in March of 2020. So yep. I've really just seen it grow like crazy, but I guess, you know, one of the original guys with Davila and all them and, uh, just been huge for me, just being around all those guys, you know, learning from you. Um, you know, I've learned a lot. Um, I think just, just getting around those people, um, getting around, you know, somebody like yourself, it's, it's huge for me, especially being a young guy. Uh, cause it's like, yeah, it's possible, you know, and it, I'm younger. I could do it earlier than these guys, uh, likely yep. as long as I'm doing the exact same things they're doing right now. That's always been my mindset. Yeah, for sure. So I remember too, you know, you're, you're coming off your, your first couple of deals and then, um, you know, you, you start to take it more serious. I'm like, Hey dude, you know, are you still going to college? Like what's your deal? And you're like, yeah, I'm still in school. I'm still like working this job. I'm like, when are you going to go all in? Yeah. You know? So when, when did you finally like get enough confidence to like pursue this full time? Well, last time, whenever we did the, the YouTube, I think it was exactly, maybe, maybe not exactly a year ago, maybe like nine or 10 months ago. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, I was still going to college and you were like, dude, what are you doing, man? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yeah, you know, it is what it is. I think, I think we did, you know, mid six figures of like just assignments last year. So I was like, I think I could, I could do a lot better if, uh, you know, if I, if I quit college and, uh, you're like, dude, you have to. So I ended up taking, um, my gap year. I mean, it's still going, I guess this whole this gap, <laughs> gap semester, year with that another gap ends. year. <laughs> and then, but, uh, yeah. Yeah. And then I decided to just go all in on it and, uh, it's been, it's been good this year so far. Yeah. You, uh, so as a 21 year old in your first full year, you did like 150 grand. I, yeah. I something. think we did like almost 160, but yeah, yeah just, assignments. just assignments. Yeah. And just then wholesaling. My, my thing I always tell the wholesalers who join the coaching program is like, yo, you got to learn to buy the houses. Like at the end of the day, I, I want to see everyone just build a true real estate investing business. Cause anytime I see wholesalers who just only do that, I'm like, dude, you're not even a real estate investor. You're just a marketer yeah. and you're never going to be able to fully capitalize on the marketing you do. And you're also never going to be able to build a portfolio because you've never realized how to make or um, raise money, how to fix yeah. up houses and do the things that you're going to have to do if you want to be a real real estate investor. Yeah. And that was, a, yeah, that was for sure the, the biggest thing for me, I, you know, kind of for, from the program, you were like, you've got to take everything deal by deal. You know, you can't wholesale everything because if you're making, you know, five grand on the assignment and that's all that, you know, somebody's willing to pay, but you can make. 25 to 30 grand flipping it with, you know, with some appreciation, you know, what are you doing? You know, you need to, you need to be closing on it. So I, d I took that into this year, big time. Um, just taking everything deal by deal, still wholesale. I mean, you're not going to buy every deal. Some deals just, you don't like yeah. it or, you know, whatever, but, um, the, the big, the big deals where I would, you know, take my 20 grand assignment, they turn into huge, huge flips this year. And that's, you know, been huge for, for the business. Yeah. And that's kind of, <laughs> it's funny. Cause I shoot my own self in the foot, uh, as the <laughs> Vegas guy who's like, Hey Vlad, wholesale me a deal. But I'm like over here telling Vlad don't wholesale because in the end, like I know what's best for, you know, our students and stuff. And the big thing I've been preaching ever since January is that, Hey, you need to start buying all your deals because, the market's going crazy. And if you sell, if you wholesale a deal, just know you are for sure a hundred percent leaving a lot of money on the table. hundred percent. Because and you're not getting the appreciation. And we've still done, done some wholesale deals this year. I think you guys yeah. just bought Odette for me. That was like an eight month escrow between the, <laughs> the tenant and all of the liens and all of that. But, um, you know, we, we still, still wholesale, still do deals. So. Yeah. And we wholesale too. Um, yeah. but it's just like, if you have the ability to buy them and, unless somebody's willing to pay just some crazy wholesale fee, then man, at this point in time, it's almost always going to be better to take it down. And you know, yeah, you're proof of that. I mean, like this year, you guys are, you're going to do over half a million this yeah. year, you know, second year doing this. How much do you think you'd do if you only wholesaled? Mm, probably less than half. Oh, well that probably, probably half, probably half of that for sure. I'm leaving like half the money on the table basically. Cause yeah. if you, um, just looking back, 
uh, we had one one deal we bought. I bought it at two twenty five, um, thinking that hey, it was worth probably you know anywhere from maybe three thirty to three forty if we push it. Yeah, sold it at three seventy five. So that's that's yeah. it. That's it right there. You know, Dude, and I ended up flipping that one. So um, <coughs> leaving, leaving crazy money on the table, especially this year. Yeah, we've had so many deals we bought that. You know, I'm like, all right, cool. This is going to make 20 grand, made 50. I'm like, this is crazy. Perfect. (laughs) Yeah, we'll take it. Yeah, and uh, what you realize, too, is once you start running a business and you have marketing expenses and you got overhead and employees, like, you got to really maximize deals to to make the ROI make sense on all the work you're doing and all the risk you're taking. So that's my big thing, man. If, If you're listening to this podcast and you're only a wholesaler, uh, I think you're probably very foolish. Yeah, stop leaving money on the table. That was a big thing for me because last year I took a bunch of wholesale fees where I made like five to ten grand. Yeah. Um, and then I look back and then you know the flippers made crazy amounts of money because you know the appreciation wasn't that crazy, but it it started to pick up towards the end of the year. So all of a sudden it's like, wow, I just left all that money on the table. So that's been a big kind of difference between last year's business for me and this year. Yeah, and <laughs> it's funny because. I'll get a lot of wholesalers, um, take for example, uh, John, Suka, man, all you guys got some weird last names, Suka Melly. Suka Melly, yeah. Yeah. And uh, he's another 20 something, like Yeah, I think he just turned 23. We have the same birthday. You and him? Yeah. Okay. So (laughs) you guys remind me of each other so much because he's out in um, Texas Mm -hmm. and, you know, was a wholesale only guy, but doing great. I mean, he's killing it. I remember when he was thinking about joining the program, I was like, bro, I could double your revenue tomorrow. I don't even need to see your business because based on what you're telling me with just you only wholesale. I was like, if we just do a couple of tweaks with, you know, adding the ability to take down the ones you want to take down, then you're going to make way more money. Yeah. And And he just sent me, um, I think he made like 96 grand on a deal. On one deal because he took it down. Because he took it down. Because he took it down. He was going to make like 10 on the wholesale. Yeah. And he was like, it's a thin wholesale. And I was like, how thin? <laughs> and, and he was like, yeah, I think it was like 10 to 20. Then he made 96. And I was like, yeah, well, all right, no brainer. <laughs> yeah. I'm no like, brainer. your fee's paid for. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> so my work is done. <laughs> uh, well, no, but him and I are also working on a deal together where uh, he got like the 16 home mm-hmm. portfolio. And uh, we're looking at partnering up on it. We're all funded. it. Yeah. And, he told uh, me about it. Yeah. And, uh, I know he's still working out all the details, but, um, it could be an extremely lucrative deal for both of us. And, you know, once again, the only reason it's going to be that way is because we can take it down. Yeah. <laughs> I think he said, like, if you wholesale them, you can't really even make that much, but the real, you know, the real money is going to be in, in taking them down, flipping them, selling them to hedge funds. Yep. All of that. Yep. So, you know, I, I think just that that's the thing is really getting people to push you to think differently because we all get stuck in our ways, especially when we're successful. We're like, oh, like what I'm doing works. Get comfortable. Yeah, I've done that many times. And then I'll meet somebody who's doing something crazy and I'm like, whoa. Yeah. I remember, you know, last year, I talk about this story a lot before I was ever on YouTube and stuff. I'm like, YouTube's so dumb. And then I saw what these guys were making. I was like, YouTube is not dumb. <laughs> and yeah. I just went all in on it. But, you know, then this year I was in uh, Puerto Rico back in February. And I remember, you know, I, I thought I was doing good. I'm like, dude, like I'm, I'm doing really good. Yeah. And these guys around me were like the best info marketers you've ever seen. Like the guy sitting next to me um, just sold his company for 300 million. And, uh, you know, had other guys, e-commerce guys who were doing big numbers, multiple millions a month. Met a guy who was like, yeah, you know, I, I make a million bucks a month. I'm like, what do you do? He's like, well, we send emails. I'm like, I bet. you send emails. Like, explain. And he's just like, you know, we send emails with offers and different things. And our email list is in the millions. And so every time we send an email out, we know that it's going to bring in, you know, 30 grand. I'm just like. Crazy. That's insane. Crazy. And these are things that probably anyone listening has never even heard of. I never heard of it. Yeah. And you see it for like, if, if somebody hears it, they might be like, nah, BS. Like I don't buy it. But me looking at them right there in the flesh, I'm like, okay, explain to me more. Tell me like what you're doing. 
and you just see it's legit and your, you, your mindset just shifts of like, yo, this is actually possible and not only possible, but not as hard as you may think it is, as long as you are talking to the person who's doing it. Yeah. Cause if I said, Oh, I want to go send emails and make a million bucks. I, I wouldn't even know where to begin. Yeah. And I think that's what kind of attracted me to, you know, just entrepreneurship and real estate and ge- just business in general is like, you can get inspired just by being around the right people. And then you realize, you know, the things they're doing are not so far fetched. You just need kind of the blueprint and to take the, the similar ac- action steps, put your own twist on it. And now all of a sudden, you know, you're kind of growing and trying new ideas and stuff like that. So that's the biggest thing why I kind of wanted to run my own business because I'm like, hey, I could pivot at any point and just do my own thing and, uh, you know, just uh, off the cuff, do do whatever. So I think just exposing yourself to other people has been huge for me, especially like at this age. Yeah, huge. no, for sure. I mean, dude, the fact that you're so young and you're already networking with so many other people that have already gone through what you're going through and you've got all these relationships, um, the sky's the limit, man. I told you that last YouTube, you know, you did the YouTube, uh, in 2020, you know, you had come off a great year for a 21 year old and you were like, I was like, what's your goal? (laughs) And what'd you say? Uh, I think I was like 200 grand. Yeah. Something like 50. I was like 250. What are you talking about? (laughs) And you're like, yeah, it's a pretty good goal. And you're, I was like, try again. I think you said 350 or something. (laughs) I'm like, no, try again. Try again. Like half a million minimum just based on what, where I know you're at today. And if you, you know, quit college, you devote yourself to this, like you're going to make way more than you ever thought. Yeah. With, with flip profits for this year, flip wholesale, stuff like that, stuff we have in escrow, hopefully it'll close, um, should close. Uh, I think we're right at, right at, you know, half, half a mil. So yeah, anything, you're going to any, get more deals too. Yeah. Anything extra is just going to be you know icing on the cake. So we'll, uh, I was, I was thinking pretty small, um, you know, last year and, uh, kind of, you know, anything, anything's possible once you, once you really, you know, believe it. I, I think that's the, that's the big thing. Yeah. Here was, you know, the flipping got added and that, you know, changed everything next year. The people, you know, people are going to be at it. So for me, that's the big thing, getting a team going. So, um, I think, you know, we'll go for, we'll go for 1.2 next year. 1.2, hundred grand a month. Yeah. All right. Good. I was, if it didn't have a one in front, we'll, we'll go for 1.2 the one's fine, but we'll go for 1.2. And okay. keep it at a hundred grand, hundred grand a month. Okay. So what's it going to look like? You're talking about the team, right? It, it's yeah. easy to throw a pie in the sky and be like, yo, I want to make a million bucks. Yeah. What are you going to do to get there? Yeah. So right now, you know, we're, our bread and butter is, is cold calling texting. So I'm ramping up that side of it. Um, we're doing kind of, you know, the, the VA route in terms of uh, lead manager. So that's, that's a big thing to do. Um, somebody to keep touching every lead. And then obviously I'm going to need, you know, people, people in house, um, hiring an assistant right now. So anybody in Vegas, um, we're looking for an assistant and we're looking for an acquisitions person as well. So, um, just building out that team. I'm getting an office right now. Um, I've been you know, doing, running the business from, from the house. So, uh, getting an office, um, really, you know, building out the operation from, from there. That's going to, that's what it's going to take to, to get there. I just can't do it by myself. No, no. I mean, you know, you only have so much you can do on your yeah. own. Um, you know, and I think for you to get over a million and not like die, <laughs> you definitely gonna need some help. It was funny. I was at um, an event and I met this guy who was doing like supposedly three to four million a year um, by himself. And I was like, "How? explain how this works. <laughs> He's like, you know, he, he was just like, yeah, I don't trust people, blah, blah, blah. They just don't do I'm like, so what about like do you write all your checks? Like the little money? Do you have like a bookkeeper? He's like, no, I handle the books too. I'm like, why? And he just had been burned from his own deal. And I'm like, dude, I don't know if you're really doing this, but if you are, you're just crazy. Yeah. (laughs) Insane. That that's crazy. That's crazy. Yeah. But I think for you to get to hundred K a month, um, an assistant for sure you know, another sales guy. So it's not just you closing. Yeah. That's the biggest thing. Um, and they're just, you know, the, the biggest thing is the follow-ups. Cause I mean, you guys know it. Yeah. You know, it's rare that you close something right off, you know, <laughs> right off unless it's PPC or something like that. But even that's rare. you need a couple of touches there. So, um, just somebody that's always kind of warming, warming up leads and, uh, kind of an inside sales agent. Um, yeah. we're trying to get a couple of those. 
And you said you're going to try and use VAs to do it. I'm going to try to get VAs to do it. Yeah, yeah. If it doesn't work, I mean, well, that's what a business is for. You just pivot, pivot and go. Try it out. Yeah, but you know, we, um, I've been talking about it with uh, the students a lot is uh, using VAs for lead managers. And, you know, Kristen, uh, one of our other students in the program, Kristen Stampini, she's a beast. She's got a huge VA company. And so her and I have been testing different ways to use VAs as leads managers. And, you know, we didn't get a deal from it um, for like the first month. We pivoted, trying a little kind of different things now. And um, I recently looked and we locked up two deals. And so, you know, those are two deals that were already in our system. We had already talked to these sellers yet. We just, you know, didn't follow up with them the way that, you know, sales guys like that. We're getting leads every day. So it's not like they got all this time to follow up. Yeah. So... Nor do good sale. Well, I don't want to say good salespeople, but most salespeople who are killers don't want to follow up. They're like, dude, give me these, yeah, these leads that are good. Like, I want to close those. I'm that way. I I could never follow up with any. If I don't close you today, we're pretty much done. <laughs> <laughs> that and that's why I'm just maybe that's why I'm a good closer. Like, you know, one and done because I know this is the only chance. It's life or death. Yeah. Yeah, and I think with with like lead managers, um, they don't have to be like killer guys like your sales guys. You know, they're not closing. They're, they're essentially just persistent. They're just persistent. They're just touching, you know, touching base, making sure that you're always in contact with these people. Um, it's just really just leveraging, leveraging people, leveraging more, um, more people to hit the phones because you know they don't need to do too much except hey, you know, are you are you interested in selling? Like you know what's going on? And uh, if they are, then they right. go to your good guys. Exactly. So, yeah, I think I think that's a good plan. Um, to me, there's no reason you shouldn't be able to get there uh, if you just continue on that path. Uh, but I'm glad to see that you're uh, starting to think bigger yeah. and, and yeah. realize what's I, truly possible. I need to go more more documenting on the on the YouTube route as well. That's been you know, I'm, I've done it, kind of stopped and then need to definitely step it up, uh, maybe hire some content guys and uh yeah, get that rolling because it's it's harder to manage it yourself. I was doing it, you know, essentially myself as well. So your videos it. were good too, man. Yeah, I enjoy them. It. I appreciate it. But you know, you weren't consistent. Yeah, that's the thing. <laughs> that, that's the thing. You need consistency, you know, in in everything. So um, that's one thing I haven't been too too great at. So yeah, we'll we'll change it. Yeah, YouTube's tough, man. I uh, <laughs> it's funny because for everybody, right? I tell everybody the same things. Like, I'm like, this is what I do. This is what I know works. Like everyone should do it. Yada, yada, yada. And so we got a lot of people, you know, making YouTube videos, creating content while also, you know, delegating, scaling their business and kind of taking the blueprint that, you know, I've used and doing it and doing it successfully. So I'm curious to see kind of in a couple of years, since I know social media is a long-term play, like how it all plays out with everybody's followings. Yeah. Cause there's a lot of people who I think have like yourself who have great potential that if they just see it through and stay consistent, uh, the results will be there. Yeah, no, for sure. A hundred percent. And I feel like, I feel like I love the way you create the content where it's like business focused. Like you, you're a business guy first and then you're just a content creator second. Yeah. Maybe content creator first at this point. At this point, dude, <laughs> I don't even know. You can't even call me a businessman. I'm just like, but video guy. But I mean, you, uh, you know, you did have the businesses first, and then the content just funnels in, and you know, essentially makes you the money uh, through the businesses. So mm -hmm. that's huge. And we've talked about how you know a lot of people just create content and they just do, you know, random videos, and they have a huge following, but they don't make any money from it. Yeah. You know, ultimately, you you know want to make want to make the money, and you want it to affect your business in a positive way. Yeah, for sure. I think there's, there's like two types of people. Um, most of the people that I talk to are already business focused. They might have a business, they're hustling, they're making money. And so for me, when I go to them, I'm saying, Hey, content can only amplify what you're doing. It's going to make you more money. Um, then there's the other side where there's, there's people who don't have businesses, but enjoy making content. And so then they have to figure out how do I actually make money from this? Yeah. We actually just had a guy join. Did you see him? Uh, Kingsley? Yeah. Yeah. So he's, he's young too. He's like 23. Yeah. And he built up a YouTube following of over 400,000 subs, but he had that same exact problem. Uh, we talked on the phone. He was like, yeah, I grew a big following, but I wasn't making any money. I was making like two grand a month for my following. I was like, yeah, dude. Yeah, make what kind of videos was he doing? Just kind of like reactions or what? Um, just kind of like 
I don't even know. It, it was just like kind of like lifestyle stuff. Okay. It wasn't real estate. Gotcha. But he's going to rebrand into like showcasing his real estate journey. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it's just, it's funny, man, because like you do have those people who are very good at creating captivating videos and building an audience, but they don't have any way to monetize it. And so I think everyone's just working on meshing the two together in the world going forward because that is the future yeah thankfully real estate is easy you know if somebody brings you one deal from a video they saw of you and know of you worth it 100 yeah. percent worth it that pays for you know any any type of content anything you pay out you know because real estate is you know lucrative on a deal by deal basis yeah yeah that's the beauty of creating financial content not mm. only from the business perspective but as you see with these youtubers they get paid way more in ad revenue sponsors it's funny. I get sponsors who reach out to me who are just like normal. They're not financial type sponsors. And so mm -hmm. they'll offer like a thousand bucks or something for whatever. And I'm like, no, what are you talking about? I'm not going to go do this. They're like, well, based on the amount of followers you have, like this is all. Yeah, I'm yeah, like, yeah. well, that's not uh, the same thing. Yeah. You know, my followers are, you know, way more educated yeah. than, the, than the average, you know, average guy and stuff like that. So yeah, that, that pays for sure. Yeah. But the, the financial sponsors get it. Yeah. They pay big bucks because they're like, look, I know you got educated followers. Somebody who watches you is probably pretty smart, probably got some money, uh, and they probably want our services. And our services make us a lot of money as a company, so we can pay you more. Yeah. You know. At the same time for them, they're, it'll pay for itself in their eyes, so they'll, they'll make it work. Yeah. No, for sure. So what do you see for yourself, like, long term, man? I mean, I know it's tough because you're still so young, but... <laughs> Do you have a plan yet? Um, just, uh, yeah, for, well, I'm looking to, you know, definitely close on more rentals this year for sure. I don't know kind of what I'm doing. I've been looking at some multifamily stuff over, you know, over in the Midwest area and stuff like that. Um, definitely want to start building more, more wealth. I don't want to go, you know, 10 years of flipping and wholesaling and then right. be like, oh, you know, I have it, don't have any assets to, um, you know, kind of keep. So, uh, just closing more more of that this year um so i don't know if uh we'll have to uh we'll we'll see what happens yeah. just kind just kind of learning learning and going uh building up the business like i said building up the content and then hopefully you know keeping some long-term assets i've been flipping houses since 2015. we've reached the point in my company where we're consistently doing over 100 a year and we've done a lot of good things to get to that point but we've made a ton of mistakes and what's funny is i have a coaching program and i teach many of my students how to flip houses and invest in real estate and many of those students have either made or almost made these same exact mistakes so the point is these did not just come out of nowhere they are things that i'm consistently seeing on a daily basis, both in my business and others. So make sure you stay with me till the end of this video because just avoiding one of these things can save you tens of thousands of dollars. So let's jump into the top five mistakes. Mistake number one is underestimating your timeline. I see a lot of people when they get into real estate investing be very optimistic. They'll be calculating their numbers and then they'll put a three month flip. And personally, we don't have many flips that are three months. Typically, the only way we have a three month flip is if we're selling it as is or it's a very, very light rehab. But the full renovation flips typically never sell in three months. Let's say you're planning for a two month rehab because you're doing a pretty big project. You'd have to assume that that doesn't go over at all, which would be rare. Typically rehabs go over timeline and over budget, not under. And then you'd have to get a really good offer the very first day. And that offer would have to have no issues and close in 30 days. If everything goes in the perfect world scenario, yes, you can close in three months. But as we know, things don't always work like that. A lot of times the rehab timeline will go over two, three weeks. And then the property sits on the market for a month or two months. And then a buyer back out of the deal and then you have to put it back on the market and sure enough this flip has now taken six to seven months for us on average our flips are taking about five months because those things always happen you may get the ones that go perfectly and then you may get the nightmares and then you may get the ones in between but for us it averages to about five months so make sure you're giving yourself a realistic timeline the second big mistake I see is very similar to this, and that is underestimating the rehab cost. So I'll see a lot of people look at a house and say, oh man, I could get this done for $20,000, when in reality, it's a $40,000 job. And maybe they just don't know how to run the numbers and they don't know what it truly will cost. Or maybe in their mind, they're thinking that they can do everything themselves and get it done for $20,000. Whatever the case may be, you should not run your numbers that way. Get a true rehab cost. 
and a true rehab cost is when you go out to hire someone else to do this job. Because you will never scale your flipping business if you are the one doing the work on your home. You personally can only work on one home at a time. You cannot do 10. So start estimating your rehab costs the right way. The third big mistake I see is also part of the rehab process, and that is actually overdoing the rehab. And I see a lot of flippers get into that mindset of, well, I wouldn't want this in my house, so I need to do this. It's like, no, flipping houses is a business. You have to make money to be profitable and to continue doing it later on. You're not building your dream home every time you flip a house. Some examples of over renovation that I see. Some flippers will take the popcorn ceiling out of every single house and we'll take it out of a bunch of houses as well. But if all the comps have popcorn ceiling and that's what the buyers expect, why am I gonna get rid of the popcorn ceiling? It may not add any value to the home, yet it costs me more money. So anytime you're renovating, you wanna make sure you're getting at least two to one for your renovation dollars. So what I mean by that is, if you spend $1 on renovation, it should yield $2 in profit. And if removing popcorn ceilings cost you $1,000, but it makes you no extra money or even $1,000 more, then you shouldn't do it. It would have to make you $2,000 for it to be worthwhile. I see the same thing with countertops, flooring, and other finishes. At the end of the day, you have to renovate based on the comps. I have a saying I tell my students, copy the comps. The comps have already proved what works. They've told you what the value is, what kind of renovation you need to do to hit that value. There's not really anything confusing about it. Just copy them. So don't over renovate. The fourth mistake I see a lot of flippers make is speculating on the ARV. For us, anytime we flip, we want to just use what's already sold. So if I see a comp at 300,000 and it's in very similar condition to what I'm going to make my home, then I am anticipating that I'm gonna sell this house for 300,000. And it works both ways. I don't wanna be too conservative. If I say it's 280 or 290, I'm gonna lose the deal because somebody's gonna pay more than me. But I don't wanna say, oh, it's probably gonna get 310 or 320. There's not many other houses on the market. Mine's gonna be better. You don't wanna speculate on other things you can't control. Like I said before, for us, I wanna copy the comps. If the comp is 300,000 and it's done at this level of rehab, that's exactly what I wanna do. I don't wanna overdo my rehab because if I do, then I'm trying to get that 310, 320, and the appraiser may not give me the value for it. So I would rather just try and copy what's already been done. And I don't wanna speculate and try and get an ARV that doesn't exist yet. The fifth mistake I see is people not factoring in money cost. So the money cost or whatever it costs you to get the loan for that property. Now, if you're buying it all cash, okay, you don't really have money cost. But many people starting out don't realize how expensive money can be. If you've got to pay a couple of points and you're paying a high interest hard money loan, that is gonna play a big role in your profit. I see a lot of new flippers saying, well, my purchase price is this, I'm gonna minus out my rehab costs, I'm gonna minus out my realtor commissions, I'm minusing out closing costs, and there's my profit. Like, no, you're still missing money costs, which is a huge part of the equation. You're also missing your holding costs like utilities, taxes, insurance. But the money costs are what will burn a lot of people. So before you make all these offers on all these flips, make sure you understand what your money cost is. And money cost is very similar to rehab cost. If you've got money and you're going all cash, that's great, but you're gonna run out of cash at some point. We all only have so much money. So start evaluating deals as if you did have money cost. It's just like the rehab. Yeah, maybe you can do the rehab yourself for this one, but you can't do that on all the other flips. In order to scale your business, you have to start hiring people out using other people's money and having these costs on every single deal. That's how we run our business. I'm not trying to cut cost on a particular section to make a deal work. I'm not saying I've never done that. I've done it plenty of times and that's why I'm telling you not to do it. Anytime I've ever tried to manipulate the numbers to make the deal work, I'm usually going down a rabbit hole into a bad deal. Sometimes I'll say, well, maybe the ARV could be this. Maybe we can get rehab down to this. Maybe we can get one of our lenders to do it for less. Anytime you start asking yourself those questions, that means the deal's probably not very good. Because if the deal was good, you wouldn't be asking yourself those questions. You'd be saying, wow, this is a great deal. Even despite all these costs, we're gonna make a lot of money. So that's a good bonus tip. When you start questioning your costs, trying to manipulate them to make them work, you probably don't have a good deal. All right, let's see what Clint's got going on with this flip. Hey, Ryan. <laughs> Dude, welcome to my dumpster. Bro, <laughs> what are you, were you hiding in the dumpster? What were you doing? I was just hanging out. Oh, dude. Well, it's good to see you, man. Good to see you too, man. It is a beautiful flip. Appreciate it. Just getting started. Yeah, man. Let's go check it out. Huh? And uh, I've told everyone that you're going to tell us your secret sauce about how you're doing so many deals your first year. All right, before we go into the flip, I told everyone in the introduction that you're potentially making over a million dollars this year. Like, where are you at right now? Right now, um, I'm at 22 deals for the year. You know, whether it's, you know, they're in different stages where buying, sold, 
uh, or an escrow to buy. And uh, right now, I'm probably at about $700,000 profit on the year um, with everything I have. Um, and I got about half the year left, so should easily hit that million dollar deal, especially um, because I started in December and my deal flow is just starting to explode now. Yeah, and this is your first full year flipping. First full year, started in December. Didn't even get my first house under contract till January. Didn't even buy my first house till February. So. That's insane. And for everyone watching this, we're filming this in July. So the fact that in just you know six months, you've already done what you've done, it's probably the fastest I've ever seen for a new person. So shout out to you, dude. Couldn't have done it without you, man. <laughs> <laughs> you hear that, guys? Make sure you join Future Flipper. All right, let's go check out the flip real quick and see what you got going on. All right. I like the wallpaper, man. Yep. Super in style. That Looks wall good. will be down next week. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. no, I would definitely eliminate that. Got to open it up. This is interesting. You know, we don't really see these floor to ceiling windows like this. Yeah. Is it pretty common out here? Georgia style, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Not like your typical Vegas house. No, and you guys <laughs> also got basements. This is three levels. Yep, three levels, about 2,700 square feet. Okay, cool. So you guys are obviously in the demo stage right now. Um, it just got started. What do you anticipate this budget is gonna be to rehab? Um, we're, we got a bid on this one from our contractor at 67,000. Okay. Um, I imagine we'll probably end up, you know, after everything right at 70. Yeah. So, and you said it's about 2,700 square feet. Correct. Okay. Yeah. So it puts you around 30 bucks a foot. Yep. Pretty standard. Okay. Yep. Cool. What about this? Are you going to keep this wall here too? No, this wall is going out. They just pulled off the cabinets earlier today. So this one, yeah. you know, they got to see what's behind it and all, but it's definitely going to come out. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. You could totally put like an island that's, here. That's the plan. We're going to put a big old island right here and, uh, you know, new countertops. Um, you know, a way to save money, we're going to just do the cabinet doors instead of actual the whole cabinets. Really? Yeah. So wow. that's one thing I've been doing a lot of my flips lately is just cabinet doors and saving a lot of costs if they're in good shape. Yeah. See, this is surprising to me that you're going to keep this because uh, in Vegas, we would never do that. Yeah. But at the same time, this is something that you guys should know as viewers is every market's different. So if this is what sells in your market and that's what the comps are doing, then copy the comps. That's my number one saying. Absolutely. All right, so this looks like the master. Master bedroom, you got the master bath there. Okay. And then uh, you've got another bedroom combining, which is so weird. Never, I, I, I've not bought a house that has that. So and this is a normal guest room. Normal guest room, yep. And it's just attached to the master. Correct, and we are gonna actually frame this up and drywall it, so it's not. Because so it's you, just super weird. Yeah, there's no point to have this. Yep. I mean, it could have been like a master retreat at one point. Yeah. I thought about trying to make it, you know, a big ginormous master closet, but at this price point, it's just not, it's not necessary. The bedroom will add more value that way. Yeah. How many bedrooms is it total? It'll be five because we're adding one in the bedroom. So four now, it'll be five when we get done. Okay. Yep. So is five bedrooms something people really want in this market? Um... I think you want at least, I mean, really you just need three. I mean, yeah. uh, at this price point, I would say five is a good number, yeah. Okay, so I would tell you guys, the viewers, that with something like this, it's gonna depend on your price point a lot. So if this was super high-end luxury, I would definitely say you need a big closet, Yeah, man. especially with the current closet, super small, but at this price point, it's just it's better to have the bedroom than right. the closet. Because if you think you're gonna get a big family in here, they would rather have another bedroom. Absolutely. And that's where this closet. Yeah, exactly. So this is where that other bedroom door opens. Yep. And then you've got the remaining two other ones up here. So correct. Yep. Four total upstairs, and then you're putting one in the basement. Correct. Yep. Okay, got it. So speaking of the numbers, you said it's going to be like a seven thousand dollar rehab. How much did you pay for this? Two hundred seventy thousand. Two seventy. Bought off the MLS. MLS, okay, so you're all in at 340, but what are you gonna sell it for? Should be 450, right? That's conservative. We might be able to push it a little bit higher, maybe 475, but conservatively wow. 450. Dude, good Guys, deal. Guys, there's MLS deals everywhere. I've been saying this before. I've walked other students' flips who've gotten major deals off the MLS, and it's not just Vegas or California or Dallas, Texas. I mean, this is happening right here in Atlanta as well. The stuff works anywhere. Absolutely, this is actually my first MLS deal, so. I'm excited to, you know, keep trying it. Yeah, how this works. All right, Clint, what are these? 
These are what you call trees. Yep. Probably don't get those too often in Vegas, but no, no. we've got them everywhere in Georgia. Yeah, we have shrubs and things like that, but I've never seen so much green in my life. <laughs> yep. No, it's nice. Yeah. So what made you want to get into real estate investing? Yeah, so honestly, I think, you know, everybody has a, a dream for their life to, to have more freedom with their family or with their money or whatever. And I was in a position where I was working nine to five, Monday to Saturday sometimes. And uh, just really wasn't happy, wasn't uh, my thing. I was in an office and though it could have been a very rewarding career and uh, it would have been awesome to you know get to that uh, point in the corporate ladder where I could have had good wealth. Um, I w wanted to be more creative, have more time you know with my family and not get not be stuck in traffic and telling you know people telling me what to do yeah uh, and so that kind of led me into the real estate journey and a lot of the guys that I was working with at the bank were real estate guys you know guys like yourself that just had built their wealth through real estate yeah and so whenever I would meet them or interact with them at the bank uh, it always uh, gave me a sense of curiosity to investigate what they were doing yeah. yeah, I know a lot of people who are watching right now can relate to that. Most people have a nine to five job. They would love to be their own boss yeah. and to have financial freedom. What was it for you that allowed you to finally jump out of that and go full time at this? Yeah, so I think, you know, what uh, inspired me to go into real estate full time was just really uh, taking action and uh, pursuing my dreams you know everybody talks a big game about wanting to do this or that and if you don't have any action behind it uh, you won't do it so for me it was just making sure that I did that I made that decision in the wisest way possible which is you know making sure I had a healthy savings making sure that I could support you know me leaving for uh, and not having income for a few months and then just taking action so you know a lot of guys will take a you know, just a reaction, you know, knee jerk reaction to just quit their job and yeah. go all in. But I wanted to be a little smarter. So I started saving to get ready to make that jump. And I'd say obviously the, uh, the network of people around me, supporting me, praying for me, uh, really helped me make that decision. I love it. And one thing I want to say is there are so many different paths that lead people to real estate investing. For you, you saw it firsthand as a financial guy. You know, you saved up some money responsibly and you just went all in. You yeah. took action, you made it happen. Um, and I see people that do the other path, like yeah. myself. I didn't have money and I couldn't yeah. save up. I'm like, hey, I got to just max out my credit cards yeah. and go after it. There's no other way for me out of this. And um, the beauty is if you've got the right people around you, you believe in yourself, you yeah. got faith, uh, you can make it in this business. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I think, you know, if uh, for me, it's been uh, countless people around me coaching me through the whole process that's made it so much easier, you know, and uh, it's, it's been a blessing for me, for my family. I don't have to go into an office and I get to control my time. So, yeah, you know, if you're on the fence of making this leap and going into real estate, you know, just just have to, yeah. you know, do the pros and cons and just take action. Yes, dude, you're crushing it in your very first year flipping houses. Like, tell everyone what your story was before all of this. Um, yeah, so I had uh, I had a, a business before that I ended up selling. Uh, had a non-compete where I couldn't get back into the business and uh, had to find a new career. And I sold my personal house that I made a nice profit on. And I was like, you know, maybe real estate could be it. So I uh, found, found this guy on, on TikTok. And, uh, and, you know, the rest is history. Joined his program and... Uh, you know, I, I can't vouch for other programs out there, but you know, his future flipper program is top notch. I've, I would not be in the position I am without it. There's no doubt. I appreciate that, dude. What would you tell somebody who's maybe working a job right now and they're just trying to get into real estate? Like, did you have fear? Was there anxiety, you know, leaving this career you had and, sure. you know, jumping into something you have no idea if it's going to work or not? Like, what happened? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I personally have an appetite for risk, and I think in this business you have to. Um, you know, uh, most people that make a lot of money, they're, they're risk takers. Um, so, you know, I, I had the mindset that, you know, I was going to make this work no matter what. And, uh, you know, with the help of him and his team, uh, it the transition was pretty easy. You know, those first few months, it was tough, but if you can get that first deal, you know, you can really, really get going after that, so. All right, so you're already crushing it. You have such an amazing start to your career. Like, what's the future hold for you? 
So uh, right now I'm really just trying to, you know, fine tune what I'm doing and scale up. Um, I want to get to where, you know, I'm doing over 100 houses a year. But at the same time, you know, your venture with apartment complexes has me interested as well. <laughs> yeah. You know, doing bigger deals, you can make bigger margins. So yeah. And I'm, you just I'm, hired your first employee. Two. Two now, employees now, now. Two employees in the past three weeks. So, okay. yeah, I'm really working on training and I'm training them and getting in a position where I can work on other things. Like, I want to get in social media as well, but really I'm just focused on this for right now. Yeah. Um, yeah, and also I'm, I'm doing a deal with Eric Hensley from the group, and that's the one of the biggest advantages to joining your all-star program is, you know, the network. So many people in the group have taught me so much, and uh, me and Eric Hensley are going to do a million-dollar lake house flip in the next next month or so. Dude, I love hearing that. Yeah. My favorite thing is the collaboration that happens. I mean, at this point, our network is so big between our all-star program, our rookie program, and just overall with what we're doing. So to see you here in Georgia doing a deal with Eric in Nashville, you know, and it's a lake house flip, like, that's super cool. Yep, super excited about it. And, you know, I, I really can't wait to see what this quarter three holds because, you know, I'm my deal flow is just exploding right now. Like, yeah. I'm getting, my phone's gone off three times since here with deals from realtors and wholesalers. So yeah, I'm you're, you're going to already get to over a million in the third quarter? I think so. Yeah, yeah. I should. Yeah, absolutely. Cool, yep. Now, let me start off by saying that contractors are pretty tough to find. And it's not because they're not out there. They are. But as investors, we're looking for the unicorn. And what I mean by the unicorns is we want them to be cheaply priced, but we want really high quality, and we want them to get it done really quick, and we want them to be able to handle a lot of jobs. That's what I mean by a unicorn. And unfortunately, Unicorns don't exist. I've yet to see a unicorn, but maybe they're out there. I don't know. Typically, you're gonna find a contractor who has a mix of those. Maybe their pricing is cheap, maybe their quality is good, but they can't do more than one job. They're just one guy doing it. Or maybe you get somebody that can handle a lot of jobs with really good quality, but they're more expensive. Or maybe you get somebody who's cheap and can handle a lot of volume, and they're pretty quick, but the quality's not there. You can mix and match all of these, but you're never gonna find the perfect contractor. So it's a matter of what you're willing to deal with as the investor. I just wanna advise you guys, do not think that you're gonna get all the things you're looking for in a contractor. The other part I wanna mention is that I prefer to hire GCs. And what I mean by GC is just somebody who can handle the full job. I don't wanna be the GC on the project. I don't wanna go hire the painter, hire the floor guy, get the kitchen guy in there, get every sub and trade in there on my own. It's just way too much headache. Would I save a little money? Yeah, but it's just way too much headache. You could probably handle it if you're doing one or two at a time, but when you've got 15 to 20 at a time like we do, that's a lot of houses to be trying to manage. So I'd rather just hire a GC who's got all their own subs, all their own crews, let them do it. I'd rather pay a little money here so I can go get more deals and make far more money than what I paid over here. Now, with all that being said, I wanna do one more thing before I get into the five different ways to find contractors. I want to give you guys three things that you should be doing when you find a contractor you're interested in working in. First thing is check their website. If they have this big fancy website with all these employees, they're probably going to be pretty expensive. I've yet to find somebody who has that who wasn't. Most flippers won't use that type of contractor. It's just not going to be profitable for them. So check the website. Second thing is get referrals from the contractor. Talk to other people that they've worked with and preferably talk to investors. Ask them if they've done work for other investors, and if they have, can you speak to them? Let the investor tell you about their experience. The third thing is walk a job site. Before you hire them, go check out one of their current job sites to see their quality. They should have multiple job sites if they're good, and check out different progresses. Check out one that's halfway through, check out one that's complete, see what you think. You can tell a lot about a contractor from checking out their work. So understand that I'm gonna give you the five ways to find contractors, but once you find the people you're interested in working in, you gotta do those three things I just talked about. Let's jump into the five ways. My number one favorite way right out the gate is referrals. I don't think you're gonna find a better way to get contractors than just talking to people in the industry that you know. Now, key word, I said in the industry. When your uncle tells you he knows a guy named Jim Bob that does whatever, he may not be the best guy. I'm not saying he's gonna be bad for sure, but I would much rather get a referral from somebody in the real estate business. This could be a realtor, it could be an investor, it could be a title company, it could be a loan officer. Somebody that's a professional in this business, if they recommend someone else, there's a good chance that they're a good contractor. When your uncle who's not in the business, who just knows his buddy, who fixes stuff up on the side, 
That's usually a recipe for disaster. And I know this because I've used them and I wanted to take the hammer and then freaking hit my head with it and it was always a nightmare. So look for referrals from people you respect in the real estate industry. That is the biggest key when it comes to referrals. And look at the person who's referring them. If it's a high level person who really cares about the reputation, they are not gonna refer somebody that is bad. It will look bad on them and they're not gonna risk their reputation for no reason. They have nothing to gain by referring this person. You're just asking them for help. So I'd really look at people that have a high level of character, a good reputation, and ask them for referrals. Second way to find contractors is through Google and website. So we talked earlier about a contractor having a website and if it's really nice and they got a lot of employees, they're probably gonna be expensive. When you're Googling for contractors, you can say Las Vegas contractors, Las Vegas general contractor, Las Vegas painter, Las Vegas flooring company. You wanna get results for everything. And I know I said earlier that I don't like to use subs. I'd rather just hire a GC, but those subs may have a GC. Those guys work for other people. So most likely they have GCs they work with and they're willing to recommend them because they're gonna get the work from that GC. So I'll call subcontractors and I'll say, hey, who's the GC who gives you a lot of work? I wanna use them and in turn use you. I've gotten a lot of contractors that way. And you do that by just Googling your city with all these different trades. Call them up, ask them if they've ever worked with investors. If they have, you're off to a good start. If they only work with retail people, that's totally fine. They're just not the person for you. They're gonna charge you too much and there are plenty of people who are looking to work with investors. Here's the thing you gotta realize. With contractors, they're gonna charge retail people more because it's just a one-time event and retail people are usually more picky. It's more headache for the contractor. There's more changes because retail people change their mind. Whereas with investors, we're not as picky and they know they're gonna get volume and they know we're not gonna hire them if they charge crazy prices. So they're willing to make that trade-off of consistent volume for lower prices. Third way to find contractors is through dumpster driving. And this is an easy technique. All you do is simply drive around neighborhoods which you know people are flipping in. For us, that would be older neighborhoods because those typically need more rehab than the newer neighborhoods. And you just see more flipping activity in those neighborhoods. We would go through those neighborhoods, look for dumpsters, and see if people are working on them. Typically, when there's a dumpster outside, there's work being done. So you simply stop at the house, go knock on the door, see if the contractor is working, get their info, and right there, you can see their quality of work because they're working on it. So dumpster driving is a really cool technique. Time out, guys, I got a quick announcement. But before we get into the next thing, let me tell you something really quick. If you're looking to get started in real estate investing, I've got a lot of great content on this channel that is going to help you out. But if you really wanna get started and really take it to the next level as fast as possible, I wanna highly encourage you guys to go to futureflipper.com. You can find it in the description below, but we have a ton of different resources no matter what your experience level is, no matter what your budget is, we can help you out. You can get my book for free, you can get my contracts for free, you can get my online course, and you can even be directly coached by me. And if you're not sure what's best for you, you can actually apply and my membership director will get in touch with you and go over the different options that are best for you. So if you're interested in that, all you gotta do is go to futureflipper.com. Now back to the video. The fourth way of finding contractors is something I heard on Bigger Pockets when I first started real estate investing and that is to go to Home Depot. What you're gonna wanna do when you go to Home Depot is go really early in the morning and stand by the pro desk. This accomplishes two things. You're seeing guys who are committed because they're going early in the morning, and you're also standing by the pro desk seeing all these contractors buy materials and go in and out. From there, you're simply going to give them your card, get their card, ask them what they do, see if they work with investors, and you're gonna get a ton of leads. All of these contractors are going to Home Depot. If you stay late, you see the contractors who didn't wake up early in the morning, they're going to get their first materials at 10 or 11, that's not good. The good contractors will go early in the morning so they don't have to go back, get their work done so they can finish early. I'm sure there are exceptions, but they're the exception. And that brings us to the fifth way, and I'm gonna just generally categorize this as groups. A group could be a Facebook group, it could be a group you meet with on meetup.com, it could be a forum like Bigger Pockets. There's a lot of different group settings. And if you join all those groups, you're likely to find contractors. And the groups I suggest on joining are real estate investing groups. 
If you're on Bigger Pockets, that's geared towards real estate investing. If you're on House Flipping Las Vegas group on Facebook, or if you search wholesaling real estate on Facebook, you're gonna get a bunch of different groups and then post in there, hey, I'm looking for a contractor in Las Vegas. Who's got recommendations? You might get referrals from other investors, but you also might get contractors who comment on your post. It's the same thing on meetup.com. If you go to these meetups, you can network with all the people ask them for referrals, but there's also likely to be contractors who are a part of that group because the smart contractors know, hey, I wanna be near all the real estate investors. If I'm near all the real estate investors, I can get more work. And those contractors already know what the investing game's all about. They know it's about high volume and lower margin. I have found some great contractors hosting meetup events. And that's another quick tip as well. When you're the event host, you get first dibs at everything. When I would host my events before the pandemic, I always got first crack at wholesale deals, contractors, just anybody that wanted to do business because I'm the host, so I have credibility. So you guys can start your own groups and be the host and do the same thing. If you don't wanna go that way, just go join someone else's group and then try your best to go network and find more people to work with. But that's it for my top five. As I said in the beginning, those are just simply ways to prospect and find more candidates. Once you find those candidates, you gotta do the three things I talked about earlier. Look up their website, ask them for client referrals who have used them, and then go walk some projects with them to go see their quality of work. Once you've done that, you verify that everything looks good, then you should try them out and give them a shot. Don't expect to find any unicorns like we talked about earlier. No contractor is perfect, but as long as you can find what it is you're looking for and what's acceptable to you as the investor, that's all that matters. So how long was it before you got that first deal? Uh, I think, I think it was a few months before, before you know, before I got that first deal, like as, as a lead. But when, when it was a deal, I, I knew it was a deal right away. I kind of already did all the numbers on it and stuff like that. So I was like, this is a deal. Now I need, you know, help closing it for sure. And uh, I know the right guy to, <laughs> to to reach out to that's been, you know, telling me to take action. So, um, you know, let's reach out to him. Yeah. Now I remember you, you reached out to us. You're like, you know, I think I got a deal. What should I do? You know, yada, yada, yada. You and I ended up closing it together. Um, made money. I don't, think we, I, think, I don't think we made much money at all. <laughs> but, oh, you know what? I'm totally confusing our first deal. Our first deal was we, our first deal. Yeah. yeah. Dude, I, I totally forgot. <laughs> okay, hold on. So I was thinking of this other deal we did that was like, was that your second deal? That was my second deal. That was when I, I went out and did everything A to Z and just sold it to you. But the first one, yeah, yeah, that I, was crazy, I forgot right? about that. So, <laughs> all right, let me tell this story. So <laughs> I don't know how I forgot about this. So you, you came to me, you're like, Hey, I got this guy. I know he's interested in selling yada, yada, yada. And I was like, all right, I'll go help you close it. So, you know, I haven't closed like deals in person in quite a while, but I was like, I, I want to go help you close your first deal. So we got to meet this guy. And what was the nickname he had for himself? Crazy Ray. It was all over his walls. It was everywhere. Crazy Ray, dude. This guy was like 70, 80 years old talking about how he was still getting it on with all these different girls and like, dude, he was a nut and his house was just, it was like clean. He had bought a flip. He bought a flip, but just trashed it. He trashed just... it himself. And then like one room he painted all black with like glow highlighters and nasty couches that we don't know what happened on in there. Yeah. It was, well, it was crazy. <laughs> remember when we showed up to his house, he wasn't there. We knocking on the door. He's not there. He, <laughs> yeah. We walk in the backyard because, uh, somebody or something was like, Hey, if I, if I don't answer, go to the backyard, he put, he put a note on the door. It was like, I'm in the backyard swimming. Don't even knock. Just go to the back. Yeah. So we went in the back <laughs> and this guy's like naked, just swimming. And I was like, what is going on? And here? then he got scared too. He's like, Oh, y'all, you guys snuck up on me. Why'd you guys do that? I was like, you left the <laughs> Your note on the door said, for us. Go in the back. <laughs> like, what are you talking about? All good. Yeah. So he was in, was he in foreclosure? Like what was his um, deal? I think he, everything for yeah. foreclosure. He just did a bankruptcy. He just got he out did. of jail. Dude, so he, this was easily <laughs> one of the most complicated deals I've ever done in my life. Cause it was he my had, first deal. That was, what are the odds of that? Yeah. He had so much going on, but you know, long story short, we didn't know that going into it. We, we went to the appointment, walked through it. And then, um, we closed it right then and there. We, I got him to sign a contract. We have it on, uh, if, if you're watching on the podcast for YouTube, we'll uh, show some B-roll of that. You'll yeah, have to yeah. send me the uh, the IG stories when we were doing that. But uh, we, we get him to sign the contract, and it was looking like a good deal. We're like, hey, we're going to make some good money on this. You know, we got it at a good price. And then when we go to title, you know, he has, like, 
all this crap going on. Yeah. Bankruptcies, extra liens, all these things. Um, and dude, it was just a nightmare working with him and just his attorneys and everything that was going on with it. Yeah. I remember, I remember Nick was like, uh, Nick Devitt, he was asking me, he was like, so, so what are you going to do? You know, with all this money, you're, you know, you're 19. Once you close this deal, what are you buying a car? By the time I got that final check yeah. between the two of us, what we made, I don't think we, either of us was buying anything. But no, <laughs> we, we went from thinking we were each going to, I think I was like, Vlad, you know, I'm going to cut you like 10 or 15 grand on yeah, this. I think and I was going to make like 10 grand at first. Yeah. And I was like, I'll probably make 20 or 30 on it, whatever. And then by the time it was said and done, the most work we've ever had to do into a deal. We had to work with his attorneys and then he wanted to back out like 12 times. And I, I kept, I was like, dude, you know what, Ray? I'm done. Like, I don't even want to do the deal with you. Like you're just, this is way more headache than it's worth. And yeah. then he'd call back, dude, I'm sorry. Like, come on, I need to sell the house. I, I'm re I really need it. And then he didn't move when we wholesaled it to somebody else. They came yeah. and he was still living there in, in his little RV at yeah, the property. So, Dude, just total nightmare. And I think <laughs> at the end, it was like a $7,000 total profit yeah. at the end of the day. And it was just like, dude. Far different from 30 to 40 that we yeah, thought it was. Yeah, we, it wasn't what we thought. So I forgot that was your first deal. Yeah, but that, that was, was a good one to day. get your cut, cut your teeth. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So then it took me another... <laughs> That was, that one actually was like a month after I meet up. So I did take the the action right away, but I didn't make, you know, it was proof of concept, but I didn't make much money on that one. And then I was taking the action to do my next well, deal. Hey, actually too, tell the story about how you even got that deal. Remember you were like just randomly door knocking. Oh yeah. Yeah. I was, I was randomly door. So I went to the meetup and, uh, they're like, you just got to take action. And, uh, I was like, all right, let's take action then. So I was door knocking, I would door knock. You know, uh, oh, I took a, the tax delinquent list right from the county. Right. So I would door knock all of those houses. And uh, actually, at one point, I never told you this, but uh, I came to a house and uh, I knock on the door and the lady opens it. And she was like, oh, I just walked away from the door. And I was like, what do you mean? And she had a contract in her hand. And she was like, I just signed. You know, another investor just left right now. Wow. And I looked down the street and the, there was a car driving away. So I was like, wow. I was like, that I'm close. That This close I to, was to doing it. I was yeah, I was an hour away and I was like, yeah. can, can you show me like the price? And she was like, I signed for 125 and I was going to give her 135. That was my you know, yeah. number. So I was like, wow, like I, that was a deal that I just missed out on. So I was like, all right, now there's, now there's proof of concept. So I know I would, door knocking works. Yeah. So I would be door knocking, you know, all the tax delinquents. And then crazy Ray was actually just a neighbor to a tax delinquent property. They were like, we don't want to sell, but Hey, you're doing the right thing. I'm actually an investor myself. That was, that was the guy. Uh, he's like, I'm a landlord, own a couple properties in, in this neighborhood. Definitely, you know, a good place to come door knocking, you know. And the next house I knocked was was his house. Because so you just saw his house had a lot going on. Yeah. Just, he wasn't on a list. No. You just door knocked him. Yeah, I just door knocked him. He he just got, and, you know, I knocked on the door. It was crazy, but he's, he, you know, I essentially knocked on the door and he was like, hey, you know, what do you want? I was like, you know, are you looking to potentially sell your house? And he was like, Okay, I am. You know, get me out of here. Please help yeah. me. He's like, you want to come inside? I, he's like, I just got out of jail, blah, blah, blah. And I was <laughs> like, let's do it, man. Show, show me around. Let's do it. Let's see, what, let's see what this house is about. But he, you know, he, I don't know. I guess you, you could say he was nice. Just crazy. He was nice. <laughs> but like I said, yeah. He just was, something he, wrong with his head. Yeah, I mean, good. like the next day he'd be just out of it. Yeah. You know, he's on drugs and other mm -hmm. things too. So either way, we got that deal closed. Then um, you ended up doing a deal on your own yeah. after that. Yeah. Uh, we, yeah, we ended up, uh, it was like a little triplex downtown. Um, I worked with that lady forever, but um, ended up wholesaling that one. That was when I made that real money for the first time. And I was yeah. like, you made like what, 20 grand? 20 grand, 20 yeah. grand on the assignment, which for me at the time was like, well, I mean, it's still, it's still really good money, but yeah, it's like, wow, you know, that's, cr that's crazy. I, I, I think I made 20 like, years old. Yeah. I think yeah. I made like 30 grand that whole year working my part-time job and I would be working like Hard. So we're here in Las Vegas at one of our newest luxury house flips on the golf course. I'm gonna show you around the house. We're gonna talk numbers. All right, so I'm loving how this house turned out. It's about to hit the market. You could see it's already staged and we just got some touch up things to do as evidenced by all of these little blue tapes that you see right here. And I wanna call out some of these blue tapes as we walk through because I think it's super important for some of you who are flipping houses to know what little things you need to fix because they can make the difference on whether your house sells or not, how they perceive the quality of work. And these are things that are gonna happen no matter how good your contractors are. They always miss some of these little things. So I'll be calling some of those out. 
But, you know, as far as everything goes, um, to give you some context of this home, it is a little over 3,000 square feet in Summerlin, Las Vegas, which is a, a very prime community on the west side. And it's right here on the golf course called TPC Las Vegas, which is, you know, a very nice golf course as evidenced by TPC. So I think that it should sell pretty quickly because there are very few renovated homes over here. Now, we've had this house for about nine months and the renovation took a little longer than we wanted, mainly because we bought a bunch of luxury flips all at once. I think we bought around 10 of them in the span of two to three months. And luxury flipping wasn't something that we've done over the years. In fact, my bread and butter has always been entry level homes. I always like to just turn and burn them. Same exact scheme in every single home. Let me go buy 10 of these a month and then just do the exact same thing on all of them. And that served us really well, but I've realized as this market has gone crazy, that luxury was the one that has gone absolutely bonkers. And since buying all those homes, we've already sold some for some insane profits where we've made far more than we thought, mainly because the market keeps appreciating. But even in the luxury market, now that we've kind of gotten our feet wet and we've done it on quite a few homes, we're now starting to streamline the process of luxury flipping. As you can see here, this fireplace looks very similar to the fireplace that we recently showed on one of my other luxury flips that we're listing at 1.8 million. It's done in a little bit different way, but the tile looks very similar because we know it looks good. You know, on top of that, the flooring is pretty similar. And, you know, I think it's something that these luxury buyers are looking for. This tile also kind of reminds me of the tile in my own house that we have on my fireplace, which I did probably three and a half years ago. So it's kind of interesting to see. But along with that, let's talk about these blue tapes that we've got here. So right now it says dirty tile, which, you know, you would think they would clean it, but it's things like this that you have to call out because if we don't call it out right here, then it doesn't get cleaned. Somebody has got to know that, yeah, we don't like how that tile looks right now. And pretty much all these other tapes are just showing that we need to clean this thing, man. So understand that right here, he has dirty grout, so we need to clean the grout up. You know, the fireplace looks great, but little touches like that, just getting it more clean, are things that, in luxury anyway, you definitely need to fix, because the last thing you want a really high-end buyer to be worried about is the quality of construction, right? They may not care about it as much on an entry-level home, but they're definitely looking about it when uh, they're spending millions of dollars. So, going into the kitchen, I really love how this kitchen turned out. You can see that we did a two-tone design. We got the white shakers. We've got the espresso at the bottom. We do different things on luxury, like this waterfall right here on the island. You know, it costs a good bit more to do that, but when you're doing luxury, it's something that buyers expect. So, you know, I'm just looking at this right now. Screw holes under the cabinets. So you can see that they've got these different holes that, you know, it looks like they may have just messed up and they're just sitting there. So they're gonna have to fill those holes in and make it flush so that you know you can't see it. Now granted, I personally would have never even noticed those holes were there. I can't see it just looking at the cabinets, but if I look lower, yeah, I can see it. And it wouldn't bother me as a buyer, but for some others, it will bother them. And in inspection reports, it might be something they call out. So um, I like that we're calling those things out. You know, over here, you can see dirty fridge inside. One of the things right now too in luxury, especially with these built-in fridges, is it's so hard to get these fridges in stock, especially one that fits perfectly to what you want. So my guess is this fridge might be refurbished. Um, that sure is what it seems like. And it's not that we wanna put a refurbished fridge in here, it's just literally we don't have a choice. Like there's no supply of certain appliances. So that's interesting. Dirty hood insert, so. We gotta fix that, the grout. We gotta silicone these wet areas. So a lot of times, you know, they, they do these countertops and they always silicone it to kind of like seal it off so that water doesn't go in the cracks. Well, you know, noticing when things aren't done that way is something you've gotta do. And so I'm actually really happy to see my project manager doing these types of things because they do make a big difference. Now. Let's talk about the backyard. I've done a previous YouTube video at this house when it was in mid construction. Um, that was probably about a month and a half ago. And I talked about how 
On these golf course lots, you know, most of them are very small lots. And one of my biggest pet peeves when you have a small lot like this in a luxury house is like when the whole lot is all pool. I think the pools are poorly designed when they do it that way. So I was really happy to see how they designed this pool because it looks so much better just being all over here. You know, you've got this square pool. It's actually a pretty good size. I like the sun deck being right here. And then I think the jacuzzi is in a perfect place where, you know, if it's the winter or something like that, it's immediately right here with the slider. So you can just go jump in the jacuzzi, not worry about the pool. Um, I just think the way they did it was great. But the bigger reason is they were still able to maintain this space over here. So we added this turf, made it look really nice. And now you don't feel like your whole backyard is just a pool. You can go put some chairs on this. You can do whatever you want. I think the way they set this up was really smart and I'm really happy that uh, you know it turned out the way it did because I like it and you know you can just see the beautiful golf course right here in fact they're shutting down the course for like three months for the first time ever at TPC Las Vegas to renovate it and you know do a whole bunch of changes so you can already see they've already taken out that used to be a, a green right there with the flag and everything else so it's cool to see that they're gonna be doing all new stuff. Now, another thing we've been doing on these luxury flips is we pretty much stage all of them. Um, I think staging definitely helps. It's not something we do on our normal flips. In fact, I've never been a fan of staging. You know, in today's market, you don't need to do a toll ton to go sell a house. There's just nothing available. So on the entry level homes, we definitely don't stage. And people have always asked me that over the years. They're like, Ryan, what do you think about staging? They do it on all the TV shows. And I'm like, dude, you're literally wasting your money, <laughs> especially on those entry level homes. But on a luxury house like this one, where we're gonna try and sell this for one and a half million dollars, it definitely makes sense to stage it because if this helps me sell it a month or two months quicker because it's staged or it helps me get a higher price because people can envision what this will become, it far outweighs what it costs me to stage this home. And just so you know, the way staging works is that it costs you a high upfront fee for month one because they got to do all this work to get the furniture in. And then every month thereafter is cheaper because the hard work's already done with putting it in. So I don't have the exact bill on this, but I would guess this house cost us around $3,000 in month one to stage. And then it's probably around like 15 to 1800 bucks every month thereafter. So quick tip for you guys on how staging works and you know whether or not you should stage a flip um, you know, depending on where you're at. Give you another example of staging since we're here. You know, obviously we did not stage this room. There's not really a point to stage guest bedrooms. People understand like a guest bed goes here. <laughs> we could spend the money to do it, but it's just not really gonna give us a return. So we don't, we just keep it the way it is and it's all good. Now, another thing to look at, you know, speaking of blue tape is you can see there's overspray right here. I don't know if the camera's picking it up, but I can feel the roughness and everything else. So they need to definitely um, redo that because that's not the quality we want, especially in a luxury flip. But anyways, you can see we've got another guest bedroom in here. Pretty simple, nothing crazy going on. You've got the laundry room over there. And then you've got this Jack and Jill bathroom that both bedrooms get to share. Here's another money saving tip that like this isn't tile that we picked. We kept this tile, we just refinished it and reglazed it and it looks really good. You know, kind of the same concept of staging where you don't wanna spend all this money in the guest bedrooms if you have a budget. Um, the guest bathrooms are the same. Like if you've got a nice basic guest bathroom like this, it's fine. Like you don't need to go super crazy unless you're selling like you know, multi-million dollar, three, four million dollar homes. Like for one and a half million dollar home, at least here in Vegas, that's totally fine. All right, now before we go check out the master, I said I was gonna be giving a free ticket to my upcoming mastermind. For those of you who don't know, I hold masterminds here in Vegas every single quarter. This one happens to be on June 29th to July 1st. It's gonna be a lot of fun. 250 real estate investors from all over the country many of which were doing seven figures, they're doing Airbnbs, they're getting a lot of rentals. We got a ton of great guest speakers as well as myself. So I would love to meet you at that mastermind and shake your hand. Now, in order to get a free ticket there, I'm gonna ask one trivia question that if you've been following me for a long time, you probably have seen this video 
and you can answer it. And whoever answers it first in the comments is going to get the free ticket valued at $3,000. So here is the question. In my very first house flip, I was having some problems with kids at the house. Comment below what the kids were doing and how I solved the problem. So whoever is first to answer that question is gonna get the free ticket. So comment below right now and I'm gonna pin your comment if you win. Now we're going into the master bedroom and I really like the master in here because, you know, not only does it have a bigger room, but we've got this really nice fireplace we've put in. You've got the ship lap, the electric fireplace. You also get this view out into the golf course, which is really nice. There's a ton of light and, um, you know, it looks really good. And as we talked about with staging, we may not stage the guest bedrooms, but we definitely stage the master because it's very important. And I think probably my favorite part of this house is this bathroom that we created for the master. I really like the color scheme they did. It all ties in together really well. You can see we've got the black cabinets, the gold accents. They kind of match the black and gold up here with these lights. And I like this tile all on the back wall just kind of going all the way across into the shower and then having a different tile on this side to kind of break it up. I think it just gives it this really cool feel where, you know, the shower feels all light and bright and then you've got this to contrast it. And along with that, you know, you've got this tub that's freestanding. It just looks really good overall. Love this bathroom. So let's talk about the numbers on this home. I purchased this house for $985,000 about nine months ago. Um, it was actually from another house flipper who had just flipped a house not too far across the street. Um, he had been following me on social media and said, Ryan, I saw you're flipping luxury. Do you want to buy this one? And that's actually one of the biggest ways I've gotten a ton of these luxury deals is by making videos just like this. In fact, the house I bought that I'm going to live in that I've done YouTube videos on was done that same way. He saw one of my YouTubes and he sent me that house as a deal. This guy saw one of my YouTubes and sent me this house as a deal. So let that be a reminder for anybody who's in real estate investing is to constantly tell people you are buying deals and what you're buying because it's gonna lead to more deals for you. So start talking about it, don't be secretive. There's nothing noble in being secret about what you're doing. Like let the world know because it's gonna help you get more business. Now, he sent me this, I bought it for 985. He made quite a bit of money on it. I think he bought it for like 700,000 or something. So um, he didn't really need to fix it up. He was gonna make his big money just by flipping it to me directly, which was fine. Now after buying it, we ended up putting about $180,000 into this home. I would say 70,000 of it was spent building that pool and the backyard and all that stuff. And then the other 110,000 was on all of the renovations you see here, which means we spent about 35 to $40 a square foot on this renovation, which is pretty standard for what we're trying to achieve with our luxury flips. Um, our entry level flips, we try to stay around 25 to $30 a square foot. So between purchase price and renovation, we're into this house at $1,165,000. Now our holding costs in this house are about $12,000 a month. If you wanna use easy numbers, it's been about $100,000 worth of expenses. We're also gonna pay around $50,000 in realtor fees, and we'll have about $25,000 in closing costs. So when you add all of those things up, we're all into this house for about $1.34 million. Estimating your rehab cost on a house flip can be difficult. On top of that, when you're making a lot of offers, you don't have time to go walk every single house, let alone get a bid from a contractor. So in order to be successful, you've got to get good at estimating these repair costs based on pictures. And the way we do this is through what's called the price per square foot method. Now I'm gonna explain how exactly this method works and the numbers we use to estimate our repairs, but let me give you a few caveats. The first is that your numbers might be a little bit different based on the market you're in, the price point at which you're flipping, whether or not you're using licensed contractors, whether or not you're getting permits, and the age of a home. Older homes are gonna be much more costly to repair than newer homes. Licensed contractors are gonna be a lot more costly than unlicensed contractors. If you have to get permits, that's always is gonna be more expensive. And if you're in LA or New York, it's gonna be more expensive than the Midwest probably. So what I'm about to give you are the numbers I see in Las Vegas for entry level home. Understand that in Las Vegas, we have newer homes. So we're not having to go replace everything in the house. We don't have to tear out the plumbing and all these things you would see in an older home. We're just doing what I would call cosmetic.
cosmetic renovations. So with that being said, here are the estimates that we use today in the current market. The first level of renovation would be what I call a cleanup rehab. To do this, you would spend anywhere from five to $10 a square foot. So for a 2000 square foot house, we're gonna spend anywhere from 10,000 to $20,000 to do a good job cleaning this house up. So what does cleaning up a house look like? Obviously this varies. You could go fix up a house right now for a couple thousand dollars if all you have to do is trash it out and get a cleaning. But for me, a cleanup rehab would be something along the lines of paint, carpet, we're doing a trash out, we're doing some fix ups on some doors, maybe some handles, some faucets, just very light things. This type of renovation would probably happen when you get a tenant who just moves out of a house and now you've got to replace all of these things. So it's really just the cleanup items to get this thing either sell ready or rent ready. The next level up from there would be what I call the lipstick rehab. For these, we're gonna spend about $15 a square foot. So once again, using the 2000 square foot example, we're gonna spend about $30,000 to renovate this home. Now a lipstick rehab is gonna be a really nice rehab. With this, we are gonna replace all of the flooring. We're probably gonna put carpet in the bedrooms and we're gonna put a nice cheaper budget floor in the main areas. For the last few years, we've been using LVT in all the main areas. LVT stands for luxury vinyl tile, and it looks super good, it's super durable, you can use it in wet areas, and it's not gonna break the bank. On top of this, we're gonna paint the house, and we're gonna paint all of the cabinets in the vanities, the kitchen, etc. A lot of cabinets you see in older homes are in really good shape, and they just need to be refreshed. You don't have to necessarily pull everything out and replace them all. So whenever we get a situation like that, we'll repaint them either white, gray, or brown. From there, if you're gonna repaint the cabinets, you're gonna also redo the countertop. So we're gonna get a nice budget countertop in here. For us, we use prefabricated quartz, meaning that we don't have to go get one of these giant slabs and pay all of this money for something custom. They already have these prefabricated slabs that are two by nine feet, and we can just put them all around the kitchen and the bathrooms. When it comes to the showers, many of them are already in decent shape. A lot of them have that white tile that might look a little yellow, or dirty, but they can easily be refinished and look brand new with a new coating of white paint. Once one of these rehabs are done, everything in the house looks brand new, and you can typically do this for about $30,000 on a 2,000 square foot house here in Las Vegas. The next level up from there would be the interior remodel. This is gonna be anywhere from 20 to $25 a square foot. Now with the interior remodel, it's very similar to the lipstick, but you're gonna have a couple of things change. The first is that instead of repainting the cabinets like the lipstick, you're now going to replace all the cabinets and vanities with new ones. For the most part, having new cabinets is always gonna be a lot better than refinishing the old ones. Now remember, we're not putting in custom cabinets that are just made from the very best wood you can find. Most of these cabinets look really good, they feel great, but they're gonna be on the cheaper to mid-tier side. Along with having new cabinets, instead of refinishing the shower like we did before, we're now just gonna replace the entire shower. We're gonna have a nice tile all the way around. In many cases, we're having to replace the tub, maybe even the glass. And for the most part, we can do this entire rehab for 40 to $50,000. Now the next level up from there is what I would call a full remodel. And for this, we're paying about $30 a square foot. Now for this one, it's gonna include everything I just said for the full interior remodel, but it's also gonna include some extras all around the house and maybe outside. So extras might be doing some landscape work. Here in Vegas, I don't know if you know this, but we live in a desert, so many of the yards aren't really landscaped. And if they are, it's very minimal, and we don't have to like put in new landscape everywhere. In fact, most of the homes we sell, if they have a dirt backyard, it's staying a dirt backyard. We are not changing that. We'll let the owner decide if they want to add something back there. Another extra thing might be having to fix a major item. Major items might include a roof, an HVAC, or a pool repair. If we have to replaster a pool, it's gonna cost us an extra six to $8,000. We've gotta redo a roof, it's gonna cost us six to $8,000. And if we gotta get a whole new HVAC, it's the same thing. So this full rehab takes into account that we're gonna have to do all that stuff and we're probably gonna have a major repair. So for 2,000 square feet, we anticipate we'll spend 60,000 now that we've got the basics out of the way, you now need to figure out how to use this. So I'm giving you numbers on what we use here in Vegas for what I still call cosmetic rehab. You saw none of those were me replacing any kind of major bullet point items like sewer, plumbing, that kind of stuff. So if you're fixing homes that are over 100 years old, this method's not gonna work because you're probably having to tear out everything. But for most markets and homes that aren't 100 years old, 
you can use some variation of this. Maybe you're not spending $30 a square foot on a full remodel, but you have to spend 40 or 50. It doesn't really matter what the number is, you just need to know the numbers so that when you're analyzing deals, you can make the correct offers based on the rehab. Also know that if you're gonna do luxury, it's gonna cost you more. As it stands today, we budget about $60 a square foot to do luxury flips. If we've got a 3,000 square foot house, we know we're probably gonna spend $180,000 because we need way higher end finishes. We're probably gonna rearrange the floor plan and a lot of things like that. Also, I cannot make this clear enough, but this is just for estimating your repair cost, meaning it's just enough to get your foot in the door and let you know whether or not the deal's even close. If the deal is close using these numbers, you're then gonna go walk the property with a contractor and get a bid. You wanna make sure that the house lines up from what you see in the pictures and there's nothing unseen. If you walk it and the contractor verifies your estimate, then you know you're good. But if it needs significantly more work, then you know you need to go renegotiate or back out of the deal. Thanks for making it to the end. The good news is I've got another one that I know you're gonna like, and all you gotta do is click it right here, linking it right here. All you gotta do is just click it, and you're gonna see this new episode that you're gonna love.